And now, Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Roma Wines present... Suspense. Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Miss Judy Garland as star of Drive-In, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness in entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now, a glass full would be very pleasant, as Roma Wines bring you Judy Garland in a remarkable tale of... Suspense. I wish I hadn't let Ruth talk me into serving that last car that came into the drive-in that rainy night. It was late and I was tired. I'd been on my feet all day carrying heavy trays, hopping to it with impatient people glaring their headlights on and off in my eyes. Heaven knows there are a lot of impatient people in Hollywood. We car hops don't have an easy time of it. Talk about your mail carriers. Well, we're the same, raining or blowing or boiling hot. We've got to get through with that tray or know the reason why. Tired, hungry people who sit back in their car expect a million dollars worth of service for a ten-cent tip. Why do we do it? Sure, there are other ways of making a living in Hollywood, but not many that hold that glittering promise that maybe someday, somehow, maybe someone will say... Why, that girl looks like Lana Turner. Yes, at least her hair's done up that way. I think I could use her, Rennie. The musical version of the Forsyth Saga. Oh, she'd be great in color. I think I'll ask her to come out to the studio. Yes, I know. Maybe it doesn't happen often, but there's always the chance. And, and there's always that hope. That's what keeps us going, I guess. But there are other things that can happen in a drive-in that aren't on the menu. Like that rainy night I was telling you about when I let Ruth talk me into serving that last car that came in. Listen, please take his order, will you? I got three cars. Oh, look at the clock, will you? It's nearly midnight. I'm off duty. Oh, please, Miller, just this once more. My date's waiting. I'll do the same for you, son. Then what's the matter with him? Can he read? Please do not honk your horn. It looks clear enough to me. It's a doctor's car. You see, he's probably in a rush. Anyway, you got nobody waiting for you. Oh, all right. Oh, gee, thanks, Mill. It was true. I I had no one waiting for me. Only the bus that was going to take me to Glendale, where I lived alone in an apartment. So I buttoned up my raincoat and took a menu over to the car. Good evening. Never mind the menu. There's some black coffee, a pot of it. And a ham sandwich. Please hurry it. When I took his order over to the car, the window was rolled up a little too far and it interfered with the tray, so I reached in to wind it down. When I touched the handle, it felt wet, kind of sticky, too, but I didn't think anything about it. I got the tray firmly set, and then I looked at my hand. It was as red as blood. I looked up quickly at him. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Dr. Morgan. I just had an emergency in the car. Oh, an accident? Yes, Sunset and Vine. Quite a crash. I just happened by, and I took one of them to the hospital. Oh, gee, that's a shame. Yes, it's too bad. I walked back trying to wipe the blood from my hand with a paper napkin. It, it gave me a creepy feeling to have somebody's blood on my hand. Then I went in to wash. I was trying to keep close track of the time, and I was a little worried for fear the big drive-in clock wasn't right. It sometimes ran slow. So I took a coin from my apron pocket. I figured it was worth a nickel not to miss that last bus to Glendale. I walked over to the payphone, and I was about to drop the nickel in when... I looked out, and he was leaning on the horn and beckoning to me at the same time. I put the nickel back in my pocket and hurried out to him. I'm sorry, but I'm in a hurry. I haven't time for this coffee to cool off. I'll take the sandwich with me. How much do I owe you? Well, uh, I'll be 42 cents. Oh, here you are. Thank you. I hope I didn't interrupt your phone call. It wasn't important, was it? <laughs> no, I was just checking on the time. I don't want to miss my bus. There was a clock right over your head. Well, that's usually wrong. Well, I have the time. It's about four minutes to twelve. 
Oh, I'm going to miss my bus. What time does it leave? At midnight from Hollywood and La Brea. Well, hop in. I'll take you. I'm going right past there. Oh, would you? I'll take the train. I'll be right back. I might still be able to make it. Okay. Uh, in my hurry to unhook the tray from the window, I gave it a jerk and it fell crashing to the ground. Oh, dear. Ruth? Yeah? Look, look. Help me with these things, will you? I'm going to miss my well, bus. Go ahead. Go ahead, Nora. I'll get it. I'll get it. We, we picked the things up quickly, and Ruth went off with the tray. I started to run around the other side of the car when I noticed something shining on the ground. It was one of the shakers that had fallen from the tray. I picked it up and started toward the driveway. Uh, why don't you just put that in your pocket? You can return it tomorrow. Come on, you're going to miss your bus. I put the shaker in my apron pocket, and I rushed over to the other side of the car. He opened the door for me, and I was just about to get in when I hesitated. I, I wasn't used to doing this kind of thing. The other girls sometimes let their customers drive them home, but I never did. Still, he looks so decent, and I... Come on. You'll miss it. Then he reached out, as if to help me in, and I felt that he was really concerned about my missing the bus, because he seemed to pull me into the car. First thing I knew, I was sitting beside him. Then the door slammed, and we were driving off. I was a little uneasy, but then I thought it's, it's only a few blocks. I won't be in the car long. I suppose you're in a hurry because someone's waiting for you. No, I, I live alone, but I'd hate to walk back to Glendale in this rain. You won't have to walk. Well, this is very nice of you. I appreciate it. Not at all. Uh, would you mind rolling up that window on your side? There's a draft. Oh, of course. Uh, you can, uh, let me off at that corner over there. All right. Mm -hmm. Anywhere along here will be all right. This is fine. Right over there by the stop sign. Wait a minute, you're going through the stop signal. Am I? Yes, but I'll, I'll get off over there by the other one. My bus! You're turning the wrong way! Am I? Yes, this this goes up to Laurel Canyon. Does it? Hey, let me out of here. You thought you were pretty smart, didn't you? I don't know what you mean. Please, let me out of this car. You went right to the phone. You thought I wouldn't see you. The phone? But I was calling about the time. Honest, I was. The time? With that clock over your head. But that clock's wrong sometimes. Besides, who, who would I call? Why should I call anyone about you? You were calling the police. No, honest, I wasn't. Let me out of this car. You were going to catch a bus. You were going straight to the police. That's where you were going. But why? Why should I go to the police? You know why. No, really, I don't. Because you saw it. You saw his blood. No, you don't. <laughs> there. You won't need to try to open that door again. Now we'll be getting along. For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you Judy Garland in Drive-In. Roma Wines' presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the acts of suspense, this is Ken Niles for Roma Wines. One week from tonight, Thanksgiving dinner will be gone, but not forgotten. Not if your turkey shares the festive table with Grand Estate California Wines. Before the feast, treat your guests to Grand Estate medium sherry, delicious with hors d'oeuvres. Let Grand Estate Burgundy or Sauterne bring out the full flavor of your holiday dinner. With dessert, enjoy Grand Estate Ruby Port or Golden Muscatel. Among the discriminating, Grand Estate wines are famed for brilliant clarity, full fragrance, and mellow taste. A limited bottling by Roma Vintners, each Grand Estate wine is born of choicest grapes. Guided to glorious taste richness by Roma Vintners' patient skill, necessary time, and America's finest winemaking resources. Enrich your Thanksgiving with Grand Estate Wines, presented by Roma, America's greatest winemaker. 
save at present low prices. Tomorrow, buy a case of Grand Estate Wines for the holidays. And now, Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Judy Garland as Mildred, with Raymond E. Lewis as the man in Drive-In, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. After I made that last try to get out, he broke the handle of the door. All the strength seemed to go out of my body. I just sat there as we drove on. We passed a few people and some cars in the next blocks, and I thought of calling out, but then I knew why he'd asked me to roll up the window when I'd first gotten into the car. Then we were at the mouth of the canyon, and I could see the road, dark and lonely up ahead. The car twisted and swerved. My arm ached from his strong fingers that had dug into it when I tried to jump out. I looked at him from the corner of my arm. He hadn't seemed like a criminal back at the driving, and he didn't seem like one now. His jaw was black from needing a chaise, so his face... Well, it wasn't like a criminal's at all. It, It was so tired. Quit staring at me. Oh, look, I I didn't know anything about you. Honest, I didn't. Please let me go. You know something about me now. Well, I won't tell anybody. Whatever it is, I promise I won't. A woman's promises. Remind me to tell you a story about a woman and promise. Oh, let me out. Please let me out right here. It's a long way back to Glendale. Well, that's all the better. It'll take me hours to get back, and you'll be miles away by then. I'm not taking any chances with you, Jim. Uh, please let me out. I've got to get back. You said no one was waiting for you. You live alone, don't you? No one will miss you. We both heard the siren then. He looked quickly in the rear vision mirror. Then he took a gun from his pocket and he turned to me. If that's for us and we'll stop, remember just this. I've used this gun before tonight and I can use it again if I have to. (gasps) I'm taking your go first. Now listen, I'm a doctor and you're a nurse. We're headed for an emergency. If you want to live, you won't try to pull anything. You're an awful fast for a wet night, aren't you? Call a jet from Hollywood. Uh, I'm Dr. Morgan, officer. This is Nurse Johnson, emergency call. I see your identification. He fumbled through his pockets with one hand, holding the gun in my ribs with the other. The motorcycle cop looked over at me. I thought for a moment I could signal him with my eyes. But then I knew he wasn't looking at my face. He was looking down at my white starched blouse, which you could see under my raincoat. He thought it was a nurse's uniform. Ah, here you are. Okay, Doc. Sorry I stopped you. Hey, just a minute. (laughs) What's the matter? Just wanted to tell you, rain started to slide up there a ways. Take it easy. Thanks, I will. You're not Dr. Morgan, are you? What do you say? Then we came on the landslide. It wasn't a big one, but it it made a terrible mess of the road. He didn't slow down, and the car swerved crazily as it slipped from one side of the highway to the other. Suddenly, I felt as though the whole rear end had slipped down. I looked over at him. He was tense. His neck was turned white as he clutched the wheel. He, he shoved the car into reverse. Oh, I hoped it had never moved. It didn't. We were stuck, hopelessly stuck. But what the luck. Suddenly the car was filled with light. A car had come around the curb behind us. This might be by chance. Remember, I still have this gun. Don't try anything. 
Bay. We're stuck here. Could you give us a push? We'll have some California hospitality for you. I'll have to get out. I'll have to put something under the wheel. You stay here. Now stay there. There were some bushes by the side of the road. If I could reach them, I could perhaps run up the side of the hill and hide. And then in the morning, make my way back down the canyon. I carefully turned the handle of the door. I could see him in the mirror. He was at the back of the car. I eased the door gently open, put one foot out. I was just sliding out when I heard him. You're not going anyplace. Come here, give me that raincoat. Why? I need something dry to stuff under this wheel. But I... You won't be needing it. Come on! He practically ripped it off my back. He wound it into a ball and bending down, he stuffed it under the wheel. A gun. Stuck out of his back pocket. If I could get it, if I could lay my hands on it. I held my breath and reached out. It seemed so far, but I finally touched it. Then I snatched it from his pocket swiftly. Brooke, give me that gun. I'm going. You can't stop me now. Can't I? No. You, you stay right where you are. I won't hurt you. All I want to do is get home. I'm going, but if you follow me, I'll... You'll what? I'll kill you. I don't think you will. Yes, I will. You think I'm afraid. Aren't you? No. I don't care what happens to you. You're a murderer. You killed somebody. I thought you didn't know anything about me. I didn't, but I do now, and I'm going to tell the police. You stay where you are. No, don't. I'm not afraid. I'll shoot. Too bad I used up all of those tonight. You could have filled me full of holes. Now give me that gun and get in the car. Are you going to kill me? What do you think? We were nearing the top of the canyon now. The road was very steep. The rain had let up. It was just drizzling now. Even though he hadn't answered my question, I knew the answer. He was going to kill me. I wouldn't get back home tonight. Not tonight or any other night. That was funny. I sometimes used to hate that little apartment of mine where nothing ever happened. But tonight... And then... For some strange reason, I thought about Ruth. What would she say tomorrow when I didn't show up at work? And I... I wondered where they'd find my body. Well, here we are. Lookout Mountain. Top of the world. Suddenly we came over the crest of the hill, and way down below the city stretched out for miles, millions of lights glittering in the rain. For a moment I forgot everything. It was the most beautiful sight I'd ever seen. Ever been up here before? No. Nice, isn't it? Yes. I used to come up here with a girl once. We used to sit and talk for hours. Come on, we'll get a better view if we get out. I knew it was foolish to argue with him, so I followed him. But as he walked over towards the edge, I became frightened. It was such a steep drop. Well, come on. I'm, I'm afraid to get so close to the edge. You won't fall. Look, that's Los Angeles over there. That bright line of lights is Western Avenue. I went to school somewhere along in there. I used to get in all sorts of trouble at school, but I got by and managed. Everyone said I'd grow out of it. Over that way towards the ocean, that's Westwood. That's where she lived, this girl I was telling you about. That was the best part of my life, I guess. That's when they said marriage and a wife would straighten me out. 
marriage and a wife would straighten me out in Westwood, they said. Does your wife still live there? No. She's dead. Oh, I'm sorry. You needn't be. I killed her. Why? Because she couldn't keep her promises. Did you kill her tonight? No. A long time ago. The jury said I was insane. But I think it was the sanest thing I ever did. They put me in an asylum. Do you know what it's like being locked up year after year when you know there's nothing wrong with you? No. No, I don't. It isn't good. You'd do anything to get out. Anything. Anything. I knew. I knew if I could keep him talking, maybe a car would come along. Maybe something would happen. It was my only chance. What are you thinking about? You... You killed someone else tonight, didn't you? Yes. Dr. Morgan? Yes. He was one of the men who thought I was insane. Why did you do it? I wanted his car to get away in. I didn't want to be locked up anymore. Oh, but th they'll catch you. No. They won't find the doctor for several days. I saw to that. How can you be so sure? I do things thoroughly. What are you going to do now? First, I'm going to... And then I guess I'll go south. I knew what he meant by that pause. I started to back away slowly. I'd made a mistake by reminding him of the present. My hands went instinctively to my apron pocket for something to defend myself with. I knew there was a pencil there. It was sharp. Maybe I could scratch him or hurt him some way with it, but when I reached for it, I felt something else instead, something cold and hard. I was puzzled for a moment, and then I remembered. It was a shaker I'd picked up at the drive-in. Stand still. And then he started moving toward me. Me with only a pencil and a shaker to defend myself with. It's too bad I came into that drive-in tonight. Oh, why did you? Because I was hungry. Because I hadn't eaten for a long time. Weren't you, weren't you afraid someone would see you? No alarm had gone up. How, how'd you know? I knew. If only you hadn't rolled that window down. Well, if you're sorry, why don't you let me go? It's too late. What's that? With a sudden movement, his arms were around me in a tight embrace. I started to scream, but suddenly his lips closed over mine. Pushing my head back roughly, he kissed me. I could scarcely breathe, and I, I felt the car's headlights on us like a spotlight. Just look at this view, will you? <laughs> I'll have to do this in a picture sometime. Can't you see you're interrupting something? Come on, drive on, will you? Okay, okay. And in all this rain... I think people would have some more. He held me a moment longer. When the car had gone, he released me. My pencil had fallen to the ground. I was left with only the shaker in my hand. I fingered it nervously, and then I felt the top coming off. I felt the content spilling in my hand. What have you got in your hand? Nothing. Give it to me. No! Give it to me! He grabbed my wrist and pulled me toward him. We were moving to the edge of the cliff, but my other hand was free, and I threw the contents of the shaker into his face. His hands flew to his face in an effort to clear his eyes, but I knew it was too late to pepper it blinded him. He lunged out for me, but I stepped aside quickly, and he slipped in the mud. His hands went out to steady himself. He clawed frantically at thin air. Then I saw him falling over backwards, over the edge. <laughs> Then my strength gave way, and I felt myself sinking down to the ground. I don't know how long I must have been there. 
But when I came to, it was raining again. I was soaked to the skin and there was mud caked in my hair. There was no one in sight. The lights of Los, Los Angeles stretched out in a pattern peacefully below. And I knew that somewhere at the foot of those hills was Glendale. And my apartment. I rose slowly to my feet and I started back toward the road. Somehow, everything that had happened seemed unreal. Like a dream. Everything but the way he kissed me. To keep me from crying out. Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A. Selected for your pleasure from the world's greatest reserves of fine wines. And now it's curtain call time for tonight's suspense star, Judy Garland. Judy, you were great. We hope you enjoyed your part tonight as much as we did your performance. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. As a matter of fact, playing the part of a waitress tonight was a treat. I just pictured myself knee-deep in juicy steaks. <laughs> <laughs> well, that reminds me, Judy, as a waitress, you deserve a tip. And here's the best tip I know. To make Thanksgiving dinner really outstanding, serve Grand Estate California Burgundy or Sauterne. For Grand Estate wines presented by Roma, America's greatest vintner, are the ultimate in wine excellence. Yes, the brilliant clarity, full fragrance, and mellow taste of Grand Estate wines please the most discriminating guests. Well, I know that my guests would agree with you. And Judy, there's a reason Grand Estate Burgundy and Sauterne are distinctively better. Because for Grand Estate wines, Roma selects only the choicest grapes. Then the priceless skill of Roma master vintners, necessary time, and America's finest winemaking resources guide this choice grape treasure to rich taste luxury. So remember, when you serve Grand Estate wines, you serve the finest, the crowning achievement of vintner skill. Well, that's a real tip, Ken. And so you can follow it, Judy. Here with Roma's compliments is your gift basket of Grand Estate wine. Well, thank you. And while I'm giving out thanks, let me give, give a great big portion with love and kisses to my great and good friend Bill Spear for his magical direction and to Raymond Lewis for playing the man so wonderfully. Well, thanks to you, Judy. And to Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of The Yearling, for their cooperation in making you available to us tonight. Next week, we'll have Chester Morris as star of Suspense. Oh, he's one of my favorite actors. I won't miss it. Good night. Tonight's Suspense play was written by Mel Donnelly and Muriel Roy Bolton. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Chester Morris as star of Suspense. Presented by the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. Ladies and gentlemen, in the coming weeks, Suspense will present such stars as Cary Grant, Olivia de Havilland, Alfred Hitchcock, Joseph Cotton, Roddy McDowell, and many others. Make it a point to listen each Thursday to Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Suspense is broadcast from coast to coast and to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. It surely is. After all, the temperature does vary in the Argentine. 
A capillaris can be very warm if he's after a woman. And very cold if he's out to kill a man. You know, of course, that I'm married to Greg Collins, the famous private detective. I'm Gail Collins. And I'll be back in a moment to set the stage for our puzzling crime. It's a crime, Mr. Collins. Tell me, Senora Collins, you mentioned the Argentine. What's our story titled tonight? I call it The Chrome Yellow Death. Mmm, sounds exciting. Believe me, Jack, it was. received an invitation to Los Colorados, just outside of Buenos Aires. A very wealthy tobacco magnet, Tom McDougall, owned an exquisite hacienda farther inland, in rather fetid, tropical, almost jungle area. He had known Greg a long time, and had asked us to fly down from San Francisco as his guests, including the plane fare. What especially intrigued Greg, though, was that instead of the usual come-and-visit-me note, the letter from McDougal hinted that there was some high jinks going on in Cruz Angelo. Anyway, we had left the airport and driven way inland to Tom's Hacienda, where the foreman greeted us. Bienvenido, senor y senora Collins. Welcome. I am Antonio Sebastian, senor McDougal's foreman. I will take the baggage, I think, no? Hello, Antonio. We haven't seen you in about five years, have we? No, senora, it is a pity. It is a shame. Well, where's Tom, Antonio? Out in the tobacco fields, I suppose. Ah, oh, no, senor Collins. Uh, senor McDougal, he never go near. He just let Antonio grow the tobacco. He stay here all the time. Uh, he will be here soon, I think. Uh, would you like to make yourself comfortable? Oh, sure. <laughs> Here, I have prepared a daiquiri for you. Oh, it has well, Antonio. Antonio, make the best daiquiri in all Argentine. Uh, thank you, Antonio. Well, salute. Salute y pesetas y amor, Antonio. Salute, senor y senora Collins. Mm. Mm. Sensational. Oh. I'm going to steal you from Tom, Antonio, just to have you in San Francisco. We'll pay you twice what Tom does. And all you have to do is make the carry. Antonio. Antonio. Ah, there's Senor McDougal now. I am here, Senor, with your visitors, Senor and Senora Collins. Here? Uh, I didn't expect them so soon. Greg, my boy, and Gail, how are you both? Oh, we're fine, things, Tom. Don't you look a bit hot and bothered. Something wrong? Yes, a fire almost destroyed my tobacco crop. What is that? No, oh, we got it out, but it was a pretty close thing. You were in the field, senor? Yes, Antonio. And something's very funny down there. I'll talk to you about that later, after dinner. Daddy! Oh, Lorna! Uh, Greg, Gail, you remember my daughter. Yes, of course. Oh, hello, hello. Oh, hello. Um, Daddy, did you tell me the truth? Do you swear you didn't hurt yourself putting out that fire? No, have I ever lied to you, Lorna? Yes, often. <laughs> <laughs> I want to show you something when we finish dinner, Greg. Huh? Uh, what's that, Tom? Something I found in my tobacco field. A rag, soaked in kerosene. You found what, senor? A rag, Antonio, soaked in kerosene. Somebody started that fire deliberately. But why, Tom? I don't know, Gail. Something screwy is going on here, and I can't figure it out. Today, we had a brush fire. Last week, someone put poison in my wells. Antonio and I have watched and waited. We even notified the police. We had a few agents to police here, hanging around for a while. Anybody in these parts got it in for you, Tom? Oh, no, senor. The senor Tom, everybody love him. Everybody except Granite. Who's Granite? Jeppel lives about ten miles from here. Wild little fellow. He's an exporter. He's also a nut about Latin American culture. He collects things. Has about a dozen rooms full of Aztec weapons, Mexican novelties, Brazilian coins, all kinds of junk. Uh, what's he got against you? He wanted to buy this place. Of course, I wouldn't sell it to him. But you're wasting your time thinking it's granite. He's clever. He wouldn't be pulling any of these stunts. They're too obvious for a man like him. 
Daddy, I still say you should sell and let's get out of here. I I hate this place. It's horrible. I can't sleep nights. Oh, please, senorita, do not cry. Hello, Lorna, darling. Oh, hello, Stuart. Greg, Gail, this is Stuart, my fiancé. Uh, hi, oh, Stuart. Howdy, oh, oh. You're just in time for dinner, Stuart. He's always just in time for dinner. Oh, now, Daddy, you've got to stop that. Young man, I'm among good friends, so I can speak freely. Someday, I'm going to take you by the seat of your pants and toss you out once and for all. Look, MacDougall, you might as well get used to the idea that I'm going to marry Lona. Because that's exactly what's going to happen. It is, eh? Why, you insolent... Daddy, young... please. We have guests. Oh, oh, oh yes, eh? I'm sorry, Greg, Gail. It's okay, Tom. Daddy's just in a bad mood because we've had some more trouble. I know. I heard about the brush fire. Mr. Granite told me. You know Mr. Granite, Stuart? Yes. I work for him. I'm his foreman. Is he in town now? Yes, he is. And he's on his plantation. Now, I know what you're thinking, Mr. Collins, but you're on the wrong track. Mr. Granite isn't the only person in town who has a grudge against MacDougall. Stuart, don't start that uh, look, again. Look here, Stuart. Oh, Senor Stuart, please, you know how you say, uh, exaggerate. Do I, Antonio? I began to see that Tom MacDougall's beautiful hacienda was actually a very strange place. There was hatred and suspicion everywhere. But keep your ears pinned, friends. We'll be back in a minute with more of our story. After dinner, Greg and I took a stroll in the grounds. It was cool. The stars were out. And we stood by a long line of fountains that Tom had lit up with colored spotlights. Oh, aren't those fountains gorgeous, Greg? I know something much prettier. What? You, Chum. Oh, great. That's the first nice thing you said to me for ages. Why aren't you romantic anymore? I know the next line, bub. It's about how marriage changes men and they take their wives for granted. But you do. Now, look, darling. Let's go up on that little balcony. You see it? Mm-hmm. The stars are shining right on it. Just see if I've forgotten how to be romantic. Oh, that's a wonderful idea, Greg. Come on. The stairway's over here. Uh, Greg, look. Under that archway on the floor. It's Tom. He's fainted. Yeah, let me see him, Gail. What's that around his neck? It's a gimmick they call Las Bolas. Three strips of leather with three lead balls. But What's he doing with it? What's wrong with him? Las Bolas has one major purpose, Gail. And it's just served that purpose very well. You use Las Bolas to commit murder. The dead body of Tom McDougall sprawled on the colored tiles by the fountains in the starlight was a gruesome paradox. Greg leaned over loosened those leather strips that were around Mr. McDougall's throat. It's quite a weapon, Gail. Used extensively in Argentine. These three lead balls are each at the end of a leather strip, see? An expert, and only an expert, can use Las Bolas. And he tosses it, sometimes from as much as 20 feet away. One ball knocks the victim unconscious. You see that bruise on Tom's head? Yeah. The other two wrap themselves around the throat, strangling the victim. Evidently, that's just what happened to Tom. Oh, we'd better call Antonio, don't you think? He can get the police. Antonio! Antonio! You call me, Senora Collins? Madre mia! Senor Matudo! Ah, los bolas! He is dead? He is dead? Yes, Antonio. Oh, Senor McDougall. Mr. Collins, Stuart and I wanted to ask you if... Daddy. Well, what's wrong with him? What's happened? Daddy! Your father is dead, Lorna. Oh, oh no. Daddy, Lorna. 
easy. Oh, come with me, honey. Sit down over here. Did you find MacDougall's body just that way, Mr. Collins? Just this way, Stuart. Not five minutes ago. Recognize this yellow leather gadget? Yes. They call it Los Folos, don't they? Yes, they do. Take care of Lana, Gail. I'll get someone to phone the police. You kill Senor McDougal. That is what I think, Senor Stewart. Shut up, you crazy fool. You hate him. You kill him. Where'd you get that idea? When you learn how to use Los Volos. Suppose I do know how. That doesn't mean I'd murder McDougal, does it? Please, please stop fighting this way. Daddy's dead. What good does it do to accuse each other? I think I can help, Lunner. How? By going to the other plantation and talking to Granite. <laughs> I'm a corporate lawyer, and I'm one. I'm a pediatric nurse, and I'm one. I'm a student, and I'm one. I'm a housewife, and I'm one. I'm a bus driver, and I'm one. I'm the fashion director, and I'm one. Everyone can be a pollution fighter, but everyone isn't. It's too bad, too, because we need as many as we can get. We need them to pick up litter. We need them to stop cars from polluting and leaves from burning. We need pollution fighters to take action in their communities against the problems that are choking our environment. We have to have them if we're to clean up our air, our lakes and rivers, our highways and our forests. It doesn't take much to become a pollution fighter, just a desire to make our land as beautiful as it used to be. Write to Keep America Beautiful for a free booklet. 71 Things You Can Do to Stop Pollution. That's Keep America Beautiful, Box 1771, Radio City Station, New York, New York. People start pollution. People can stop it. Stuart and Lorna stayed and waited for the police. Meantime, Greg and I got into a station wagon with Antonio and did 85 on those dirt roads till we reached Granite's plantation. Granite was a queer-looking duck, short, shabbily dressed, with very heavy glasses. He smoked small black cigars and peered at us behind a huge desk covered with paraphernalia. What can I do for you, Mr. Collins? I have some news for you, Mr. Grennett. Mr. McDougal is dead. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. I loathe the man. A heart attack, I presume? No, no heart. Somebody kill him with Los Volos. Well, then, he had the satisfaction of dying in a rather picturesque way. Most of us aren't that fortunate. You wanted to buy Mr. McDougal's estate, didn't you? Oh, yes, indeed. I'm an exporter, Mr. Collins. The McDougal estate is by the waterfront, uh, has a ready-made landing. Uh, by the way, will you give Lorna McDougal a message for me? Yeah, what is it? Tell her I want to see her. See, it's very important. I'd never have persuaded her father to sell. He's very stubborn. Well, uh, Somebody saved me a headache. Do not speak of the dead this way, Senor Granat. You will be punished. Senor, Senora Collins, please excuse me. Oh, where are you going, Antonio? I wait outside. I cannot speak to Senor Granat. If I speak to such a, how you say, man of the devil, poor Antonio will be punished himself. <laughs> yeah, like most of the natives, Mr. and Mrs. Collins, Antonio is an illiterate fool, weaned on superstition. I'm sorry, Mr. Granite. I'm very fond of Antonio. You still haven't told me why you came here, Mr. Collins. You suspect me of murder, of course. But you must be incredibly naive to think that you could just walk in and have me hand you a written confession. I haven't accused you of murder, Mr. Granite. I'm just... Shall we say... Gathering information. Let me help you. Would you like to look around my place? Most of my guests find it fascinating. I have dozens of rooms in which I've gathered Latin American curiosa. One entire room is filled with the remnants of the Mayan civilization. Oh, and uh, by the way, you'll see also a bolos, uh, which I know how to use. Mine is painted green. What color was the one the killer used? Chrome yellow. Disturbing shade. I don't like it. Would you and your lovely wife care to follow me? I can describe the items in my collection as we go. Thank you, Mr. Gunnett. I'd rather not. Then may I offer you a drink? 
I have one of the largest wine collections in Argentine. I think we'd prefer to leave right now, Mr. Granite. Very well, Mrs. Collins, just as you say. My man tells me you came in your own station wagon, or I'd be happy to offer you a car. Uh, the front door is this way. Good night. Good night, Mr. Granite. Coming, Antonio? The station wagon is right outside, senor. I drove it around to the front. I... Oh, my head. I feel dizzy. I feel sick. Antonio, what's wrong? Oh, sick. Antonio feels sick. The drink, there was... There was poison in the drink. Oh, what drink? <laughs> Try to talk, Antonio. What drink? The Seno Granap man, he give me drink while I wait out here. Oh. Oh, oh. Antonio! He's been poisoned! I resent the accusation, Mrs. Collins. Antonio may be ill for half a dozen reasons, but certainly not because of anything he was served in my house. Uh, I'll call a doctor. You'd better call a doctor, and quickly, too. If Antonio dies, you'll have killed him. I'll have the physician come over at once. Don't excite yourself, Mrs. Collins. Antonio! Oh, he's so cold, Greg. And his eyes... Gail, we've got to leave Antonio in Granite's hands. But we can't. We must. Why? We've got to get to Lorna McDougal. Bring her back here as soon as possible. We drove to the Hacienda, picked up Lorna, and made all speed back to Granite's place. As we walked through the huge entrance, across the tiled floor... Look, there's Antonio. How are you, Antonio? Better, Signora. Mr. Granat did not send for the doctor. He didn't? Well, where is he? I'll tell him a he thing. He took good care of Antonio. Got me these blankets. Put me on the sofa and gave me a drink. Antonio better. See, Greg? Granat got a little too ambitious. He knew he couldn't let Antonio die right in front of our eyes. Where is he, Antonio? In that room, Senor. He went in there. I think... Antonio, not sure. Antonio fell asleep. All right, Laura. You know what to do. Go into that room? That's right. Tell Granit you want to know exactly what he has to say, why he wanted to see you. And don't be afraid of him. Remember, we'll be right outside the door. What are you doing? Uh, don't worry, Antonio. Just relax. Go on, Lorna. Through that door. Stand over there, Gail, so Granit can't see you when she opens the door. Ready, Mr. Collins? Ready. Open the door. Well? See him, Lola? No. No, he's not here. I don't see him anywhere. I... What is it? In the corner of the room. Mr. Granite. He's dead. Lost. Mr. Granite was lying in the corner of his room with a yellow leather bolus wrapped around his neck. His face twisted in agony with a horrible purple tinge from strangulation. In just a minute, we'll bring you the climax of the case. Greg had examined the body and called for the police. Oh, it's horrible. Horrible. You've had more than your share, Lord. Don't understand it, Greg. All this time, I've been thinking that Mr. Granite was... The killer? Well, I was on that trail for a while myself, Gail, but... Mr. Collins, Mrs. Collins. Oh, there's Stuart. What are you all doing? What? Oh. Mr. Granite. He's dead, Stuart. Died the same way Tom McDougall did. Mm-hmm. North Lola, sir? Where'd you come from, Stuart? I work here, Mrs. Collins. I told you that before. I'm Mr. Grant's foreman. Antonio, is this the man who gave you the drink? Drink? What's wrong with Antonio? No. Senor Granat has a houseboy. You know, I think we could wash this up even before the police get here. The police? Now, if you'll calm down for a second, Lorna, and answer a question or two. Please, please, no more questions. Not about Daddy, anyway. I can't talk about that, please. Now, take it easy, Lorna. Sit down. Have a cigarette. 
I'm sorry I only have these native cigarettes. Oh, no, no, thank you. I only smoke American brand. Anybody else? Antonio, I bet you could use one. Oh, thank you, Senor Collins. what Antonio need. Calm the nerves, I think. Why don't you take the chair in the corner, Stuart? I'm sure we'd all stop screaming at each other if we could get at the truth. Back. Never mind the psychological approach, Mr. Collins. All this cozy business doesn't impress me at all. Get to the point. No, oh, I will. Yes, yeah, Stuart, I will. If I can get everybody to cool off. Uh, how about you? Uh, smoke? All right. I'll take one. What's in this cigarette? It's marijuana. What? Greg, did you say marijuana? That's right, Gail. The killer smokes marijuana, and he... You are very much smarter than I thought, Mr. Collins. Antonio! Get out of my way, Mrs. Oh, Collins. Stop him! He'll get out through the window. Rick, the bullet's on the wall. Give it to me. Here. Watch out, Antonio. I'm going to throw it. No! No, don't throw it! Oh, my legs! My legs! You're lucky, Antonio. I decided to wrap it around your legs and take you alive. You're lucky I didn't give it to you in the throat the way you did with MacDougall and Granite. After they took Antonio away and we said goodbye to Stuart and Lorna, we decided to finish our vacation in Caracas, Venezuela. As we waited in the airport... All right, Greg. Start from the beginning about Antonio. And tell me slowly. Because I'm not in a very bright mood. Well, it isn't complicated at all, Gail. When Antonio collapsed, after he said he'd been poisoned, a packet of cigarettes fell out of his pocket. I recognized them. They were marijuana cigarettes. Well, that gave me a hunch. And when we went back to pick up Lorna, I had a look at the tobacco growing there on the outskirts of the McDougal plantation. It was marijuana. But what's that got to do with it? Well, don't you see? I've clinched it. Antonio, when we first met him, said McDougal never examined his plantation at all. He left it to his charming foreman, Antonio. Then if you knew it was Antonio... Well, I, I wasn't absolutely positive, Gail. Until I purposely offered those cigarettes to Lorna, Stewart, and Antonio. And of course, all they knew was that I had a native pack. Lorna refused them. They made Stuart sick. But Antonio enjoyed them. I know the rest. I can fit the pieces together as well as you can. Antonio was probably growing the marijuana way out near the jungle where McDougal wouldn't notice it. Yeah, that's right. Antonio not only smoked the awful stuff, but mm, probably sold it at a terrific profit. He poisoned the wells and started the brush fire because he wanted to jinx the place. He didn't want anyone to buy the plantation. They might find out his secret. But McDougal must have stumbled across the stuff, so... Antonio killed him. That's the deal. Then, to throw suspicion off himself, he slipped himself a mickey in Granite's house. But Granite, who was a very sharp apple, must have guessed Antonio was faking. So, Granite had to get the Bolas treatment, too. Dealer, call for flight 63 to Caracas. Greg, darling, when we get to uh, Caracas, you owe me something. Yeah? Uh, what is it? A balcony in the starlight. You were going to show me that even though we've been married for a few years, you could still be romantic. 
You're going to recite poetry and give me flowers. And... Oh, no, girl. Oh, no. Oh, not me. I don't get romantic with all that icky stuff. But, Greg, when we do get to that balcony with gardenias all around it, the stars are out, and we're alone, what will you do? Mm-hmm. Oh, I'll think of something. Well, folks, Gail and I hope you enjoyed our adventure, The Chrome Yellow Death. Be sure to visit us next time for another puzzle in murder. For where there is crime and romance, there you'll find Mr. And Mrs. Colin. Starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, Rochester, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> Any of you ever meet the kind of a guy I did the other day who cried proudly, Breakfast? Never touch it. Oh, well, a cup of coffee, maybe. Actually, sort of boasting about it, you know. What does he think he is, anyway? A hummingbird? So I said, uh, why don't you eat breakfast? And he said, all food doesn't look good to me at that hour. Right there, I did my good deed for the day by telling him about Grape Nuts and Grape Nuts Flakes. Because that's what these two cereals are made for, to tempt morning appetites with a crisp, appetizing texture and swell, molly rich flavor. And boy, do they do the trick. Why, a bowl of Grape Nuts or Grape Nuts Flakes brimming with rich milk puts you right on top of the world. But with all their brisk lightheartedness, both are basic seven foods. So their all-around whole grain nourishment helps make any breakfast an adequate breakfast. And that's the kind of breakfast doctors and dietitians tell us we all need every day. No doubt about it, friends. Eat a good breakfast and you'll do a better job. And for a rousing, swell-tasting breakfast treat, make it Grape Nuts Flakes. Tonight, we're broadcasting from Palm Springs for the Torney Hospital and the 21st Air Ferry Command. So we take you back a few hours and pick up Jack and the gang who are on their way here by plane. They are now 5,000 feet in the air headed for Palm Springs. Gee, it's great to be in a plane like this. Isn't it, Mary? Yeah. First one I was ever in where you can open the windows. Yeah. Oh, boy, look at those mountains down below us. Are you nervous, Jack? Of course not. Are you, Mary? Of course not. How about you, Dennis? Of course not. Are you nervous, Don? Of course not. When he gets to me, he's going to hear some new words. (laughs) (laughs) Rochester, there's nothing to be worried about. Just a nice, smooth trip. Uh And we're in a very modern plane. Uh So you have absolutely no reason to be frightened. Uh huh. <laughs> what are you hawing about? I can't talk with this rabbit's foot in my mouth. <laughs> well, that's ridiculous. Now take that rabbit's foot out of your mouth. I gotta take out the horseshoe first. <laughs> rabbit foot in the horseshoe. Rochester, take them both and throw them out the window. Okay. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Well, did you throw them out? Yes, boss, and now there's nothing to hold this plane up but the wings. <laughs> Rochester, take it easy, will you? Everybody else is relaxed. Just look at... Dennis! Dennis, pull your head in out of that window! Dennis! Jack, he can't hear you with those motors roaring out there. Hey, Mary, watch. I'm going to have some fun with that kid. I'll put my head out of this front window and make faces at him. Get this. Hey, kid! Jack! Jack, you're too paid! 
My what? Your tooth! Ouch! What happened? I don't know, but all of a sudden I need a shave. <laughs> Dennis, give me that. I'll get it, I'll get it. Hold still, Dennis. Give it to me. Thanks, Mary. There. Jack. What? You got it too far over your left ear. I want it like that. I feel sporty today. <laughs> then turn it around. The laundry mark shows. <laughs> oh, Mary, for heaven's sake. Everybody gets a shampoo once in a while. Yeah, but they're there when they get it. <laughs> oh, quiet. Well, Rochester, how are you? You getting accustomed to the plane trip? Boss, I don't know how I can be so high and feel so low. I don't know why you act that way, Rochester. So beautiful up here, soaring above the fleecy cloud, with the sun reflecting its golden rays across the horizon, and mountain peaks in the distance holding their proud heads up to the sky. And the blue... It's no the... use, boss. My heart just ain't in it. <laughs> Well, then just sit there and wait till we get to Palm Springs. The last time I'll take you on a plane. Thanks, boss. Hmm. Say, Jack, I wonder what our altitude is now. I don't know, Don. I'm going up front and find out. Don, will you please warn the pilot when you shift your cargo? <laughs> Oh, Jack, I'm not big enough to affect the flight of a plane. Not big enough? Don, Mount Wilson was not only named after you, but there's a family resemblance. <laughs> you both bulge at the base. <laughs> now, Don, go back and sit in your seats. Please. Oh, Mr. Benny. Huh? Mr. Benny. What is it, Dennis? When we took off, I think we forgot somebody. Forgot somebody? I wish it was me. <laughs> Rochester. All right, I wish it was I. <laughs> Never mind. Oh, I know, it's Mr. Harris. We didn't forget him. Phil and his orcs are coming up later. Hope he gets to the broadcast on time. Pilot to Don Wilson. Pilot to Don Wilson. Lean to the left. I'm banking for a turn. <laughs> Don, do as he says. Wilson to pilot. I'm leaning. Pilot... To Wilson, I'm banking. <laughs> to whom it may concern, I'm painting. <laughs> Rochester, cut that out. Don, you're doing a very good job. Don't let your stomach get off the beam. Say, Mary. Hey, where's Mary? She went up front to talk to the pilot. Oh. Say, pilot. Yes? How long before we arrive in Palm Springs? Palm Springs? Well, it's about time somebody told me where we were going. Uh, you mean you didn't know? Oh, nobody tells me anything. They just put me in a plane and point. No kidding. Once they had a dispatcher with a crooked finger and I flew around in circles for three days. Oh, for heaven's sake. I passed Mrs. Roosevelt twice. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Say, Pollard, what are all those different gadgets there? Well, this is the altimeter, this is the oil pressure gauge, that's the tachometer, this is the airspeed indicator, and, uh-oh, don't turn that one. Why, what is it? I don't know, but every time I turn it, I fall out. <laughs> well, I never heard of that before. By the way, Miss Livingston, I meant to ask you something. Is Jack Benny your boyfriend? Well? Well, is he? Oh, in a way, yes. Oh, he is, huh? Well, there's a war on, you know. <laughs> oh, say, Pilot, uh, when we get to Palm Springs, I wish you'd tell me a good place to eat because I have to... No kidding, Mr. Benny. Did they really let you fly a plane when you were in Africa? Oh, sure, Dennis, I can fly. I handle a plane like I was born in it. Gosh, were they invented then? <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> Of course they were. I'm only 20, 39. That's all. Gee, when I'm 39 like you are, I hope I look like 39 like other people do. <laughs> Dennis. I figured that out in my own little mind. 
Well, just figure out what song you're supposed to sing when we get... Hey, Mary, where were you? I was up front talking to the pilot. He asked me if you were my boyfriend. Oh, really? What'd you tell him? I told him I was kind of nuts about you, but you were the blasé type that didn't show much affection. Uh-huh. And I also told him I was in love with you because you were a combination of Charles Boyer, Gary Cooper, and Robert Taylor. Oh, how could you, Mary? I mean, Cooper is much taller than I am. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what uh, What else did you say? Uh, then I told him you had more sex appeal than Clark Gable. Oh, that's sweet. And did he believe you? Oh, sure. You ought to meet him, Jack. He's nuts. <laughs> he is not. He's one of the nicest. Pilot to Wilson. Pilot to Wilson. Please inhale. I'm trying to climb. <laughs> Go ahead, Don. Use both lungs, Mr. Wilson, please. <laughs> oh, Rochester, stop worrying. What are you, a man or a mouse? Boss, can you hear me? Yes. Then shake the paw of a talking mouth. <laughs> oh, for goodness sake. The next time Pilot we... Pilot to control tower. Pilot to control tower. Coming in for a landing. Control tower to pilot. Control tower to pilot. Everything okay? Rochester to Mother Earth. Rochester to Mother Earth. Here comes your boy. <laughs> and you thought you needed that rabbit foot and horseshoe. Well, here we are, fellas. Palm Springs. Sometimes I feel so very certain that you care And there are times I feel we don't belong The more I fall for you, the more I must be aware So how am I to know if I am right or wrong For my heart tells me this is just a fling Yet you say our love means everything Do you mean what you are saying? Or is this a little game you're playing? I will cry again Lips that kiss like yours Could lie again If I'm fool enough To see this through Will I be sorry if I do? Yours could lie again If I'm fool enough To see this through Will I be sorry if I do Dennis Day. Very good, Dennis. Say, that was a nice plane trip we had, wasn't it, kid? It sure was, Mr. Benny. Say, is Rochester really a mouse? I'll say he is. Then I better keep my trap shut. <laughs> Dennis, stop guessing at jokes. Say, Jack, you didn't have a chance to eat before the show, did you? 
to eat? Oh, sure, Don. Remember when you came straight to the theater, Mary, Dennis, and I stopped off at a restaurant. You know, the one down here in the corner. They have I wonder what's good to eat. Mary, let me see your menu. Here you are, Jack. What do you want to take a chance on? What do you mean, take a chance on? They didn't print the prices. <laughs> Mary, I never quibble about prices. Now, let's see. What do I want? I'm going to have a hot fudge sundae on whole wheat toast. <laughs> well, I've heard everything now. Here comes the waiter. Oh, yes. Your order, please. <laughs> I'll have a steak sandwich and coffee. I want breakfast, some fruit and cereal. Oh, we have orange juice, tomato juice, grape nuts, and grape nuts quake. <laughs> Oh, good. I don't know which to have, grape nuts or grape nuts flakes. They're both delightful, and you, and you get one delicious flavor in two distinctive forms. Well... You like them, they're malty, witch, sweet as a nut, and nutritious. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, I'll have some grape nuts flakes. With cream? <laughs> of course. Of course. <laughs> Hurry it up, will you? Certainly. Say, Mary, isn't that waiter peculiar? Oh, just a whittle. <laughs> all right, all right. You can stop with that. Say, look who's here. Hiya, Jackson. I just got in. Oh, you finally made it, eh, Phil? Yeah, and you know what, Jackson? I was driving along, and just outside of Pomona, I saw a rabbit's foot on the road, so I stopped to pick it up. Yeah? And while I was bending over, I get hit on the head with a horseshoe. <laughs> <laughs> No kidding. That was Mr. Benny's fault. He made rock... Dennis! Say, Phil, did you bring all your boys with you? Yeah, all except Wilbur, my trombone player. You know Jackson and I had to fire that guy? Why? He drinks. <laughs> oh, fine. You're certainly the right guy to fire anybody because he drinks. Well, that stuff's too scarce. <laughs> I can always get a trombone player. Oh, I see. Well, I knew you had a good reason. Well, Phil, now that you're here, you better go over to the theater and set up your band number. What are you going to play? Oh, I don't know. I'll either play Schubert's Unfinished Symphony or Pistol Packin' Mama. <laughs> I see. Because I can finish Pistol Packin' Mama. You can finish any song. Now go over and rehearse it. Okay, Jackson. See you later. Here comes the food. Sorry for the duet, folks. Here's your steak sandwich, miss. And here's your grape nuts flakes. Thank you. And here, with you, man, here's your hot fudge sundae on whole wheat toast. Oh, boy! Hmm, Dennis, I hate to tell you this, but only a jerk would eat a hot fudge sundae on toast. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, you're not getting any of mine. <laughs> oh, what's the use? Come on, Mary, we better hurry and eat. I want to get back by the time Phil gets through rehearsing his number. Uh, what did he say he's going to play? Schubert's Pistol Pack and Mama or something. I don't know. Some number.
Well, I've had enough to eat. Me too. Let's go. Say, waiter, those grape nut flakes were good. They're crunchy, too. <laughs> now, come on, kid. Goodbye, waiter. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, blood and guts. <laughs> Isn't that cute? He knows me. Huh? Come on, Jack. Let's go. Hey, pardon me, stranger. Yes? My name is Slim Barton. I'm a reporter on the Desert Sun. I see. Is this your first time in Palm Springs? No, I've been coming here for years. Well, it's a nice place to come to. This is one spot where the sun shines 365 days a year. It does? Well, it was a little cloudy this morning. Smile when you say that, partner. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, where do you hail from, stranger? I come from Los Angeles. From Los Angeles, eh? Who helped you break trail? <laughs> no one. I walked behind a Greyhound bus. Well, tell me, stranger, have you seen anything? Have you been getting around this here town much? Well, I've been to the Colonial House, the Desert Inn, Deepwell Ranch, 139 Club, the Del Taquit. Have you been to Desmond? Yes. Bullocks? Bullocks, yes. I like to rough it now and then. <laughs> Have you been to the Lone Palm? What did you say, mister? I said, have you been to the Lone Palm? Have I been to the Lone Palm? Let me tell you a story, young man. Come closer. This may be interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> Palm Springs in 49. Wine, women, saloon. All centered around the mad scramble for gold. The scene is the Lone Palm Cafe in the days of the gold rush. Run by Pistol Pack and Mary. Also known as Livy the Leech. <laughs> as the scene opens, we find her talking to Curly Harris, her front man and bouncer. Well, how does it look, Curly? Oh, everything's all right, Livy. The suckers are at it again. Good. How's the roulette wheel doing? Okay. Dead Eye Pete lost 15,000, Grub State Gallagher lost 18, and Mervyn the Mug just dropped 22,000. That's funny. Them guys all work for the house. Yeah, the wheel's so crooked, even the shills are losing. <laughs> That's right, Liv. Yahoo! At last, I made my pile! <laughs> Who's the character, Livy? That's Rattlesnake Benny, the prospector. He must have struck gold. Stand aside, everybody. For 21 days, I've been out on that hot desert. I drink and water out of a rusty tin can. I drink and water out of an old hat. I drink and water out of my dirty hand. Now let me at that bar. What'll it be, partner? Give me some water in a glass. <laughs> I'm part. Hello, Rattlesnake. <laughs> well, there's my old gal, Mascara Mouth Minnie. <laughs> I've been out on that scorching desert a long time, Minnie, so give me a kid. Okay, Rattlesnake. Puck her up. <laughs> How was that, Minnie? Dehydrated. <laughs> well, come on, gal. Let's sit down. Say, Curly. Now that Rattlesnake has struck it rich, we ought to go to work on him. That's right, Libby. We ought to steer him over to that Wheel of Fortune. Okay. Hey, Rattlesnake, you've been pretty lucky lately. How'd you like to take a chance on the wheel? Okay, Libby. Don't mind if I do. 28 has always been my lucky number. Okay, gents, get your bets down and your hands up. 15,000 bucks on 28. 13, you lose. Hmm. 28's my lucky number. Another 15,000 on 28. 13, you lose. Hmm. I'll try it once more. 15,000 on 28. There it is, 20. 13, you lose. I wouldn't exactly say that will is crooked, but it ad-libs a lot. 
Well, I ain't gonna gamble anymore. Say, Curly, rattlesnake still got a big pile left. What are we gonna do? Well, there's only one man that can work on them. Who? Dennis the Shill. <laughs> okay, I'll... Here he comes now. Hello, Dennis. Hello, Libby. Pour me some orange juice and blow the seeds off. <laughs> now listen, Dennis. Rattlesnake Benny's over at the bar and he's loaded with gold. Take care of him, will you? Yeah, you know, like you always do. Okay, leave it to me. Hello, Rattlesnake. Hello, kid. Have a drink on me. No, thanks. I gotta stay sober so I can clip you. <laughs> hmm. Wanna play poker? Sure, you look like an honest man. Shake hands. Not so hard. You're shaking the cards out of my sleeve. <laughs> Well, let's sit down and start with a clean deck. Okay. I'll play a no-draw hand for a thousand bucks. Shuffle them, partner. All right, now deal them. I can't. My fingers are stuck on the cards. Never mind your fingers. Just deal them. Now quiet, everybody. There's a big game on here. What have you got? Four deuces. They are four two. You win. I got four lousy ones. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, partner. How's the game coming, Dennis? I'm a cheating, but he's a winning. <laughs> That's not right, is it, Miss Livingston? Hey, what's going on here? If I've been pleased, Livy, I'm going to wreck this joint. Hey, Curly. There's trouble here. I'll say there's trouble. Now, listen, kid. You try to double cross me, so reach for your gun. Okay, Rattlesnake, but give me a chance. I got a zipper on my holster. <laughs> I'll give you a chance. Get up on your feet. We'll count three and fire. One, two, three. Oh! We got the bartender and Curly. <laughs> Let's try it again. Okay. One, two, three. <laughs> got Minnie and Livy. Yeah. Let's try it again. Why not? We're perfectly safe. <laughs> yeah, but this time, let's face each other. One, two, three. Oh. Got each other that time. Ugh. Well, I'm sure glad I wasn't in that sketch. Music, please. it happens that when you do a good turn for someone else, it boomerangs right back and helps you too? Well, that's where we all stand with Uncle Sam's new food program, Food Fights for Freedom. By helping Uncle Sam, we help ourselves. And here's how. One of the things we're asked to do is buy more foods that are plentiful. Cereals with whole grain nourishment, for instance, like grape nuts and grape nut flakes. Well, you can't do a better turn for yourselves, folks, than to get even better acquainted with these two delicious, malty-rich breakfast treats. Sure, they're good to eat. I guess you all know that. But there's a whole lot more to the story than just their swell taste. Both grape nuts and grape nuts flakes are basic seven foods crammed full of energy-giving whole grain nourishment. And ladies, you just can't think up a thriftier buy than those two famous breakfast cereals. So help yourselves, help your budget, and help Uncle Sam buy foods that are plentiful. And for downright good eating, buy grape nuts and grape nuts flakes. Well, 
Well, folks, it's been a privilege to broadcast here for the personnel of the Air Ferry Command and the Turney Military Hospital. And we're with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Good night, everybody. I love a mystery. Mystery Thriller. Four o'clock in the afternoon. In the office of the A-1 Detective Agency, around the corner and one flight up, just off Hollywood Boulevard. It's hot, and Mary Kay Brown, the cutest secretary in Hollywood, is dressed for it. Her boss, Jack Packard, is sitting directly under an electric fan... His feet up on the desk, his shirt open at the collar, and a glass of iced coffee in his hand. Boss, it's so doggone hot, it's indecent. It gets so a girl doesn't care anymore. Why don't you take off something? If I took off one thing more, you could hand me a cake of soap and a wash rag and send me to the shower. Try some iced coffee. And immediately perspiration starts out on me like a whirling spray. Honest to goodness, boss, why don't you shut up shop and let a girl go home and sit in a tub of water? Go ahead. I want to wait for Doc. What's Doc got that we want? We're supposed to turn in a report on the Bronson Firebug case. The insurance company's been screaming for it since Monday. Oh, 150 in the shade and we got to work on a firebug case. Well, not you. What do you mean, not me? I'm your secretary, aren't I? I'm not sure sometimes. You're not sure about what? Those clothes. Maybe we ought to keep you for a pinup girl. You don't like them, huh? Mm-hmm. These clothes. You don't like them? Sure, what there is of them. But what'll the clients think? What clients? Did anyone ever tell you you're too fresh? Besides, I don't wear my clothes for the clients. No? No. I wear them for the boss. For years now, I've practically been throwing myself at him, but the poor dope isn't having any. The office is no place for romance. Well, then, for the love of Mike, why don't you take me to the Coconut Grove some dark night or or come and sit on my front porch? Uh Uh-uh. What do you mean, Uh uh-uh? You're much too important to the A-1 agency as a secretary. (laughs) You think a little fraternizing on Saturday night would cut down my office efficiency on Monday morning? Look, Mary Kay, I'm too hot to argue. Uh Uh-oh, somebody in the outer office. Yeah, yeah, I'll get it. Relax, boss, it's just Doc. He's got a kid with him. Kid? Boy? Surprising as it may seem, it's a boy. See you for a minute, Jack. Sure. Okay, fella, in with you. You see this tadpole, Jack? I bet he ain't ten years old. How old are you, son? (laughs) He ain't talking. Anyway, you know what I caught him doing? Caught him purse snatching. Hey, no kidding. Yes, ma'am, right down there on Hollywood Boulevard. Went up behind a woman, jerked the purse out from under her arm, and streaked it down a side alley. He'd have got away with it, too, if he hadn't run right into my arm. Are they all right, boy? Is this a police station? Uh Uh-oh. You did steal a woman's purse? This don't look like any police station to me. You gave the woman's purse back to her, Doc. Oh, yeah. She wanted to call a uniformed cop, but I flashed my special on her and she let me have the kid. You've been purse snatching for quite a while? Look, if this is a police station, where's the cells where you lock people up? As a matter of fact, this isn't a police station. Oh. We're private detectives. Yeah? I'm Jack Packard. The man who brought you in is Doc Long. Is she a private detective, too? No. <laughs> She's our secretary. Hmm. She's hot stuff. Say. <laughs> out of the mouths of babes. Why, where'd you get that kind of talk? You ought to have your mouth washed out. 
touchy, ain't she? What's your name? Bud Edwards. At the police, I'm not scared anymore. Oh, that's good. How old are you? I'm 11. Hey, you sure about that? For crying out loud, don't you think a guy knows how old he is? Well, you don't look 11 to me. Pass it. Where do you live? 6213 Selma. Well, that's just around the corner. With your folks? Huh? I say, do you live with your folks? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure, my grandmother. Is that all? Yeah, that's all. It's my grandmother. Does she know that you're a purse snatcher? Um, no. You go to school? I used to. You mean you don't go to school now, kid 11 years old? I don't sleep very good. A growing boy 11 years old doesn't sleep good? What's the matter, your conscience bothering you? No. Then why don't you sleep good? Well, some nights I do. Some nights I have dreams. Uh-huh. What do you dream? I don't know. Oh, yes, you do. I don't want to think about them. Nightmares? Bad dreams, huh? Yeah. Well, it might do you some good to tell somebody about them. Like to try them? They, they don't make any sense. They're crazy. Go on, I'd like to hear them. Here, you want a cold drink? No, I'm not sweating because it's hot. I sweat like this when I think about the dreams. Sometimes I wake up in the night sweating like this. Here, you want a handkerchief? No, I got one. Hey. When was the last time you had a bath? Oh, so you're one of them dames that right away gets personal, huh? <laughs> but your hands, they're filthy. Doesn't your grandmother ever make you clean up? No. Never mind about that. Let's get back to this dream business. You'd rather talk about that anyway, wouldn't you? I never told anybody. Sure. Probably why they keep worrying you. You tell us about them, it'll probably make you feel a lot better. Well... Grandma can tell when I'm restless. She can tell even before I get into bed that I'm not going to sleep good. Oh, she can? Yeah, then she gives me something to make me sleep. Capsules? No, with a needle. Hey, roll up your sleep, bud. Here, let me do it for you. No, it's this arm. Okay. I'm getting all this down there, okay? Every word. Think it might mean something? Hey, Jack, look at this kid's arm. Needle punctures. Five, six, eight, eleven of them. Hey, what the heck? They don't hurt. Okay, you can roll your sleeve down now. What about these dreams? Well, it, well, it takes me a long time to get out of our house. You mean in your dream you get up and dress and want to get out of the house? I don't want to, but I got to. For some reason, I got to. But you don't know what the reason is, huh? Yeah, that's it. And it takes me a long time to get out and I have to go through a lot of rooms and Big rooms and long rooms. I have to go through lots of doors. Lots of doors. Hurry, bud. Hurry up. Don't let them catch you. Hurry. Hurry. In every room I went into, my voice sounded different. Hurry, bud. Don't let them catch you. Hurry, hurry. Bud, hurry, hurry. They're after you. Don't let them catch you. You gotta hurry. You gotta hurry. <laughs> Don't cry like that. Take it easy, bud. It's just a dream. No, it isn't. Because one time a gun went off, and I heard somebody scream, and I went to put my shoes on in the morning, and they were all covered with mud. Oh, well, you can see how crazy that is. Look outside. It's so hot you could fry steaks, and it's been that way for the last four months. Now, how could you possibly get your shoes muddy in Southern California in August? It happened. I know it did. What happened? I killed somebody. Oh, hey, now, I bet a buck you didn't. You got your dreams all mixed up with Where you. was this? Where did it happen? Outdoors. That's all I know. You think you shot somebody? Sometimes. Sometimes I'm running and people are chasing me. Sometimes I dig a hole in the ground and bury things. Do you know what it is you bury? I don't know anything. Just wake up sweating and 
tired. Like I hadn't been in bed any of the time. What does your grandmother say to all this? I don't tell her. I'd be scared to tell her. Why? Yeah, why? Grandmothers are wonderful people to tell things to. Not my grandmother. Okay, bud. We've talked about everything but the purse snatching. I know you don't want to talk about it, but we've got to. It's not part of the dream. Well, maybe not, but we'll talk about it just the same. How many times have you done this? Snatched a woman's purse. Just this once. Now look at me. That's it. Is that true? Honest. I believe it's true. Why did you do it? Honest, Mr. Packard, something made me. It was just like I'd done it before and just how to do it. I didn't want it all the time I was doing it. <laughs> People don't do what they don't want to do. Never mind that. But I want you to come in the back room, back here with me. What's back there? The makeshift laboratory. Come on. You want me, boss? You and Doc wait here. In with you, bud. <laughs> Funny business. Yeah. You picked yourself up quite a case. Well, what does Jack care what the kid dreams? <laughs> when I was a kid back in Texas, I used to have some dreams that would make Bud's dreams sound like mush and milk. Yeah? What'd you dream about? <laughs> women. What kind of women? Oh, honey, it didn't make no difference what kind of women. Just women. Oh, fine. Yeah, and speaking of women, Mary Kay, if there's anything cuter than the clothes you got on this PM, it's the stuff that's inside them. Ah, ah, ah. Mustn't touch. Oh. Still Jack Pack or nobody, huh? That's the way it is. Ah, Swanee ain't like a crime. Me wanting you, and you wanting Jack. And I suppose Jack's wanting something he can't have either. You mean another woman? Hey, now, I didn't say that. You said that... Uh, Perfectly all right, bud. If you shot a gun and killed anybody, there would have been little specks of powder embedded in the skin of your hand. And there wasn't any? Not a sign. Lots of burnt... No burnt powder. Oh, so that's what you was doing in there, giving him the burnt powder test. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Get on your horse, Doc. Huh? Hey, we gotta go out in that hot glare again. We're going over and see Bud's grandmother. Well, what if my grandmother finds out I brought anybody home? She's not gonna know. You're gonna stay here with Mary Kay. I don't trust her. Say, why do you say that? She's got that soap and water look in her eye. She's gonna wash me. <laughs> well, why don't you let her? You might get to like it. Come on, Doc. <laughs> I'm coming. Well, take care of each other, you two. Hey, look. I'll make a deal with you. Yeah? What kind of a deal? You don't wash me. I don't run out on you. <laughs> Why the big beef about washing? Doesn't your grandmother ever wield a wash rag? My grandmother don't ever make me do nothing. Well, she must care about you. Or why does she give you injections to make you sleep? I don't know. But it's not because she cares about me. Oh, that's too bad. No, it ain't. It's okay. She don't care about nothing, and I don't care about nothing. And it's okay, see? Well, this is the house. What a fire trap. Look out we don't break our necks getting up on the porch. Well, come on. Don't rap too hard. You'll knock the door off its hinges. Hmm. Maybe Grandma ain't home. Oh. Maybe she's out playing bridge at Beverly Wilshire or having tea with the upper Hold it. Hmm. Somebody's answering the door. I don't hear nothing. He's listening just inside the door. Why don't you try knocking again? Well? You're Mrs. Edwards? The name be Mrs. Edwards. But why shouldn't it be? We represent an insurance company. <laughs> and do I look like a good risk, young man? Oh, we're not trying to sell insurance. No? No. And my name's Jack Packard. How do you do, Mr. Jack Packard? And this is Doc Long. Do tell. I've always been very partial to long, lanky young men with red hair myself. Why, Grandma, what a beautiful <laughs> smile you got. And from Texas, too. <laughs> Texas boy, if there was one. How about us coming in and talking a little, huh? Just a minute. Huh? You said you was from the insurance. That's right. We're detectives for an insurance company. Oh. Detectives? Yes. What's an insurance company need a detective? 
Why, um, I don't know whether I should tell you this or not. Yeah. Well, you see, when a person insured by our company dies and leaves a large amount of money for us to pay to his relatives... Somebody done that. Died and left a lot of money. Happens every day. I leave. Bean door. You'll have to excuse me with no carpets on the floor, on account that they've been sent to the cleaners for weeks now. What she really means is pawn shop. Cut it out there. Come right in, gentlemen. Come right in. It ain't much furniture, I grant you. But what there is, you're welcome to it. Hey, you think this apple box will hold me up? Well, suppose I am poor. There ain't no call to make fun of a poor old lady who's doing the best she can, is there? Oh, on, it's Miss Edward. I, I know how it is. I was young and thoughtless once myself. Young Bond, the uncle. Tolerate, that's all. Just barely tolerated to handle what... Jack, why out of here in my business, huh? Oh, no, you mustn't go. Just say somebody leaving the lot of Oh, Miss Edwards, that was just an old... Yes, Mrs. Edwards, just an old acquaintance. Huh? At least to understand. You do know, or should I say you did know, a gentleman by the name of... Mac Rob... Oh, you would be meaning dear old Robbie. And it would be that... Robbie died and left me money. Of course I'm calling him. He died. Almost married a different time. He did. And if he left the more than he should, us being what word to each other. That yours. You can go any further. It's getting Robert Colley's money for it. Ask your pupils. It's about Robbie. No, they're not. Then, sir. What's my grandson to do with it? Everything, I think. But it's... That's right. Relation in the will. The money goes to you only providing you've been a good grand... I haven't been, mother. Oh, just in the will. You see, Mr. Macaulay loved children. Ah, I remember we did. Oh, we've got to make sure in our own mark here. But could we see it? Why, uh, why, I think the loving lad is at his school at the moment. Right. Well, I suppose it's really necessary to see him personally. And maybe show us around, show us his room, his toys. What for? They have some which to form opinion of your relation with your grandson. Did you ever know a grandmother and some children? No. Did you? Oh, no, not that I... Well, they... Bud and I mother care how... He'd tell you the same thing if he was home. So what more? The way, Doc. Another appointment. Huh? Look, it's almost four o'clock. I wonder if you'll stay up with Mrs. I run along. What about the me? Uh, Doc will finish talking with you about that. Nice and old and such as you, Miss Woods. Take good care of Mrs. Ed. Well, he certainly had to get up and go in a hurry. <laughs> yeah, that's Jack. Abrupt. Hey, you know what I think, Miss Edward? What? I think Jack just got up and left on account he wasn't getting anywhere with you. Getting anywhere. Why, sure. The minute you laid eyes on me and seen I was lanky and red-headed and from Texas, you wasn't interested in what he was saying at all. But what about Robbie McCauley's money? Oh, shucks, you ain't interested in money when you got a lanky Texas boy here. Who says I'm not interested in money? Why, Grandma, what greedy eyes you got. You wouldn't buy any chance to be one of the original 1890 gimme girls, would you? Just what is this, anyway? Grandma, could I ask you something? Don't call me Grandma. And you get out of this house. Oh, gonna get tough, huh? You want me to call the police? Why, sure. You want me to get them on the line for you? Well, what do you want to ask? Grandma, what's that stuff you've been shooting into Bud's arm at night with that syringe? Hey, Grandma, don't look so scared. Where's Bud? Where's my boy, Bud? Just take it easy now. Nothing's the matter with Bud. Bud's a sickly boy. Bud's not well and... What's that? Huh? What's what? There's somebody in my bed, too. Hey, maybe you got burglar. Or maybe you're just hearing things. Listen. He's standing just on the other side of that door. <laughs> Why, Grandma, what big ears you got. Look. The doorknob's turning. The door's opening. You. Well, if it ain't my old sidekick, John. You look pretty upset, Mrs. Edward. What are you doing in my bedroom? You're an old lady, Mrs. Edward. You shouldn't get so upset. Get out of my house. Do you hear me? Get out of my house. Sit down, Grandma. You let go of me. Sit down. Jack wants to talk to you. You can't do this it. to an old lady. You can't manhandle her. That'll be enough of that. You recognize this narcotic needle? Oh. Hey, a doggone syringe big enough for a horse. Mm. You do recognize it, don't you? The needle you've been using to give your grandson injections. What was the hypnotic drug you used? No, you're wrong. You're wrong. Never mind. Police laboratory will tell me quick enough. Where did you get this stuff? I'm a very old lady. Good thing you are, because I feel like messing somebody up good. 
Shooting a kid full of hypnotic drugs and then sending him out to do your dirty work for you. Hey, Jack, what kind of dirty work? Purse snatching, for one thing. When he was shot full of that stuff, he responded to any suggestion his grandmother made to him. That's how the old lady... Look, here's a couple of women's purses. Oh, ain't you a self you. <laughs> oh, cut the crocodile tears, Grandma. The most item. Found it tucked in the back corner of a bureau drawer. Oh, what? On the back engraved the following. Jarman from the Los Angeles Police Cushion. Patrolman Beekman. But he's been missed three weeks. Why, well, the problem has been like a bunch of caged wildcats. What's the matter? Nothing to... Mm. That's good either. That was a dirty bit trying to make a ten-year-old kid think he did it. Well, that hit up and he had the shot. Hear the officer's death cry. Over and over killed. He woke up. He believed it. They're acted. They persecute me. There's nothing I can do about it. You say all true? If I done all this, there's got to be a place. That's right. Have you the body? Grandma, you should have cleaned the shoes. Shoes? Mother. Where would a boy get muddy shoes walking her hood and all? I don't know. I didn't either. Out and looked around. There's been some new street work not so long ago. What happened? Did a water main break? I don't know what you're suggesting. I'm suggesting the patrolman Beekman was onto your little narcotic business. He told his office he was onto something. I think he came out here, put the bee on you, and you took care of him. Took care of him? Yeah. And planted the body out in the street excavation where they were repairing the water main. It was at night. Bud told us that much. And that's how Bud got his shoes muddy. So you think somebody shot somebody? That's right. Sit down, Grandma. You take your hands off. I told you to sit down. Just a minute. Man, have you an old lady? You think you're going to walk out on us? Who's walking out on anybody? You'll come with me. Where? Calling a body a murderess. I'll show you. Hey, watch her, Jack. She don't give you the slip. Who's giving anybody the slip? Stand aside so I can open this door. Hey, this old shack's got a basement. And what if it has? I'll show you if I'm a murderess or not. Keep on her heels, Jack. She's tricky. Well, you don't need to walk on the hem of my skirt. What's supposed to be down here? There now. Hey, just a dirt floor. Dank and soggy as a marsh. And now you know why my grandson got mud on his shoes. Hey, you must have an underground spring here. Oh, oh, watch your step. It's dank on the inside of a cow. Is that why you brought us down here? To show us this soggy basement? Turn your flashlight over in the corner there. Give me your flashlight. Yeah. Mm. There you are. Now say I'm a... Where is he? He's gone. Who's gone? What are you talking about? I had him tied up down here. How did he get away? You had who tied up down here? That Snoopy policeman. You had Officer Beekman tied down here in this basement for three weeks? He was hurt. I was nursing him back to health. Tied up down here in this pneumonia hatchery and you was nursing him back to health? You're nuts, Grandma. Doc, call the homicide squad. Tell them to bring their picks and shovels. Grandma, Mary Kay, they got more cops swarming over that old lady's house than locust time in Kansas. Mrs. Edwards is under arrest for murder? Well, they ain't booked her yet. They're looking for Officer Beekman's body. Oh. They're digging up the street in front of the house and in the basement. It's buried there someplace. Why's Jack got Bud in his office? Well, I'm supposed to be catching you up on what's happened while he tries to pry something out of the kid. Now that his grandmother's in Hawk, what's to become of him? Bud? I don't know. Juvenile court, I reckon. Oh, that's too bad. Honestly, he's nice people. Once I got some of the dirty off his hands and face. Hey, he let you wash it? Sure. We got to be as pally as... Hey, I got a grandmother, too. No kidding. A nice girl like me? Of course I have. She and Grandpa live in the country. Uh-oh. Jack wants us to come in. Yeah. No kidding, though, Doc. You know, I'm sure. What, what's the matter with the idea? Don't ask me if Bud likes it and your grandma likes it. Come on in, you two. Hey, you got anything new, Jack? Bud and I have been talking about where he'd live. Yeah, I, I know she wasn't very much of a grandmother, but, well, golly, when she's the only grandmother a fella got. Hey, Bud, I was just thinking. Yeah? Yeah. I got a swell grandmother, a country grandmother. How'd you like to have a share of her? You, you think she'd want me? Make your bet. You mean 
You mean real country with cows and butter and stuff? Honest to goodness cows and honest to goodness butter. Hey, that's something I've always wondered about. Say, when you get butter right out of a cow, who do you pay your red coupons to? Oh. <laughs> I'll take it, Mary Hello? Yeah, Packard speaking. Oh, hello, Inspector. Hey, what's that? Well, you don't say. Well, that's better than a... Oh, out of his head. Huh? Well, good. Yeah, murder always leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Thanks for calling, Inspector. Check. Hey, what are you grinning about? Officer Beekman's alive. Well, shut that's my mouth. That's wonderful. Hmm? The old lady did have him tied up. She fired at him, but only creased him. Tied him up and dragged him into the cellar. You said something about out of his head? Well, he's in the county hospital. Picked up wandering dazed on the street, out of his head with fever. He's going to live? Yeah, but how did he get away? The old lady got careless or something. But he's alive, bud. Do you know that's a wonderful thing for you? Yeah. You bet. Murder is a tough thing for a kid to carry around on his shoulders, even to the third and fourth generation. Hey, you know something? I'm nuts about the way you talk, Mr. Packard. Yeah? Even to the third and fourth generation. Yeah, someday I'm going to talk like that. You could do a lot worse, bud. Talk like him. Act like him. Hey, I think you're in love with him. <laughs> he thinks she's in love with him. Talk about your department of understatement. Well, what's the matter with that, you dope? <laughs> I'm not the dope. Jack the dope. D-O-P-E. With double palm and oak leaf cluster. <laughs> And now, in place of the closing commercial, may we enumerate several other titles which are now in preparation for this series. The Great Airmail Robbery, Marriage by Death, The Voice from the Grave, The Wife Came Home, and The Crime of a Man Named Jones. Also, may we remind you that the first motion picture version of I Love a Mystery is now playing at your local theaters. The second and third pictures are now in production at Columbia Studios. California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invite you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice. Danger is my stock and trade. If the trouble you're in is way off the beaten track and you need help that's strictly confidential, you've got a job for me. George Valentine. Write full details. <laughs> Yes, sir. You employed the word confidential in your advertisements. Uh, well, I need confidential help. Uh, my enthusiasm for birds has led me into a predicament. I was watching starlings, uh, but I saw something that was never meant to be seen, and it keeps haunting me, if I really saw it. Uh, unless my eyes deceive me... My eyes deceive me... I was the witness, the only witness, to an outrageous crime. There's nothing more I can say in a letter. Please contact me at once, and it's signed Elliot Wormsley. <laughs> Wormsley? That sounds like a name on a Dickens. Elliot Wormsley, MS, PhD, Statistical Services, Baxter Building. Birdwatcher, huh? Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of canaries is this statistician interested in anyway? Oh, stop kidding, George. That's a pretty grim phrase. I was the only witness to an outrageous crime. Yeah, and he's in a predicament. That's a twist. What was it he could have seen? I don't know, Brooksy, but let's see what we can see. Let's drop in on Dr. Wormsley. <laughs> These are the binoculars, Mr. Valentine. They're the ones I used to watch starlings on that penthouse roof down there. Uh -huh. But that's almost three blocks away, Dr. Bermson. Yeah, I know. The river house, huh? Pretty swanky. Golly, George. You can see halfway around the world with these binoculars. All right, Angel. Stop playing. Uh, back to you, Dr. Wormsley. So you looked for starlings and saw a killer hawk. Uh, something like that, Mr. Valentine. Okay. Now, just what was this outrageous crime? What did you see that you shouldn't have seen? Uh Murder. Oh, I guess I dropped your binoculars, Doctor. Did you say murder? Uh, I, I can't be sure. 
but I just trained my eyes down there, as I've been doing for weeks. And in that instant, I'm almost certain I saw a man push another man off the roof. Uh, of course, he had his back to me. What do you mean, almost certain, Dr. Wormsley? Well, it, it, it was over in a second, and I, I didn't expect to see what I think I saw. Besides, uh, statistics show that the element of error in visualization over a hundred yards is 14 to a thousand. Yeah, well, we'll take your word for that. But why didn't you go to the police with this story? Oh, no, no, Mr. Valentine. I'm a modest man, and I don't like publicity. Besides, I am coming up for the presidency of my club. And, uh, well, so many people think bird watching is, uh, well, uh, a little peculiar. Yes, I know, you wouldn't make it. But murder is a very serious business. Uh, Mr. Valentine, if I had seen any mention of what I suspected in the newspapers, I would have volunteered this information to the police. But as it is, no crime has been reported. That's right, George. I didn't see anything about it. Still, the picture of those two men keeps haunting me. I, I'm thinking of my reputation, but I, I do have some public spirit, and I have to make sure. My conscience wouldn't let me rest if I didn't. Oh, I see. And you want me to check at the River House and soothe your conscience. Uh, that's it, young man, precisely. It uh, shouldn't take you more than a day, and I'm uh, willing to pay your usual fee. <laughs> okay, it's a deal, Wormsley. Oh, Brooksy. Yes, George. Just on a hunch, get out of the Bureau of Missing Persons. See Finley. Okay. Find out if anybody's been reported missing from the River House. You will keep my name out of this, won't you? Oh, yes, we'll do our best, Professor. I'll meet you back here later, Brooksy. Okay, George. I'm going over to the River House. <laughs> Oh, you're very fortunate, Mr. Valentine. Penthouse B is vacant, and it's only $5,400 a year. Yeah, a point of information, Mr. Stevens. As I get it, the uh, sun deck of this wing facing the river is for the exclusive use of Penthouse A and B. Oh, it's very private. And Penthouse A is occupied by the Dunlaps, Philip Dunlap, the broker. So that would put you in very good company, and only $5,400 a year. Well, I was thinking of something a little better, but uh, I'll let you know. Who went and rang my doorbell? Wouldn't be the full of brush man, would you? <laughs> Not unless my samples are showing. <laughs> well, come on in anyway. I hope you'll pardon the sun suit. I wasn't expecting company. No, it's nothing at all. I mean, practically. I was out on the roof sunbathing. Oh, and Mrs. Dunlap? That's right. Well, I'm the chaplain. It's been a dull afternoon. Suppose we wait a while before you tell me what you want. Hmm? Well, as a matter of fact... You aren't going to stand there, are you? Here, sit down. <clears throat> Uh, the truth is, Mrs. Dunlap, I may be your next-door neighbor in Penthouse B. Oh. Well, that would be the first improvement they've made in River House without raising our rent. <laughs> I thought it'd be a nice gesture to sort of drop in on my possible neighbors and introduce myself. Hmm. There is a Mr. Dunlap, isn't there? Uh, yes, but you needn't worry about him. He hasn't been home for two days. Oh, just like that, huh? Mm, that's Philip for you. Thank heavens. He must have decided to go up to our cabin in the mountains to brood. Or he may be staying at his club. Mm. But as I said, this looked like a dull afternoon. We're not going to let it be one, are we? Ah. Uh, oh, fine. That wouldn't be Philip. He has his key. Well, whoever it is, just explain. I'm looking at the penthouse next door. Hal. Listen, Paula, we haven't heard from Philip yet, and there are letters and contracts he has to sign downtown. All right, Hal. I'm not my husband's keeper. Oh, just the same. I thought you might be worried. Oh. Oh, I didn't know you were having company. Oh, but this... Gentlemen may be our next door neighbor, I hope. Uh, Mr. The Ray... name's Valentine. Oh. Really, Paula. At least now you know his name. Oh, Mr. Valentine, this intense young man is my husband's secretary, Hal Sterrett. How do you do? Hi. I don't know what you're going to do, Paula, but I'm going to call the police and report Philip Mason. Uh, please do that, Hal. I'd feel so much better. Lord, how I hate righteous men, especially when they're young. So petulant. No. Oh. Where were we, Mr. Valentine? Uh, I was just about to leave. Oh, a mood is a very fragile thing, isn't it? <laughs> oh, you've been right neighborly, ma'am. <laughs> goodbye. I don't think it's goodbye. Anyway, it was very nice even not having known you. <laughs> Mr. 
Mr. Valentine. Uh, Mr. Valentine. Mm. Hello, Dr. Wormsley. I, I was waiting for you to come out of the River House. But why? I thought you made it a point you were to be the unknown factor in this deal. Uh, well, uh, after you left, I, I did some calculating. Yeah, good for you, good for you. There must be a way of getting into this empty lot without climbing over that fence. And in my calculations, I, I discovered that the odds against anything as extraordinary as this happening to an ordinary man like me would be about uh, uh, 14,000 to one. Mm, you don't say. Uh, so if you don't mind, Mr. Valentine, I'd, I'd sort of like to uh, tag along with you and see if I'm uh, really that one in 14,000. Uh-huh. Looks as though there's a gate in this fence. If I can get these trash cans out of the way... Hey, Brooksy, you should have brought a friend. We'd have a fourth for bridge. Oh, oh he- hello, Miss Brooks. Oh, George, there's been no report of anyone missing in this district. Oh, thanks. I was on my way to your office, Dr. Wormsley, when I saw you heading for the river house. So here I am. Well, kids, let's see what we should see. It's just an overgrown lot. Uh, that's right. George, you think that if Dr. Wormsley is right, the man would Nothing be... Nothing like checking, Brooksy. Dr. Dr. Wormsley, you did say that when you saw a man pushing another one off the roof, his back was towards you? If I saw what I thought I saw. That's right. Uh Uh-huh. That would mean he was facing away from you, toward the river. Uh, Yes, yes. Well, there's the river behind that highboard fence. And on this side of the building, there are only the windows and the elevator shafts and the stairway. So no one would have seen him fall. Uh, Mr. Valentine, over here, over here, look. That's a man. I mean, it was... Huh? Huh? Past tense is putting it my way. Oh, George. Then it... It wasn't my imagination after all. No. No, Dr. Wormsley, it wasn't. Just to quote a few more odds, it's at least a million to one this is the body of Philip Dunlap. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Ballantyne in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about the great American pastime. If you're a baseball fan, check these two tips for getting the most out of this season. Number one, when you're driving to and from the game, use fast-starting Chevron Supreme gasoline. Special blending agents in Chevron Supreme give your car speedy warm-up and quick pickup for traffic getaways. And when it comes to hill climbing, premium quality Chevron Supreme gasoline takes you smoothly over the steepest ones. Number two, at independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations where you can get Chevron Supreme gasoline, there's a grand gift for you. It's a 48-page book about baseball written by Bert Dunn. You'll find in your free copy of Batter Up the fundamentals about this great American sport. One illustrated section shows how to play each different position. Ask for a free copy of Batter Up tomorrow. It's yours at Standard Stations and Independent Chevron Gas Stations, where they say and mean, we'll take better care of your car. And now, back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. It's only natural for a member of the Bird Watcher Society, even when he's a professional statistician like Dr. Wormsley, to be watching starlings on a penthouse roof. But when instead his binoculars revealed one man pushing another off that self-same roof, well, that's just sort of a case George would get involved in. It's about an hour since George found Philip Dunlap's body in the weed-covered lot back of the apartment building. And now we join George and Claire talking to Lieutenant Riley at Homicide. Yeah, what is it? Uh, Lieutenant Riley, Donnelly just brought Hal Starrett in. Do you want to see him now? No. Let him cool his heels out there a while with Mrs. Dunlap. Yes, sir. Now, about Dr. Wormsley, Lieutenant Riley. Okay, Valentine, okay. When Lieutenant Johnson turned the case over to me, I didn't know what I was getting in for, but I'll do my best to keep your client's name out of the case. Ah, oh, you're a pal. Well, as a matter of fact, Lieutenant, you owe our little bird watcher a debt. He did uncover a murder. Miss Brooks, I don't want to appear ungrateful. Oh, no. I can always use a new murder. Oh, I'm overjoyed that when you and Valentine stumbled over this homicide, you were uh, thoughtful enough to let me know about it. Oh, well, it's nothing at all. If you hadn't, I'd lock both of you up and throw the key away. Well, now that you've had your own sweet self, would you mind telling us what you found out from Mrs. Dunlap? Uh, Well, she said she was out shopping all that afternoon, and the doorman is alibying her. 
When she got back, this kid, uh, Starrett, was still there, waiting to see his boss, Mr. Dunlap. He hung around a little longer and then beat it. Did uh, Mrs. Dunlap suggest that there might have been any bad blood between Starrett and her husband? Well, she wasn't too anxious to admit it, but it seems young Starrett was being fired. Yeah, but what was the reason? Bad spelling or making Google eyes at the boss's wife? I wouldn't know. Not yet. Mrs. Dunlap was too broken up to go into every little detail. <laughs> broken up, huh? I can just see her tears flowing like wine. What do you mean by that? Uh, well, just thinking out loud. Uh, yes, Lieutenant? You can send Starrett in here now. Yes, sir. Well, it looks to me as though Mr. Starrett has some explaining to do, or else. Well, we know that he was there that afternoon, and your Dr. Wormsley saw a man push Dunlap off the roof. Uh, come in, son, come in, come in. Lieutenant, Sit I don't down. understand any of this. I. Oh, you. Hello, Starrett. What are you doing here? Just a neighborly yeah. interest in the fate of your late employer? Say, what is this? Yes, George, I didn't know you two had met. Well, never mind. Now, what's this about Dunlap deciding to fire you, Starrett? Well, I, uh... Why? He, uh... He didn't like my work, I guess. That's the usual reason, isn't it? You'll save a lot of time if you tell us the truth. You asked me a question, and I gave you the only answer you're going to get. You had a fight with your boss, didn't you? No. In the struggle, you pushed him off the roof. No. A man saw you from an office building. He couldn't have. Oh, Lieutenant. Yes, Don Can I see you a minute? Yeah, okay. Mm. I'll be right back. Hey, tell me something, Starrett. Yes, if you were already fired, why were you so worried about Dunlap? Even going to the Bureau of Missing Persons yourself? Because he was the best friend I ever had. It hardly jives with the story Lieutenant Riley is building up. Hey, Starrett. Yes? You're a college man, aren't you? Oh, what of it? Syracuse, 1942. What? Why, oh, yes, but but how did you know? This, um, Phi, uh, Phi Beta Kappa, too, aren't you? That's right. But what are you driving at, Lieutenant? Well, the... Uh... This Phi Beta Kappa key. The medical examiner found it clenched in Dunlap's fist. It's yours. I... I don't know how it could have gotten there. He must have ripped the key off your chain as he fell off the roof. Okay, Starrett, I'm arresting you on suspicion of murder. It's nice of you to visit me in jail, Valentine. But what's the use of going over the same story again? All I would go right... Let's say it intrigues me, sir. Paula would go right on denying I ever gave her that key. I can't prove it. Why should you believe me any more than anyone else? Because I happen to know a little more about the lady in question. Now, look, friend, let's stop being delicate. Paula decided she liked your type and made you the odd man in the triangle. That's why Dunlap was giving you the gate. Oh, I... I tried to break off with her. But she always managed to be around. Taunting me. She had me spinning on my head... Say, did you have a fight with Dunlap when he fired you? No, I, I wish there had been. That would have been easier than the way it was. Go on. He was hurt, and I was sick and ashamed of myself. He knew there were others, and that made the whole thing even cheaper. Now, surely just firing you, Starrett, wasn't the answer for Dunlap. Oh, he knew that. One of my past acts as his secretary was drawing up the papers that cut her out of his will. Now, wait a minute. That just puts you in deeper. That means Paula had no motive. Hey, how about insurance? Well, uh, there was a big policy Philip took out recently with Paula's beneficiary. He didn't change that. Oh, isn't that kind of strange? Oh, it wasn't something he overlooked. There was a funny smile on his face when he told me he was leaving that as is. That's very interesting. Oh, look, Valentine, I didn't kill Philip. When I was there, I didn't even know he was out on the roof. Okay, I'll just take it easy. I'll do what I can. What can you do? You'll never get the truth about that key out of Paula. And Dr. Wor uh, Wormsley swears it was a man out there struggling with Philip. What man? A burglar? One of Paula's ex-boyfriends? Or possibly the man on the moon? I think I'll drop in on Paula again. I don't know what I expect to find, but with a gal like that, the unexpected is bound to be interesting. Well, if it isn't my next-door neighbor, what now? Cup of sugar? couple of eggs? Well, maybe I did make a little fib, but you didn't believe me anyway, did you, Mrs. Dunlap? Paula. Okay, Paula. Too bad about young Starrett, isn't it? What a thing to say to a grief-stricken widow. Can I get you anything? We may as well make ourselves comfortable. <laughs> You've got a head start in those lounging pajamas. They're really something. <laughs> I was wondering when you were going to notice them. Hey, you know, 
I never appreciated before what lounging pajamas can do for a woman. Didn't you? No, no. I might say if she were out on a roof and someone happened to see her from Dr. Wormsley's window, he might mistake her for a man. Hmm, if he'd never seen a woman before. His office is more than two blocks away. But uh, to get back to our hypothetical woman, yes. how much do you guess she'd have coming to her if her husband were murdered and there was a nice fat insurance policy, the only thing he didn't cut her out of? We've gotten a long way from lounging pajamas. Oh, I don't know. And I can't help wondering what the lady in question would do if she had a perfect patsy and a difficult young man who was suffering pangs of conscience. She might even do something brash if she happened to remember the Phi Beta Kappa key he gave her in a tender moment. Tell me, have you confided these flights of fancy to anyone else? No, oh, no, my sweet. I wanted you to be the first to know. And you, my sweet, will ruin your eyes reading all those pulp magazines. There's another angle to this lady of the rooftops. Oh, what's that? Hmm, with all the insurance money she's sure to get. With an admiring eye for a certain broad-shouldered character who seems to know what it's all about. Oh, she might make life very pleasant for him. Very. Uh, you couldn't say he knew what it was all about if he fell for a pitch like that now, could you? Oh. We better get my cigarette before we go on with this little game. Or you can quit playing any time you want to. My dear old father used to play a lot of poker. He used to say the game was never over till the last bluff was called. Uh-huh. Did your old man tell you that even one of those effeminate-looking automatics make a loud noise and leave holes when they go off? I have a permit for this gun. Oh, come on now, Paula. Let's see if you can answer that phone with one hand. You know, Georgie, that could be your next to the last glib remark. When that phone stops ringing, you're going to worry yourself into a tizzy, trying to guess who it was. We've been supposing a lot of things here tonight. Now, let me top it off. Suppose they found you draped on the floor there with a bullet in your head. Okay, what then? I was in bed when I heard sounds in the living room. I opened the door. There was a figure in the darkness. After everything I'd been through, I didn't stop to think. I shot the prowler. I gotta hand it to you, Paula. Skip it. Just sit there on the couch a few minutes till I get my story straight. When I shoot you, I may have to tell the story a dozen times tonight, so it's got to be perfect. Okay, you stalled too long. You missed your chance, beautiful. It'd be a mistake to shoot me now. What are you talking about? Behind you, there's somebody out there on the penthouse roof. How you know I'm smarter than that? Well, who's... Okay, come on now. Oh, you... Drop it. Oh, that you? Oh, George, there you are. I tried to call, and then I remembered about the empty penthouse next door and the adjoining sun deck, and... Oh, for Pete's sake, somebody say something. Oh, just a little parlor game, Brooksy. Uh, yes, yes. I, I was just showing Mr. Valentine how I almost mistook him for an intruder. Oh, <laughs> Uh, Lieutenant Raleigh will probably find it very amusing when we tell him about it. Oh, that ain't the way I see it. For the time being, Angel, we have to see things Paula's way. But more important right now is to see if we can get a man out of bed. No trouble at all, Valentine. Don't mind selling a little insurance any time of the night. Are these all representative policies, Bennett? Yes, sir. Anything you want, we've got it. Life, accident, comprehensive liability, tornado insurance, plate glass. Any insurance against fatality during parlor games? Uh, what's that, Miss Brooks? Uh, just a private joke. This life insurance policy. Oh, any amount you want. It's a simple physical Well, these clauses family. at the beginning, they're pretty standard in all life insurance policies, aren't oh, they? Yes, indeed. Each one of them meant to protect policyholder and the company. Huh? What's up, George? Well, uh, thanks a lot, Bennett. You've been a great help. Yeah, but look, old man. Sorry, I'm shopping around, but I'll keep you in mind. Let's go, Brooksy. Now, Brooksy, first thing in the morning, I want you to check with all the druggists in this section of town around River House, Dr. Wormsley's office, 20 or 30 blocks in each direction. Oh, my aching feet. I'm going to be with Lieutenant Riley. I hate to think of his blood pressure when I mention one little word. What up, Chief? That's the word. Darling, sign, if I had any hair, I'd tear it out. What are you talking about? Well, now, look, it can't do any harm, Lieutenant. No one in his right mind can doubt how Dunlap died. This Wormsley saw him shoved off the roof. Then the body was found sprawled all over an empty lot, 12 floors below. Cause and effect. I have every reason to doubt that Sterrick killed Dunlap. Ah, I suppose you're going to tell me Mrs. Dunlap killed him, huh? 
that she used to be the strong woman in the circus. I didn't say she killed him. Then who, what? Ah, for the love of heaven. How about that autopsy, Lieutenant? All right, Doctor. Will you tell Valentine here that he's just been wasting our time? I wouldn't say that, Lieutenant. Huh? What'd you find? Enough poison in Dunlap to stop an army dead in its tracks. All right. All right, I can't argue with the laboratory. But I don't get it, Valentine. How many times do you kill a man? Poison, throw him off the roof. Ah, it's a wonder we didn't find a knife at back, too. Doctor, just how does this particular poison work? Instantly. Every muscle in the body becomes rigid all at once and stays there. Uh Uh-huh, then it's possible that after a couple of days, the effects of the poison could be mistaken for rigor mortis. Not only possible, Mr. Valentine. It seems just what happened. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. If Dunlap's fist was clenched like that the moment the poison took effect, how did that five beta copper key get in his hand? That's the point, Lieutenant. It was forced into it. And certainly Hal Starrett didn't do it. That does it. That does it. I'm going to have Paula Dunlap picked up, and she'd better have all the answers. <laughs> Oh, no. No, Mrs. Dunlap, you're going to have to do better than that. I know how it looks, Lieutenant Raleigh, but you're wrong. Believe me. Paula, you had to be the one who put that key in your husband's hand. Sterrett wouldn't sign his own death warrant. I know, but Here are the facts the jury will hear. You were the man Wormsley saw wearing lounging pajamas. You had the motive, the insurance money, so you poisoned Mr. Dunlap, then pushed him off the roof to implicate an innocent man. All right. All right, I'll tell you just what happened. Remember, Mrs. Dunlap, you're doing this of your own free will. Hal Sterrett left that afternoon. I went out on the roof for a moment. Philip was there, an empty highball glass next to him. He was dead. Oh, don't look at me that way. He was already dead. He committed suicide. How do you know that? There was a note, cruel note, saying that I was the cause of all the unhappiness in his life. He was leaving me without a cent. Okay. I suppose you have the note. No. No, I destroyed it. Oh, no, that wasn't very smart. Don't you see? I had to. So no one would ever find out it was suicide. Now, wait a minute. There was a clause in his policy. It's in most policies. Saying that if he killed himself within the first year, the beneficiary wouldn't get a cent. That much is true. What I did was wrong, but I wasn't going to let Philip leave me without a cent. That'll stand up in court, won't it? Even though I did destroy the note, they'll believe me, won't they? Since you ask my opinion... The answer's no. But my job is finished now. Oh, no, no. George. I... George. Hey, how goes it, Brooksy? What luck? You were right. I found out what she wanted to know at the Gotham Pharmacy on Morton Boulevard. Now what? What am I going to do? I've got to find a way to prove I'm innocent. This isn't fair. Remembering that gun you held in my face and Hal Starrett, I'm tempted to keep my mouth shut and let you stew in your own juice. What do you mean? Me and you both. I don't know what charge you're going to hold her on, Lieutenant. But it won't be murder. What? Did you hear what he said, Lieutenant? What are you talking about, Valentine? Brooksy just found out that Philip Dunlap bought that poison himself at the Gotham Pharmacy. On a doctor's prescription he forged. Oh, George. Oh, how can I ever thank you? Oh, that's easy. The next time you're up on that roof alone, see if you can prove the law of gravity really works. Don't you think that was sort of a morbid joke for Dunlap to play on his wife? Well, Angel, Paula played a few pretty grim jokes herself. Yes, but to leave her name in that insurance policy, knowing that she wouldn't get a penny. Crime, punishment, so forth. Oh, uh, hello. Anybody here? Oh, oh Dr. Burton. I just thought I'd drop in and take care of that little bill I owe you. Oh, thanks. Um, how did the birds look these days, Doctor? It was. Oh, yes, yes. That reminds me. I must thank you, Valentine, for keeping my name out of the Dunlap case. After all, I was the key witness, and I... Uh, Oh, dear. Well, that's all washed up now. Uh, thank goodness. Oh, yes. Hmm? Mrs. Dunlap isn't living there anymore, you know. Huh? It seems three young ladies are sharing that apartment now. And yesterday... Why, Dr. Wormsley, what kind of birds are you watching now? Oh, well, uh, they, uh, they were very wild canaries. Oh, goodness, <laughs> what am I saying? <laughs> Now, a message of importance to motorists. 
If this is the time of year your family gets travel-minded, it's probably the time you start thinking about new tires. And you know which make of tire gives you a written warranty against ordinary road hazards? The answer is easy. Atlas Tire. That's right. Each new Atlas passenger tire is warrantied for 12 months against blowouts, cuts, and bruises that might happen to ordinary tires. And each Atlas Tire has a double warranty. First, by the manufacturer, and second, by the distributor. Another thing to keep in mind when you're buying tires is that two or four wear better than an uneven number. Give you softer riding and easier car handling. For that extra margin of safety, get Atlas tires at standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear... Well, Brooksy, looks like playing Big Brother a la Spencer Tracy didn't work out. Eddie beat it while I was shaving. Oh, that crazy little kid. Yeah, he left this note. He's on the prowl to quote he's going after Stan Lucas. Oh, no. What can we do, George? i got to stop him somehow. Hey, listen, you look up Emily. Maybe she can give us a clue how we can find Eddie. Okay, George. And remember, Brooksy, it's a race against time. <laughs> Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George, with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appeared as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Louise Arthur, Fred Howard, Peter Leeds, Charles Seal, and Charles Lund. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Don't forget to listen again next week, one hour earlier, over the same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Good evening. This is Orson Welles. Your producer of a special series of broadcasts presented by the makers of Pabst Blue Ribbon. The Mercury Summer Theater of the Air. Ladies and gentlemen, the element of suspense is so vital to our story tonight that our sponsors, the makers of Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer, are omitting their usual commercial message during the intermission between the acts so that our play will go uninterrupted from spooky start to spooky finish. Therefore, let's give Ken Roberts his 45-second opportunity right now to extol the merits of that blended, splendid... Uh, Ken? Of that blended, splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. Those two words tell the whole flavor story. You see, every single drop of Pabst Blue Ribbon is the happy result of blending the full flavor blending of never less than 33 fine brews. That's right. Never less than 33 fine brews blend their individual taste tones to give you that splendid flavor. Not too light, not too heavy, but fresh, clean, sparkling, with the real beer taste coming through just the way you like it. Friends, these days, when your dealer is occasionally unable to supply you with all the Pabst Blue Ribbon you'd like, Please keep on asking. For every single bottle you do get will live up to the same high standards of quality and taste. Yes, every bottle will be, as always, blended, splendid, Pabst Blue Ribbon. And now, Mr. Wells. We of the Mercury reckon that a story doesn't have to appeal to the heart, it can also appeal to the spine. Sometimes you want your heart to be warm, sometimes you want your spine to tingle. Well, the tingling, it's to be hoped, will be quite audible as you listen tonight to a classic among radio thrillers. Its author is one of the most gifted of all the writers who ever worked for this medium, Lucille Fletcher, who wrote the greatest single radio script ever written. Sorry, wrong number. The title of this, her terrifying little tale of Gru, for this evening, is another 
spine-tingler by name, the Hitchhiker. I am in an auto camp on Route 66, just west of Gallup, New Mexico. If I tell it, maybe it'll help me. It'll keep me from going crazy. But I must tell this quickly. I'm not crazy now. I feel perfectly well. Perfectly well. Except that I'm running a slight temperature. My name is Ronald Adams. I'm 36 years of age, unmarried, tall, dark, with a black mustache. I drive a 1940 Ford V8, license number 6V7989. I was born in Brooklyn. All this I know. I know that I'm at this moment perfectly sane. That it is not me who's gone mad. But something else. Something utterly beyond my control. But I must speak quickly. At any moment, the link with life may break. This may be the last thing I ever tell on Earth. The last night I ever see the stars. Six days ago, I left Brooklyn to drive to California. Goodbye, son. Good luck to you, my boy. Goodbye, Mother. Here, give me a kiss, and then I'll go. I'll come out with you to the car. Now, it's raining. Stay here at the door. Oh. Hey, what's this, tears? Oh, it's just the trip, Ronald. I wish you weren't driving. Oh, Mother, there you go again. People do it every day. I know, but you'll be careful, won't you? Promise me you'll be extra careful. Don't fall asleep or drive fast or pick up any strangers now, on the road. Strangers? Don't you worry. There's anything going to happen. It's just eight days of perfectly simple driving on smooth, decent, civilized roads with a hot dog or a hamburger stand every ten miles. I was in excellent spirits. Drive ahead. Even the loneliness seemed like a lark. But I reckoned without him crossing Brooklyn Bridge that morning in the rain, I saw a man leaning against the cables. He seemed to be waiting for a lift. There were spots of fresh rain on his shoulders. He was carrying a cheap overnight bag in one hand. He was thin, nondescript, with a cap pulled down over his eyes. He stepped off the walk, and if I hadn't swerved, if I hadn't swerved, I'd have hit him. I almost did. Almost did hit him. Now, I would have forgotten him completely, except that just an hour later, while crossing the Pulaski Skyway over the Jersey Flats, I saw him again. At least he looked like the same person. He was standing now with one thumb, pointing west. I couldn't figure out how he got there, but I thought maybe one of those fast trucks had picked him up, beat me to the Skyway, and let him off. I didn't stop for him. Then, late that night, I saw him again. It was on the new Pennsylvania turnpike between Harrisburg and Pittsburgh. It's 265 miles long with a very high speed limit. I was just slowing down for one of the tunnels when I saw him standing under an arc light by the side of the road. I could see him quite distinctly. The bag, the cap, even the spots of fresh rain spattered over his shoulders. He hailed me this time. Hello! Hello! I stepped on the gas like a shot. That's lonely country through the Alleghenies, and I had no intention of stopping. Besides, the coincidences, or whatever it was, gave me the willies. I stopped at the next gas station. Yes, sir. Fill her up, will you? Check your oil? No, thanks. Nice night, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, it it uh, hasn't been raining here lately, has it? Not a drop of rain all week. Oh, no? I, I suppose that hasn't done your business any harm. Well, people drive through here all kinds of weather. Mostly business, though. Ain't many pleasure cars out in the turnpike this season of the year. I guess not. What about hitchhikers? <laughs> Hitchhikers here? Why, well, what's the matter? Don't you ever see any? A guy would be a fool to start out to hitchhike on this road. Look at it. Then you never see anybody? No. Nope. Maybe they get a lift before the turnpike starts. I mean, you know, just before the toll house. But then it's a mighty long ride. Most cars wouldn't pick up a guy for that long a ride. 
This is pretty lonesome country here, mountains and woods. Yeah. You ain't seen nobody like that, have you? Oh, no, no, it's it's just a <laughs> technical question. Oh, I see. Well, uh, that'll be a dollar forty-nine with the tax. <laughs> thing gradually passed from my mind is coincidence. I had a good night's sleep in Pittsburgh. I didn't think about the man all next day until just outside of Zanesville, Ohio. I saw him again. It was a bright, sunshiny afternoon. The peaceful Ohio fields, brown with the autumn stubble, lay dreaming in the golden light. I was driving slowly, drinking it in, when the road suddenly ended in a detour. In front of the barrier, he was standing. Let me explain about his appearance before I go on. I repeat, there was nothing sinister about him. He was as drab as a mud fence, nor was his attitude menacing. He merely stood there, waiting, almost drooping a little the cheap overnight bag in his hand. He looked... He looked as though he'd been waiting there for hours. And he hailed me. He started to walk forward. Hello. Hello. I'd stopped the car, of course, for the detour. For a few minutes, I couldn't seem to find the new road. I realized he must be thinking that I'd stop for him. Hello. No, no, I'm... Not just now, I, I'm sorry. Going to California? No, no, not today. The other way, I'm... I'm going to New York. Sorry. Sorry! After I got the car back onto the road again, I felt like a fool. Yet the thought of picking him up, of having him sit beside me was somehow unbearable. Yet at the same time, I felt more than ever unspeakably alone. Hour after hour went by. The fields, the towns ticked off one by one. The lights changed. I knew now that I was going to see him again. And though I dreaded the sight, I, I caught myself searching the side of the road waiting for him to appear. Yep. What is it? What you want? You sell sandwiches and pop here, don't you? Yep, we do. In the daytime. But it closed up for the night. I know, but I, I was wondering if, if you could possibly may have a cup of coffee. Black coffee. Not at this time of night, mister. My wife's a cook and she's in bed. Well, now, l listen. Ju just a minute ago, there was a man standing here, right, right beside here, and... He was a suspicious-looking man. Henry? Who is it, Henry? It's nobody, Mother. Here's a pair of things he wants a cup of coffee. Now, go back into bed. I, I don't mean to disturb you, but you see... <laughs> I was driving along when I just happened to look, and there he was. What was he doing? Nothing. You've been hitting a bottle. That's, a, that's what's the matter with you. You got nothing better to do than wake decent folk out of their hard-earned sleep. Now get going, go on. But he, he, he looked as though he was going to rob you. I ain't got nothing in this stand to lose. Down your way before I call out chair folks. I got into the car again and drove on slowly. I was beginning to hate the car. If I could have found a place to stop to rest a little bit. I'm in the Ozark Mountains of Missouri now. A few resort places there were closed. I had seen him at that roadside stand. I knew I'd see him again. Maybe at the next turn of the road. I knew that when I saw him next, I'd run him down. But I didn't see him again until late the next afternoon. I'd stop the car at a sleepy little junction just across the border into Oklahoma. Let a train pass by when he appeared across the tracks. 
He was leaning against a telephone pole. It was a perfectly airless, dry day. The red clay of Oklahoma was baking under the southwestern sun. Yet there were spots of fresh rain on his shoulders. I couldn't stand that. Without thinking blindly, I started the car across the tracks. He didn't even look up at me. He was staring at the ground. I stepped on the gas hard, veering the wheel sharply toward him. I could hear the train in the distance now, but I didn't care. Then, something went wrong with the car. It, it stalled right on the tracks. The train was coming closer. I could hear its bell. I heard it cry, its whistle crying. Still, he stood there. Now I knew that he was beckoning. Beckoning me to my death. him that time. The starter had worked at last. I managed to back up, but after the train had passed, he was gone. I was all alone in the hot, dry afternoon. After that, I knew I had to do something. I didn't know who this man was or what he wanted of me. I only knew that from now on, I mustn't let myself be alone on the road for one minute. Hello there. Hello. Like a ride? What do you think? How far you go? Am Amarillo. I'll, I'll, I'll take you to Amarillo. Amarillo, Texas? Yeah, I'll drive you there. Gee. Pop here. It's... Mind if I take off my shoes? My dog's are killing me. No, go right ahead. Oh, gee, what a break this is. Swell car and decent guy driving all the way to Amarillo. All I've been getting so far is trucks. You hitchhike much? Sure. Only it's tough sometimes in these great open spaces to get the break. Yeah, I think it would be. The... I'll bet, though, you could... If, if, you, if you got a good pickup in a fast car, you could get to places faster than, what well, we'll say, another person in another car. I don't get you. Well, well you, you take me, for instance. Suppose I'm driving across the country at a nice, steady clip of about 45 miles an hour. Couldn't a girl like you just standing beside the road, waiting for lifts, beat me to town after town, provided she got picked up every time in a car that was doing 65 or, or 70 miles an hour? I don't know. Maybe she could, maybe she couldn't. What difference does it make? Oh, there's no difference. It's just... <laughs> crazy idea I had sitting here in the car. Oh, imagine spending your time in a swell car thinking of things like that. What would you do instead? What would I do? If I was a good-looking fellow like yourself? Well, I'd just enjoy myself. Every minute of the time, I'd sit back and relax. If I saw a good-looking girl along the side of the road... Hey! Oh! Did you see him, too? See who? That man, standing beside the barbed wire fence. I didn't see anybody. Right there. There was nothing, just a barbed wire fence. What did you think he was doing, trying to run into that barbed there wire fence? There was a man fence? there, I tell you. A, a thin, gray man with an overnight bag in his hand. I was trying to run him down. Run him down? You mean kill him? I'm, I'm trying to get rid of him. Or at least prove that he's real. But you, you say you didn't see him back there. You sure? I didn't see a soul. As far as that's concerned... Well, watch for him. Watch him the next time. Then keep watching. Keep your eyes peeled on the road. He'll turn up again. Maybe any minute now. There! Look right there! How does this door work? I'm, I'm getting out of here. Did you see him that time? Did you no. see him? No, I didn't see him that time. And personally, mister, I don't expect never to see him. All I want to do is go on living. And I don't see how I will very long driving no, with look, you. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't know... What came over me? Please don't go. Oh, if you'll excuse Please, me. Please, you mister. can't go. Listen, how'd you like to go to California? I'll drive you all the way to California. You think elephants all the way? No, thanks. Listen, please, just one minute. You know what I think you need, big boy? Not a girlfriend, just a good dose of sleep. 
There, I got it now. No. No, you can't go! Leave your hands off of me, do you hear? Leave your hands! Come back here, please! Come back! She ran from me. As if I was... some kind of monster. A few minutes later, I saw a passing truck pick her up. I knew then that I was utterly alone. I was in the heart of the great Texas prairies. There wasn't a car on the road after the truck went by. I tried to figure out what to do, how to get hold of myself. If I could find a place to rest, or even if I could sleep right here in the car, just a few hours of sleep, just along the side of the road. I was getting my winter overcoat out of the back seat to use as a blanket, just as a blanket, when I saw him coming toward me. Coming toward me, emerging from the herd of moving steer. I didn't wait for him to come any closer. Maybe, maybe I should have spoken to him then. Fought it out then and there for... Now he began to be everywhere. Whenever I stopped even for a minute for gas, for oil, for a drink, a pop, a cup of coffee, a sandwich. He was there. I saw him standing outside the auto camp in Amarillo that night when I dared to slow down. He was standing near the drinking fountain, a little camping spot just inside the border of New Mexico. He was waiting for me outside the Navajo reservation where I stopped to check my tires. I saw him in Albuquerque, where I bought ten gallons of gas. I was afraid now. Afraid to stop. I began to drive faster and faster. I was in... in lunar landscape now. The great arid Mesa country of New Mexico. I drove through it with the indifference of a fly crawling over the face of the moon. And now he didn't even wait for me to stop, unless I drove at 85 miles an hour over those endless roads. He waited for me at every other mile. I see his figure, shadowless, flitting before me, still in its same attitude, over the cold and lifeless ground, flitting over dried up rivers, over broken stones cast up by old glacial upheavals, flitting in the pure and cloudless air. Gallup, New Mexico, this morning. There's an auto camp here. It's cold. Almost deserted this time of year. I went inside and asked if there was a telephone. I, I had the feeling that if I could speak to somebody familiar, somebody that I loved, I could pull myself together. Number, please. Long distance. Thank you. This is long distance. I'd like to put in a call to my home to Brooklyn, New York. <clears throat> I'm Ronald Adams. The number is Beechwood 9970. Thank you. Thank you. What is your number? My number? It's, it's, it's 312. Albuquerque. New York for Gallup. New York. Gallup, New Mexico, calling a Beachwood 9970. I'd read somewhere that love could banish demons. It was in the middle of the morning. I knew Mother'd be home. I pictured a tall, white head and a crisp house dress going about her tasks. 
It would be enough, I thought, just to hear the even calmness of her voice. Will you please deposit $3.85 for the first three minutes? When you have deposited a dollar and a half, will you wait until I have collected the money? All right. Deposit another dollar and a half. Deposit the remaining eighty five cents. Ready with Brooklyn. Go ahead, please. Hello, Mrs. Adams residence. Hello, hello, mother. This is Mrs. Adams residence. Who is it you wish to? What? Who is this? This is Mrs. Whitney. Mrs. Whitney? I, I don't know any Mrs. Whitney. Is this Beechwood nine nine seven zero? Yes. Where's my mother? Where's Mrs. Adams? Mrs. Adams is not at home. She's still in the hospital. The, the hospital? Yes. Who is this calling, please? Is it a member of the family? What's she in the hospital for? She's been prostrated. Five days, a nervous breakdown. Nervous. Who is this calling? Nervous breakdown. My mother was never. It's all taken place since the death of her oldest son, Ronald. Since the death of her oldest son, Ronald. Hey, what is this? What number is this? This is Beechwood nine nine seven zero. It's all been very sudden. He was killed just six days ago in an automobile accident on the Brooklyn. Bridge. Your three minutes are up, sir. Your three minutes are up, sir. Your three minutes are up, sir. Sir, your three minutes are up. Your three minutes are up, sir. And so, I'm sitting here in this deserted auto camp in Gallup, New Mexico. So I'm trying to think. I'm I'm trying to get a hold of myself. Otherwise, otherwise I'll go crazy. Outside, it is night. The vast, soulless night of New Mexico. A million stars are in the sky. Ahead of me, stretch a thousand miles of empty mesa, and mountains, prairies, desert. Somewhere among them, he is waiting for me. Somewhere, somewhere I shall know who he is and who. I am. Austin Wells will be back in just a few seconds to tell you about next week's production of the Mercury Summer Theater. But first, the makers of Pabst Blue Ribbon wish to remind you that though you may not be able to get Pabst Blue Ribbon every time you want it in these days of grain restrictions, it is well worth your while to keep asking, for every bottle you do get will continue to live up to its name. And speaking of grain restrictions, not a single grain of wheat is being used in the brewing of beer and ale. And the grains that are being used by breweries are not the grains wanted for famine relief. Now, let me repeat, when you do get Pabst Blue Ribbon, you can be sure this truly great beer will be as always, the happy blending of never less than 33 fine brews. As always, 
Splendid, splendid, Pabst Blue Ribbon. Now, here is Orson Welles. Well, next week, ladies and gentlemen, we bring to your radio another Mercury favorite. We hope a favorite of yours. You've asked for it many times. We've performed it many times. Jane Eyre. And Jane will be played by a Mercury actress who was heard tonight and has been heard so often on our shows. One of the most gifted people we know in our business, Miss Alice Frost. Jane Eyre then, with Alice Frost and your obedient servant, that's the same time next week, same station. Please join us. Until then, speaking for my sponsors, the makers of Paps Blue Ribbon Beer, for all of us on the Mercury Theater, including Bernard Herman, who wrote and conducted the music on this program, I remain, as always, obediently yours. <laughs> More than one half of all our nation's workers make their living in the food industry or a related field. One of the largest groups in the food industry are the grocers. Next week in Chicago, the National Association of Retail Grocers, which represents more than 500,000 retailers, is holding its first post-war convention, at which problems of food distribution will be discussed and new ideas and methods will be worked out to better serve its customers. The makers of Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer salute the grocer, who was doing his very best under trying conditions to keep America well fed. This program came to you through the courtesy of the Pabst Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, makers of blended, splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> Jimmy Stewart with a welcome to the Hollywood Star Playhouse, brought to you by the Bakers of America. Hollywood Star Playhouse, 30 minutes of mystery, thrills, drama, by Hollywood's finest writers featuring Hollywood's top stars. Brought to you by the Bakers of America through the cooperation of your baker. Hello there, this is Wendell Niles. In a moment, we'll bring you Act One of today's transcribed story, The Six Shooter, starring Mr. James Stewart. Friends, depend on your baker to help you serve better meals through bakery foods. Whether he's the baker in your bake shop, the baker who supplies your grocer, or the baker who calls at your door, your baker is the man who provides so many of the good foods that mean mealtime satisfaction for you and your family. Because almost every day of the year, very likely every meal of the day, you enjoy something that a baker makes. So for variety, convenience, economy, for nutritious good eating, count on your baker to help you serve better meals through bakery foods. And now... Act One of The Six Shooter, starring Mr. James Stewart. The rain had stopped, but the wind still carried slivers of moisture that cut into the boy's face as he rode along the edge of the creek. When he saw the yellow light from the back of the office, he pulled up and slid out of the saddle. Then he tied a wet bandana under his eyes and walked to the door. All right, hi. Way up, both of you. And stay away from that shotgun. Now, now look here. You, 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 get over to the safe. Better hurry it up, mister. All right, now open it. I said to open it. All right, toss me that sack. Okay. Hey, the luck! You... You... Now... You... Rotten... Little... I 
hadn't figured on going through Clay City. Uh, it was an hour out of my way, and I was already a day late to the Jefferson Ranch where I'd signed on for the roundup. But when Scar started limping from a loose shoe, didn't have no choice. We had to head for the nearest blacksmith shop, so we turned north. Mister, what's the trouble? Uh, the horse losing a shoe. Well, let's have a look. All right, raise it up, fella. Come on, come on, boy. Yeah, it's split, mister. He needs a new one. Okay, boy. Can you take care of it? Oh, sure. Bring him over here. Hey, uh, what happened to Red, fella you used to own this shop? Went to the van at Chasing Silver. I bought him out. Oh, I... yeah, you, you don't look very much like a blacksmith, huh? Oh, I'm stronger than I look. Heavier, too. What do you think I weigh, mister? Oh, I don't know. Go on, go on. Take a guess. 120? 30? Mm, well, no more than that. You a betting man, mister? Oh, well, sometimes. Well, I say I weigh over 130. If I don't, you get the new shoe for nothing. If I do, you pay me double. What do you say? Well, you got a set of scale? Don't need no scale. What do you say, mister? Is it a bet? <laughs> well, don't seem to be no way of proving it. Oh, all you got to do is lift me up. You look like a man who can judge weight. What do you say? Okay, all right, it's a bet. All right, mister, just heist me. If you don't think I weigh more than 130, the shoe is free. <laughs> all right, I, I never tried to judge a man's weight before, but all right. There, there we go. <laughs> well? Oh, I'll be done. Uh, I'm packed solid, mister, real solid. Well, you're packed tighter than a steer. Hey, you must weigh 150 pounds. Yeah, you see, you see, what did I tell you? 158. <laughs> the horseshoe's gonna cost you money, mister, but you ain't the only one. Ever since I bought the shop, there ain't been a stranger come through Clay City but what he paid double for his first horseshoe. <laughs> you ain't sore, mister. No, no, that was a fair bet. Sure it was. I told you I was heavier than I looked. That's what folks call me, Heavy Norton. My real name's George, but everybody calls me Heavy. Hey, what's your name, mister? Ponson. Britt Ponson. Fella, they call the Six Shooter? Oh, gone. I've heard about you, mister. I've sure heard about you. <laughs> oh, would have recognized you if I'd have noticed your gun. Sure is fancy, ain't it? Hey, do you mind, uh... Showing it to me? No, no. Here, catch. <laughs> Real fancy. Just like Sheriff Schofield said. He says he's seen you fire six shots with it while Whitey Jackson was getting off his first bullet. That time down at Eagle. Well, the uh, Sheriff kind of likes to build up a story. Oh, he swears it's the truth. Here's your gun, Mr. Ponsett. Thanks. Sure, sure. You was mighty quick in getting into Clay City. Uh, how'd you hear about it so fast? Hmm. How'd you hear about what? The holdup at the Fargo station last night. Ain't that why you come? No. No. I was headed past town. I turned off because Scar got that loose shoe. Well, now, ain't that a coincidence? Fellow holds up the Fargo office, kills one man, maybe two, gets away at $5,000, and 12 hours later, you ride into town. Well, they got any idea who did it? Nope, not a single solitary one, from what I hear. Like I say, the deputy agent was dead when they found him. Other fella, Fred Wilmer, a friend of his, got shot up pretty bad. Ain't done no talking yet. Doc says maybe he never will. Will Sheriff Schofield take out a posse? Nope, ain't nobody to go. Most of the men signed up for the Jefferson Roundup. Left town day before yesterday. Here the Jefferson Ranch paying good money this year. Yeah, yeah. You uh, seen the sheriff this morning? No, not lately. It might be over to his office. Uh, I think I'll walk down that way while you're fixing up Scar. Sure, sure, Mr. Ponsett. That's a darn good idea. Sheriff Schofield will be real glad to see you. A couple of doors this side of the sheriff's office, I saw the Wells Fargo sign nailed up next to a window. The place wasn't locked, so I went inside. One of the chairs was upset, and there were some damp stains on the floor. The cast iron safe against the wall was standing wide open, so I kicked it shut. Went out in the back stoop. There was some more blood on the steps, and then just red mud. Right at the edge, I saw the hoof prints. 
They trailed off along the side of the creek. Whoever made them headed west. The horse had been wearing one shoe different from the other three. A, a, a sharp rock must have cut into it sometime or another. Not enough to split it, you understand, just enough so that the print left a jagged line, like, so like fancy handwriting. Find something, Britt? Hmm? Oh, oh, hello, Sheriff. Oh, I was heading your way. Yeah, I just saw Heavy. He told me you was in town. Did you find something? I don't know. I don't know. You see these hoof prints? Yeah. Uh-huh. Don't mean nothing. The trail gives out a mile or so down the creek at the fork. Uh-huh. Has Clay City had any other trouble lately yet? No, not a bit. I guess any town's got to expect to hold up once in a while. Though. No, I heard it was a little more than that. Yeah, that's right. Fred Wilmer able to talk yet? Afraid not. Doc said he'd let me know first thing he'd come around. Took him out to his ranch. You have been out there to see him since last night? Wasn't no reason. Well, it might be a good idea to be there, you know, just in case. You thought maybe I ought to stick in town. Oh, I don't think anything more is going to happen here, Ed. I'll get Scar and I'll meet you out at Fred's place. Eh? I can handle this alone, Britt. Oh, sure, sure. I'll just often keep you company, Ed. I'll meet you there. <laughs> Tied him up around the side so he'd be in the shade. Thanks, Heavy. Uh, you. Did you find uh, Sheriff Schofield? I-, I told him you was in town. Yeah. You figure out anything? Uh, not so far. Oh, you will. Sheriff's a good man. Why, you and him together, you'll get whoever done it. No, well, maybe so. Maybe so. You're the only blacksmith around here, ain't you, Heavy? Only one for 40 miles. Uh-huh. You ever see a horse with a shoe that's got one jagged edge, left hind leg? A lot of shoes got jagged edges, Mr. Ponsett. Yeah, but I'll, I'll show you what I mean. I ain't much of an artist. Now, here, it it, uh, it kind of looks a little like this. Hmm. Seems to me I seen a shoe like that just the other day. Uh, oh, sure, I remember. Told him you ought to get a new one for it. Ben Schofield, that's who it was, just the other day. Ben? Yeah, the sheriff's kid. You know him, don't you, Mr. Ponsett? Oh, sure. Sure, I ain't seen Ben in a couple of years. Uh. Oh, you wouldn't recognize him if you did. He just sort of growed up overnight. Yeah. Yeah, I guess he has. We'll return for Act Two of The Six Shooter, starring Jimmy Stewart in just a moment. Today being Easter, it's interesting to note that of the many ancient observances of Easter, some customs have continued almost unchanged. One of these, of course, is the Easter egg, which symbolizes reviving life or the rebirth of mankind. Then there's the cross-marked bread, eaten by the Saxons in the Middle Ages to honor their goddess's spring, Aostra. From this came our hot cross buns of today. But history says that the custom of serving small loaves of bread with a mark of the cross as part of religious festivities dates back centuries ago when it was first practiced by the Egyptians. That's not so strange, though, when you realize leavened or raised bread, the forerunner of our present-day bread, was invented over 2,000 years ago by the Egyptians. Imagine of all the many, many different kinds of foods that have fed people down through the ages. Bread has been, and still is, our most important food. Here are the reasons. Bread more completely satisfies hunger and is a greater source of strength than any other known kind of food. Now, Act Two of The Six Shooter, starring Jimmy Stewart. Sheriff Schofield was sitting on Fred Wilmer's porch swing when I got there. Doc was inside with Fred, so I squatted down on the stoop and waited. About half an hour, the doc came out and told us we could go inside and see Fred. Fred? 
Fred was lying on a cot, breathing hard. And white cloth across his chest was stained pink. And his voice sounded like it was full of air. We was just sitting in the express office talking. Sam and me. Didn't hear the back door open. Must have left it unlocked. Turned around and there he was. Holding his gun on. <laughs> Did you get a look at him, Fred? Handkerchief over his face, Sheriff. I couldn't see nothing. Just the gun. He told Sam to open the safe. There wasn't nothing else he could do. Sure, sure. He took the money. Walked over to the door. Yeah. Looked at us for a minute. And then shot. He didn't have no reason. He hit Sam in the face and hit me in the chest. He didn't have no reason. <laughs> uh, take it easy, Fred. Take it easy now. <laughs> Just like he enjoyed shooting at us. That's how it was like he enjoyed it. Maybe he was scared. Oh, he wasn't scared, Sheriff. He didn't have no reason. Thought he killed us both. Then he started down the steps. I got my hand on the shotgun and let him have it. You hit him? I don't know. Maybe he gave a yell and rode off. Uh, what kind of a fellow was he? He was young, old? I couldn't see his face. Young fellow, I'd say, though. How young? Oh, 17, 18, full grown. Is he tall, short? Medium. About the size of your kid, Ed. <laughs> About that size. Got enough for you, Ed? Yeah, that's enough. You, you think you'll get him, Brad? Sure, Fred. Sure. Sure. Come on, Ed. Didn't have no reason to shoot, no reason to talk. Let's go, Ed. We're wasting our time, Brett. He's got a day's head start. He'd be 40 miles from here. Well, not if he's shot up. Now, you go on if you want to. Well, you're the sheriff. You've got to make the arrest. You ain't never been so particular before. Well, maybe not, but this time I'm particular. You coming? We don't even know where to start. Ah, I thought along the creek. That's as good a place as any other. It's a waste of time, Britt. Oh, we got time to waste. Come on, let's go. We picked up the trail along the creek headed west. It wasn't hard to fall on. Every once in a while, we'd see a few drops of blood spattered against the shrub brush. About ten minutes later, we came to a fork where Ed had said the trail gave out. Scar stuck his nose down into the water, and I looked around. The trail didn't give out. It turned south. I nodded in that direction. Ed didn't say a thing. Just followed. And about five o'clock, we stopped to eat. Ed built a fire, and I opened up a couple of cans of beans I had in my roll. Oh, you ain't hungry, Ed? It's early for supper. Yeah, yeah. Ed, I talked to Heavy before I went out to Fred's place. I asked him who had a horse that would leave a mark like the one we've been following. So? And he said Ben did. Your son, Ben. I thought you ought to know that. A lot of horseshoes leave the same kind of mark. Fred said it was a young fellow. It wasn't Ben. Where is he, Ed? Jefferson's Ranch, working on a roundup. He left Clay City the day before yesterday. Couldn't be Ben. There's a lot of wild youngsters in these parts, but Ben's a good boy. Couldn't be him. You sure? That mark don't mean nothing. Plenty of horseshoes leave the same kind of mark. You know that, Brick. You had enough to eat? Yeah. Come on, let's go. Not real bright, but enough so you can follow the trail. For about three miles, there wasn't no blood. He must have wrapped something around the wound. Wrapped it real tight. And then we found the bandage. A piece of shirt tail sopped through. For the next mile, I'd been bleeding a lot, worse than ever. And he was hit pretty bad. Looks like it. He couldn't have gone much further because that was... Oh, oh let's go. Head. Yeah. Hold on. 
Over there in the gully, that cabin. Yeah. Whose is it? Used to belong to Jake Levant. Died a couple of years ago. There ain't nobody living there now. There's somebody living there. What? Huh? Out and back. There's a pony. Better go ahead on foot. Red? Yeah? We're gonna take him alive, ain't we? If we can. We gotta take him alive, Britt. He's been. I don't know, Britt. Not for sure. It could be Ben. It could be. Where have you been the last couple of days? I don't know that neither. Had an argument with him two nights ago. He needed some money, but playing poker and lost a lot. Well, Five thousand's a lot. I wouldn't give him none. He got mad, said he'd get it, said he'd get it himself. And I hit him hard across the face. I hit him twice. He started to hit me back. Then he walked out of the house. I ain't seen him since. I wish he had hit me back. Now, we gotta get across that clearing, Ed. Over to that clump of trees. He may see us. Yeah, we'll have to take that chance. You ready? Yeah. trees for a couple of minutes. Okay. And then we'll rush him. Ain't gonna be easy to take him, Ed. Now that he's spotted us. You ain't gonna kill him, Brett. I ain't gonna let him kill me. It ain't his fault, Brett. It's mine. You know that ain't so. No, it's the truth. It's my fault. You didn't raise him to be a killer, Maybe Ed. I did, Brett. I was a sheriff, seeing that everybody kept close to the line, seeing that everybody lived honest, especially Ben. I broke him, Brett. Broke him like you break a wild horse or try to take all the fight out of him fast. You know what happens when you do that to a horse? He gets tame, but the fight still learns. Someday he turns wild again. I'll rush him alone, Ed. No. Stay here, Britt. Well, Sam Norton's dead. Maybe Fred Miller, too. Killing Ben won't bring him back. He's my son, Britt, my only son. You don't have no kids. You don't know. I'm sorry, Ed. No, we're going back to town. Not without him. We're going back... You can outdraw me, Brick, but I'll still have time to get a shot off. I'll try to get him alive, Ed. I'll try. No, don't turn your back on me, Brick. Don't be a fool. Don't make me do it, Brick. I wasn't being brave. I knew he wouldn't shoot. A man like Ed Schofield just don't change overnight. You can figure a man like Ed. That's what I thought, anyway. But I hadn't figured what would happen next. I haven't figured on him running out into the clearing, standing there in the moonlight, gray against the black sky. Ben! It's me, Ben, you dad! Can you hear me, Ben? Rick Ponson's coming after you. Throw out your gun, Ben! Rick Ponson's coming! Now listen to me, Ben! It's your dad! I saw him go down, real slow. Like his legs had buckled under him. I couldn't tell how bad he'd been hit. Rolled down a gully out, out of range, and I crawled forward. I pushed myself past a couple of rocks and head toward the back door. The kid was in the kitchen. I couldn't see him, but I could hear him moving around, going from window to window, looking out, waiting for me. I slid past another rock. I could run to the door or wait. The kid made up a mind for me. I slipped down fast, and the bullets nicked rocks. The kid had good hearing. He knew I was right there. Took out my gun and waited. I knew he'd get nervous first. Young fellas always do. I wasn't so young. I could wait. It was more than five minutes before the door started opening. His pony knew I was coming too. He started with a horse. I aimed at his leg. <laughs> For a second, he stopped moving and just hung in midair like a hawk. And he sprawled forward out of sight behind a log. I raised up a little and hunched myself along the side of the cabin. Everything was quiet now. Even his pony. The moon went behind the thick cloud and I came around the corner of the cabin. Suddenly, the moon came out again, just in time for me to see his 45. Just in time to see him coming up over the top of the log. 
His revolver slipped out of his fingers and I saw him trying to reach for it again. He couldn't make it. I stood up and walked over to the log. The kid was lying face down, gasping for breath, little short gasps. He pulled himself up to the flat of his hands and then he passed out. I turned him over with my foot and I looked at his face. He didn't hear me calling to him. He didn't know who I was. Ed. What? Ed, it ain't Ben. What? It ain't Ben, Ed. You, you sure, Britt? Yeah, yeah, this kid's got red hair. There ain't no reason to lie to me, Britt. I ain't shot up bad. I ain't lying. I ain't lying. I knew it wasn't Ben while I was going up after him. I knew it. Well, what are you talking about? Hey, just come to me. A man don't change overnight. Neither does a boy. If it ain't Ben, it... uh, Lots of tough kids in these parts. You said so yourself. Well, where do you suppose Ben is? Where you said. Jefferson's Ranch, working in the Roundup. They pay good. A uh, boy don't change overnight, Ed. Yeah. You able to ride back to town? Yeah, sure. I may have to take it a little slow. I'll get the kid. Britt. Yeah? You know something, Britt? I couldn't believe it was Ben neither. No, when he shot me. I just couldn't believe it. You know that, Britt? I know it, Ed. I know it. Jimmy, that's one of the most heartwarming at the same time suspenseful yarns we've heard in a long, long time. Thanks a lot. Well, Wendell, when it comes to that thanks department, let's just be mighty sure we include Parley Bear, Herb Bygron, Bert Holland, and Bill Conrad, who played the sheriff. Bye. Be sure to come back, Jimmy. In just a moment, ladies and gentlemen, we'll introduce Miss Diana Lynn, the star of next week's story on Hollywood Star Playhouse. Say, I wonder if your family weekends are anything like the ones at our house. You see, ours are very informal, and lots of times our meals are very irregular. I make a point of seeing that Mrs. Niles doesn't do a single extra bit of meal fixing she can help. So if you ever drop in on the Niles some weekend, you better bring along a husky appetite for sandwiches. We love them. Any kind. But a great favorite with the boys and myself is a, a ham egg burger. Ever tried one? Well, listen. They're so simple I make them myself. I take hamburger buns, slice them in half, and toast them. Then I spread two tablespoons of canned deviled ham, a scrambled egg, and a couple of tablespoons of grated American cheese on each bun. I toast them in the broiler with a low heat until the cheese begins to melt. Yes, that's a ham egg burger. Honestly, it's just about a meal in itself. Oh, maybe we top it off with a piece of cold apple pie right out of the refrigerator and a cup of coffee or two. That's all. So tonight, why don't you try a Nile special, a mouth-watering ham egg burger? Now, here is the star of next week's thrilling story on Hollywood Star Playhouse, Miss Diana Lynn. I guess we all dream about the perfect job we'll land someday. You know, good pay, easy hours, a perfect atmosphere to work in, an ideal boss. Well, I landed my dream job. Only it turned out to be not a dream, but a nightmare of terror. James Stewart can currently be seen in the Universal International Technicolor production, Bend of the River. 
Tonight's transcribed story was written for Mr. Stewart by Frank Burt. The entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. All characters and incidents were fictitious, and any similarity to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. This is Wendell Niles inviting you to be with us again next Sunday for the Bakers of America program, Hollywood Star Playhouse. Enjoy another half hour of fine entertainment brought to you direct from Hollywood by your baker. The baker in your bake shop, the baker who supplies your grocer, and the baker who calls at your door. All helping you serve better meals through bakery foods. Lipton Soup presents Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host at the squeaking door again. Just, um... Sliver in and let me dispel your weariness with a bit of weariness, hmm? <laughs> oh, no, 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 please. Don't sit in that chair. I'm uh, saving it for rigor mortis to set in. <laughs> oh, dear. I see this is going to be one of those nights when my favorite character gets killed. Yes, Mary, but don't scream blue murder because this is a corpse of a different color. <laughs> well, if it's going to be that kind of a story, I'd better tell folks about something cheerful first. Yes, I mean Lipton tea. Lipton's is such a friendly, welcome drink. And that's because of its brisk flavor. Now, that word brisk is important. It means that Lipton tea always tastes fresh and, and full-bodied, tangy and vigorous. It's never flat or wishy-washy. That's the reason why Lipton seems to make good food taste better and why Lipton tea is the perfect beverage to serve on your entertaining friends. So even if you're not a regular tea drinker, you should try Lipton's. That brisk flavor makes all the difference in the world. And now let's leave the world, uh, temporarily, of course. Tonight's story is called The Lonely Sleep. It's an original radio play by Christopher Mayo, who scribbled it during a nightmare. And our star is Carl Swenson, who plays the role of Archie Gold. Murder is a specter which nudges all of us, anywhere. Most of us will never murder, but can any of us say we never will? Certainly Archie Gold, 30-ish, bald and mild-mannered, never thought he would murder. Archie was the window display man for Greg's department store. At night, the store is a fantastic nightmare of eerie shadows, covered showcases, cavernous depths, and dank, stale odors, with only his own hollow footsteps for sound. Because windows are dressed at night. It's night now. And Archie's busy in his storeroom, crating his favorite mannequin for shipment to the mannequin factory. Being a lonely man, he talks to the mannequin. And being in love with Esther Newman of the store's accounting office, he naturally calls his favorite mannequin, Esther. You've been very mean to me, Esther. The last time I asked you to go out with me, you snickered at me. That's not nice. That's why I had to do this to you. Archie tucked Esther's smooth pink torso into a crate. There. Perfect fit, darling. Perfect. Then Archie wrapped Esther's slim legs and arms in excelsior, tucked them into another crate. So you wouldn't put your arms around me, darling. Well, you won't get another chance. Then Archie picked up Esther's pretty head and placed it on his workbench. Oh, Esther... I'm so lonely. Why don't people talk to me? Why can't I be popular? But what's wrong with me? Why don't you go out with me? What Archie never dreamed was that the real Esther Newman was at that moment slamming the last of her monthly report books closed, flicking off the light, 
and starting out of the finance office toward the rear door of the store. She stopped by Archie's half-open door when she hears his voice. But, uh, no, listen to me, Esther, darling. I am making enough money here to buy us a little place over in Jersey. See, all my life, I wanted to love someone like you. You're so beautiful. You will marry me, won't you, darling? Why, Archie, yeah. go! Uh, <laughs> Sitting there proposing to a dummy. And the dummy's name is Esther. What a coincidence. Uh, <laughs> Esther, you, uh, you worked late. I, I didn't know. Uh, no. I mean, yes, yes, I, I give the mannequins names. It's sort of a game. Yeah, a game. That, that's it. Well, they don't talk back, anyhow. <laughs> no, they don't talk back. But they're sort of kind. They smile at me. And, See, I'm, I'm lonely. Mm -hmm. I work all night. And Esther, will, will you go out with me Sunday night, mm -hmm. please? Just, just dinner and, and the movies. Are could... you kidding? Why don't you ask your dummy friend? Hey, say what a swell idea! She won't eat much. You can maybe get her into the movies for half price, and <laughs> when you kiss her good night, Archie, she won't slap your face. <laughs> Why are you looking at me that way? You shouldn't laugh. You, you're crazy. You're trying to scare me. <laughs> yes, that, that's it. No, you're not. You are crazy. Don't come near her. Archie! You shouldn't laugh. Archie, don't! <laughs> you shouldn't <laughs> laugh! <laughs> My turn to laugh. See? My... My turn. <laughs> you shouldn't laugh. People shouldn't laugh when you're lonely. You see, the specter of murder had nudged Archie, and he's obeyed. This was no mannequin at his feet. This was a woman, warm, beautiful, and dead. Then, being scared and lonelier than ever, Archie talked to his mannequins again. This time to Frank, painted and rouged and handsome in Greg's bargain 2950 tweed suit. You heard her laughing at me, Frank. I, I, I just couldn't stand her laughing at me again. You look at her, Frank. You'd think she was asleep. Her neck's broken. See, what am I gonna do with her? I, I, I gotta think. Gotta hide her. Gotta dress the front window, too. The window. Sale of cozy kitten mattresses starts tomorrow. It's a big sale. Sleep on a cozy kitten. I've got it, Frank. The window! I've put her in the window. On a cozy kitten mattress, and no real no. And then tomorrow night. I... So Archie used some pancake makeup, bringing life to Esther's sallowing cheeks and purple lips. He placed her dead weight on a hard truck. He rolled it at the lighted window. An hour later, Esther's corpse, covered with gleaming white sheets and sleazy satin quilts, smiled in peaceful bliss at the empty street. Archie found his work well done. Nothing more to do now. Just wait. I'll go home. And wait. That's a good window. You look very pretty in bed, Esther. I've been watching you, young fella. Yeah. Saw you do the whole thing. I... Matter, I scare you? <laughs> no, no, officer. I, I mean, I, I, I didn't know. Yeah, I've been in the doorway across the street watching you. A lot of work to making up one of them windows, ain't there? Yeah. You saw me do the whole window, you mean? Uh huh. Yeah. Oh. So I put the mattresses in, make the bed, put the signs in, and then fix the lights. Then you put the girl in the bed and fix her face up. Yeah, it's a nice job. Yeah. <laughs> Say. You look bad, son. Yeah. Anything wrong? You sick? Huh? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm just tired. All through for the night? Yeah, I'm all through. 
Uh, good night, officer. Good night, young fella, and don't worry about your girlfriend. I'll keep an eye on her every night. <laughs> So Archie went home, as you or I might have done. And because he'd been too busy setting his little post-mortem stage, the impact of his crime began to seep through only as he neared his rooming house. Maybe the girl in the doorway he passed started him thinking because she laughed. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> Just a girl and a date. But you can't blame Archie for hurrying. You would have thought it was Esther too. Archie hurried. He hurried to the rooming house. He raced up the steps. He had to get to his room, get in and close the door of the world. Close the door. That's it. I can't, can't laugh at me here. They won't find me here. This is my room. I... Uh, nerves. Stupid running like that. We got to act normal. Sure, just, just like nothing happened. I, I couldn't help it. She made me do it. No, forget about it. Why, Archie, I... go. No, <laughs> no, no, you, you can't laugh now. You're, you're... I'm dead, Archie. Yes, in a way. I'm in Greg's department store. I don't you? believe in ghosts. It's... It's just my mind, my... my imagination. That's right, Archie. You're too clever to believe in ghosts. I'm not a ghost, Archie. I'm in your mind. I'm part of you now. Part of you. Get out! Get out! I'll drive you out! Oh, no, Archie. You can't. Unless... Unless? Unless... Archie, unless you replace me with someone else. Yes. Yes. That might do it. Someone else. Another girl. See? That's how a murderer thinks. Oh, yes, yes. You do the same thing. Archie never thought he would murder now he's ready to do it again. Get rid of his conscience to get rid of a voice. And Archie lit a cigarette. He poured himself some milk. Ignoring the laughter in his brain as he pushed through again. <laughs> Look at your hands, Archie. Look at them. <laughs> oh, crooked and hard and clutchy. Oh. Like they were on my throat. No, shut up! Archie threw himself on the bed and jammed the pillow against his ears. And fell into a dream worse than reality. Uh, 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 hello? Huh? How'd you go? Huh? Uh, yeah, yeah, this is Archie Gold. Uh, this is Mr. Greg Archie. I know this is your time to sleep, but it's important that you get down here right away. Uh, is anything wrong, Mr. Greg? I can't tell you over the phone. Come down here. Goodbye. All right, Mr. Greg. After he'd shaved and dressed, Archie felt a little better. After all, if they'd discovered anything, Mr. Greg wouldn't have called. He'd have sent the police. The feeling of confidence stayed with him until he stood across the street from Greg's. He lost it then. It dropped with a sickening pain about his heart and a dry pinching about his lips. People were standing three deep in front of his window display, and he caught sight of a policeman's cap following Mr. Greg's bald head into the store. Well... Were you thinking of going window shopping tomorrow? Hmm? <laughs> Want to be popular? Have lots of people crowding about you on the uh, sidewalk side of a plate glass window. Want to be a mannequin? <laughs> Look up Archie Gold. He's the mannequin doer. <laughs> well, all I can say is I'm glad that murderer is about to be caught. Why, Mary, don't talk that way. 
It was really kind of Archie to put her on the mattress. She was so sleepy. In fact, she was dead to the world. <laughs> yes, the one to feel sorry for is Archie. Why, the poor fellow's shivering. Why don't you make him a cup of uh, Lipton tea? Hmm? <laughs> Lipton's is too good for him. And besides, he's probably too scared to taste the difference between Lipton's and ordinary teas. Yes, folks, Lipton tea is different. In the language of tea experts, Lipton's has a brisk flavor. And when they use that, use that word brisk, B-R-I-S-K, they mean that Lipton tea tastes tangy and spirited, really full-bodied. It's never flat or weak. So get acquainted with that brisk flavor. Or you just don't know how good tea can be till you know how good Lipton's is. Well, let's see how good Archie's alibi is. Remember Archie, the lonely little man who dresses Greg's department store windows at night? He just couldn't stand being spurned by Esther Newman any longer. She laughed at him when he asked for a date, and now... Esther is a lifeless mannequin advertising the restful qualities of cozy kitten mattresses in the window display. And Archie enters the store to see what's in store for him. Uh, uh Mr. Uh, Greg, I'm, uh... Archie Gold, come in, come in. Close the door. Sit down. My boy, you know Miss Newman and our bookkeeping department? Yes, sir. I knew her, but I'd, I'd, I'd like a chance. Now you're going to, to get a chance, my boy. Before leaving on a week's vacation, Miss Newman completed our annual report. Miss Newman is on vacation? Yes, yes, yes. Which isn't important. A report shows we sold 16 cozy kit mattresses in one year. Well, that's not many, is it, sir? It's terrible. We were stuck with 1,500 of them. Just a minute now. Jenkins. Jenkins. Yes, Mr. Gregg. How many mattresses have you sold now? 802, sir. You hear that, Gold? Yes, sir. 802 mattresses in a couple of hours. And your window display did that. My boy, you're a genius. Uh, Mr. Gregg, I... I've no, got no, 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 no. I know just what you're going to say. Any man who has the imagination to put a woman dummy asleep in a window. And such a dummy. So, so peaceful. How much we pay you, Archie? Thirty-six forty-seven a week, sir. Starting today, it's seventy-two ninety-four. And a private office, and you're the head window display manager of my three stores. Ha! Stunned you, huh? Everything I've always wanted. What's more, I've had pictures taken of that window with the crowds, and the paper promised to run it in tonight's edition. With your name. Good? Yes, sir. I, I want you to know, sir, I, I appreciate it. All oh, all that nonsense. Greg knows a bargain. Now go home to bed again, or I'll take tonight off. Oh, no, no, I, uh, I I have work to do. Ah, get more good ideas? Good, good. Uh, m Mr. Gregg. Yes, my boy. If, uh, if the mattresses are selling so well, we won't need the display. I, I can take it out tonight. Oh, nonsense, don't touch it. We'll run this sale for two weeks. I just ordered 1,500 more mattresses. <laughs> Success and popularity was sweet to Archie's taste. But Archie knew a corpse, no matter how beautiful, cannot survive the sun beating through glass for long. And Archie knew that. It was a wretched rainy night. Greg's department store had long since closed its doors. The night belonged again to Archie. Now he had a nasty job to do. He drew the curtains across the big window. In case the officer was watching again. Esther was just a mannequin now, a mannequin of flesh and bones, but a mannequin. And Archie spoke to his mannequin. You've had a hard day, Esther, darling, haven't you? Well, it's all over now. You never did anything for me alive. Dead, you brought me success. Now I've got to send you away. You're stiff and cold, Esther. And you can't laugh now, can you? Esther couldn't laugh. And Archie opened the crates which contained the mannequin he had originally planned to ship. With a few simple tools and lots of work, he made Esther, the real Esther, conform to his original shipment. A torso. A pair of heads. No. Who, who? Oh, that's, that's the alley door. Somebody's there. Cop, maybe. I've, I've got, got, got to act natural. After all, she's well hidden. Uh, Could I come in? 
Please, I'm so wet and tired. A girl. It's a girl. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, come in. Uh, get out of that rain. Thanks. Why, you poor kid, you're soaked. Come into the workshop. I've got a heater in there. Gosh, thanks. She was sent to me. Someone to take Esther's place. <laughs> Feel better now? Yeah, lots better. You're very kind. How did you happen to pick this store to knock at? Well, the alley seemed a good place to get out of the wind. It started to rain and I saw your light. Oh, I see. And you're broke. Yeah. The usual story. I came to town from Philly to get a job. The job was there, all right, but the boss wasn't on the level. Well, don't you have a home? A parent or a husband, I mean? Uh-uh. Oh, that's no. a shame. Um, look, uh, stay, stay right there now. I, I'll, I'll be right uh, back. You're, you're not uh, leaving me, are you? No, no. I'm going to get a blanket to, to put across your shoulders. I'll be right back. Of course he'd be right back. Wasn't this just what he needed? Another mannequin to satisfy Esther's voice? Made sense. The second time, it's easier. It always is. Don't move, May. Yeah. I'll put it across your shoulders. All right. You're a very lonely man, aren't you, Mr. Gold? Yeah. How do you know that? Because I like you. How does that prove I'm lonely? I like lonely people. Why? Because I'm terribly lonely myself. <laughs> I, I got some coffee in the thermos here. I'll, I'll get you some. I like it here. I like to look at the mannequins, especially that handsome one there. What do you call him? What do you mean, call him? Well, you must talk to them. I would. You're wonderful. You understand. Yeah, I, I do. I do talk to them. His name's Frank. Oh. Frank, meet me, May. This is Frank. Hello, Frank. I'm sleepy, Frank. Oh, May. Why did you come tonight? Why couldn't you come two nights ago? Uh, are you, you're sleepy? Mm-hmm. I'm warm and sleepy. Uh, look, I have three hours before my window has to be finished, and I have an errand that'll take me about an hour. You, you climb into the bed in the window and... and... <laughs> People will see me in the window. No, no, the, the curtains are drawn. I'll... I'll wake you when I get back. All right. Looks like the kind of bed I could sleep on forever. Forever. Doesn't always work out the way you plan it, see? Archie didn't want to murder Esther, but he did. Archie wants to murder May, but he'd rather not. Well, Archie drew the satin quilts over me. She smiled, closed her eyes with a murmured thanks, and was asleep. Archie knew now he loved her, that he must never listen to her speak again. While Archie carried the crates containing Esther's remains into the station wagon in the alley, a little man with a sad, droopy face and a derby hat argued with the night captain of the local police station. I tell you, I know what I'm talking about. I, I stopped at Greg's window four times today. I, I know a corpse when I see one. Well, I saw that window, too. That's a dummy in that bed. I know a dummy when I see one. Well, I don't doubt that, Captain. You've had more experience with dummies than I have, but I've had more experience with corpses than you have. That's, that's a dead girl in the bed. Now, what makes you so sure? I've been an undertaker for 40 years. My name is Huzak. My establishment is down the block from Greg's store on 10th Street. Uh, okay, we'll check. Uh, operator, get me Mr. Greg. Yeah, Greg's department store. Of course it is home. What else at this hour? Archie had a plan. Excitement gripped him. But that habit of years was strong, and he talked to Esther as he piled her... Three coffins into the station wagon in the alley. Don't you worry, Esther. In a half hour, you'll be at the bottom of the river. You shouldn't have laughed, Esther. 
Then I'll come back to me. Sure. Archie had a plan, all right. But it didn't include the little old undertaker who knew a corpse when he saw one, or an angry, sleepy Mr. Gregg, or a confused... We're right then coming to a stop in front of the store. This is an outrage, a preposterous, fantastic farce. Getting me down here in the middle of the night. Prove I have a corpse in my window. I know, Mr. Gregg. I feel silly about it myself, but Mr. Husak here seems so sure. The curtains are drawn in front of the window. We'll have to go inside. Oh, in a minute, you're all going to look very silly. There. Does that look like a corpse? No. You're right. It's not a corpse. It isn't a dummy either. She's alive. And breathing. There's something queer here. I'm going to look around outside. Archie! Archie, go! Archie! Archie! Archie didn't hear himself being paged. But at the entrance of the alley, he saw the police car in front and he heard the police captain shouting from the sidewalk. That was when Archie decided it was better to be lonely. The lonely are the better. They found out. That's the police. They said they found out. Hey, hey, you! Ah! Right now. Got to. They won't catch me. They won't. Got the lights, Fred. I gotta go through. Faster. Faster! Why can't it go faster? The truck! Turn right! Turn! Uh, no one ever heard Archie's last words. They bubbled through his torn throat as he lay in a glass-smashed window through which he'd crashed. No one. I'm... I'm... so lonely... May so lonely. Well, Greg, here's your Archie Gold. Bet those crates will be interesting. Oh, awful. Awful. Yeah, quite a mess. No one was cruel enough to point out a gruesome bit of grisly humor. The lonely little man who'd spent so much time in display windows had created his final masterpiece. Archie had decorated his last window in Husack's funeral parlor. The lesson we learned from tonight's story is that murder doesn't pay. It's a losing business. Murderers are always in the uh, red. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's strenuous work, too. You, you're bound to find yourself a little stiff. <laughs> Mr. Host, I did not like that story. Well, neither did I, Mary. Imagine the cozy kitten mattress company pulling a smart advertising stunt like that on Lipton's time and for free. <laughs> now, that's not what I mean at all. And if you're worried about Lipton's, let me assure you that Lipton's is the largest selling brand of tea in the whole world. That's the kind of popularity that really counts. And folks, if you'll just once try Lipton tea, I think you'll be convinced too. Well, I have to run along now, folks. Got some shopping to do in Greg's department store. What? Oh, I know it's late, but um, you see, Archie and I shop at night to uh, avoid the shrouds, you know. <laughs> by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is Puzzle for Wantons by Patrick Quentin. Oh, and here's a special announcement. Next week's Inner Sanctum story, directed by Hyman Brown and brought to you by Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup. Next week's story is about a man whose dreams always come true. All he has to do is to dream that somebody's being murdered and... <laughs> <laughs> Enough to keep you awake, isn't it? <laughs> oh, until we meet again next Tuesday, you, uh, you dream of me and I'll dream of you. <laughs> now it's time to close the squeaking door, so... Good night. Pleasant dreams. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh! 
folks, here's a grand way to begin a meal. Serve Lipton's noodle soup. Lipton's takes no time to prepare, and yet it has a real fresh cooked chickeny flavor. Yes, it tastes just like the chicken noodle soup you'd make right in your own kitchen. And Lipton's is economical, too. It costs less and makes lots more than canned soups. So, folks, don't forget to serve Lipton's noodle soup. And don't forget to tune in next Tuesday night for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. My name's Jeff Regan. I get ten a day in expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Lyon. Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. With Jack Webb as Jeff Regan investigator, stand by for hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of The House by the Sea. This is the way it started. I walked in the office about 11 o'clock that morning. It was a nice warm day and I didn't have much on my mind. That's the trouble with nice days. You take a couple of easy breaths, open somebody's door, and it's just like peeling a wrapper off an atomic bomb. The lion was in his den, sitting behind his desk. You couldn't tell where he left off and the desk began. He was talking to a girl with a flock of black hair. She was the kind you see driving a Cadillac convertible down Sunset Boulevard on a hot Sunday afternoon. No wonder the lion's cigar was out. It was wet on both ends. Well, well, come in, Regan, come in. I was just about to call you, but now that you're here, it makes things simpler. Miss Carmen, this is Mr. Regan. How do you do, Mr. Regan? Mr. Lyon tells me you're just the man I want. You said the same thing to a mortician last week. He is the man I want, Mr. Lyon. Well, well, that's fine, Miss Carbon. I knew you'd be pleased. I'm very proud of Jeffrey. As long as I'm in the cast, how about a look at the script, huh? Miss Carmen is associated with the famous psychic consultant, Prince Cairo. I help the prince look into people's minds. Well, that ought to be real fun if all your customers are under six. <laughs> you don't believe in thought transference, Mr. Reed. Do you? I said I help the prince. <clears throat> Prince Carew sent Miss Carmen to retain an operator, Jeffrey. It's a very delicate matter, and I'm placing the entire case in your hands. Why didn't he come himself? Do you disapprove of me? I just want to know what's what. Prince Carew never appears in public. He prefers to spend his time in meditation and thought. Yeah. I handle all of his outside contacts. So, Jeffrey, you just drive on out to Prince Carew's home in Ocean Town with Miss Carmen and speak to the prince. What kind of a retainer did he send? Uh, How much did you get? Now, see here, Regan, we don't discuss finances in front of clients. Oh, stop it, will you? This is another blind spot. You don't know what it's all about. All you know is she waltzed in here with a check, and you'd sell your grandmother to a glue factory for two bucks. How do I know I won't wind up being a patsy again? Is there any way I can reassure you? Buy me a battleship. Jeffrey, have I ever involved you in anything that I wouldn't undertake myself? Have I ever knowingly imperiled your life? Yeah. Jeffrey. Come on, lady. What's it all about? You work for the guy. Well, I really don't know. He was excited this morning, called me in, gave me this address, and told me to make arrangements. He must have told you something. He never tells me anything. As you say, I... I just work for him. Well? All right, I'm hired. Good, good. Now call me, Jeffrey. Call me if you run into any trouble. Well, I asked her how about lunch... She said no. I asked her about dinner. She said something that meant no, so I gave up. You know, it's like that sometimes. The flag's up, the meter's ticking, and you're not getting anywhere. But from a couple of things she told me, I got the idea she was doing more than just helping the prince read minds. Well, his place turned out to be a good hour from downtown Los Angeles, up 101. It was a couple of stories of glass and concrete leaning out over the ocean. It was high and dry and quiet up there. And you got a feeling you should be hearing things and feeling things when you looked down and saw that water banging around the bottom of the cliff. 
She unlocked the door, and a guy in a white turban and some pants that looked like oversized diapers and a pair of tennis shoes were standing there. He had a big curved knife hanging around his waist, and he put his hand on it when he saw me. Right this way, Mr. Baker. Who's he, the butcher? Oh, that's Kelly. He works for the prince. Manservant. He's from India. Yeah, I'll bet the Indians are glad to get rid of him. <laughs> Kelly's harmless, tongueless, and he doesn't hear. I like you, Mr. Baker. Come in, come in. Ah, uh, Velma, my dear. You'll return with spoils. Welcome, sir. Welcome. Mr. Regan, this is Prince Keru. Regan? Ah, uh, the lion's eye. I've heard of you, Mr. Regan. I'm honored. Sit down. That'll be all, Velma. Charming girl. She handled all your outside contacts? Most efficiently. Except, of course, for matters that I must handle personally. What kind of matters? I'm in trouble, Mr. Regan, and I beg your assistance. Well, it's all paid for. Correct. But there's a personal bonus in this for you. Why? Because, sir, I want you to save my life. You look healthy to me. I am healthy, let me assure you. But my life has been threatened. Well, that'd come under police business, wouldn't it? Normally. Uh, didn't Miss Carmen explain that this was a delicate matter? Yeah, she did. Why didn't she call the police? <laughs> I'm hardly in a position to ask the police for assistance, Mr. Regan. It is a delicate matter. Outside, it says you're a mind reader, all right? What am I thinking now? That I'm a charlatan, a faker, and that I'm trying to hide something from him. That gets you the cigar. <laughs> it's been a very lucrative arrangement for the most part and very satisfactory. Except, of course, for the annoyance of having my life threatened. Who's the guy? It would be of no consequence if it were a man. It's a lady, Mr. Regan. A very beautiful and lovely creature. And she'd like nothing better than to see my carcass go out with the tide. Why does she want to kill you? A matter of confidence. Uh, suffice it to say that she is thoroughly capable of doing just that. How do you know? One, she is erratic, ill-tempered, ruthless. Two, she called me this morning and told me what she intended to do. Is she giving you a chance to reach for your gun? To reach for you, Mr. Egan. What do you want me to do? I feel the entire matter could be settled amicably if you were to call on her. Inform her that you are my personal bodyguard and that you are here to protect my life. You think she'd go for that? I'm positive. How long you been blackmailing her? What? Well, your racket might last six months or a year, but not long enough to pay for a place like this. The answer's blackmailing it. Okay, okay, okay. I should have told you. How do you do it? I can slip him into a trance. They spell a family secret or two. I push a buck that way. That's nice. If you want the mines red, I read them. 25 bucks a parade. And shake down. The guy's got to eat. You put the squeeze on her. She's an actress. She was in on a deal at the studios. She wouldn't shake? At first, I just told her I had to have a larger fee. Then they come out with it. Cold turkey. Well, she said she'd blow your head off. Yeah, she's the kind. I went wrong on this one. I'm in a spot. Who is she? Grace Nichols, movie actress. Ever heard of her? Redhead. Makes you want to go home and kick your wife downstairs if you got one. That good? Better. But she means this business about pumping me. And I won't look good dead. All right, where she live? Over in the Palisades. Here's her address. Uh, you going over there now? Yeah. Be careful. She isn't gunning for me. That isn't what I mean. There's a skinny boy there. He's nasty. No callers. Name of Tim Rogers. I'll remember that. I hope you can talk her out of it. I've been sweating. I don't want to shake her down. I just want to get a little sleep at night. I left him sitting there, scratching his bald head under his turban. He looked about as happy as a guy who just ate a Vaseline sandwich. Well... Grace's place was too big for a marble game and too small for football. I think I remember reading something about how she got it from her third husband. There was a big wire fence all around it and a sign every 15 or 20 feet telling you not to trespass. So I parked my car outside the driveway and walked up to the front door. The guy in a chauffeur's uniform was standing there. He looked like a razor blade with arms. He gave me the fish eye and blew smoke in my face and kind of nudged me with his shoulder. Move on, Pilgrim. No handouts here. I came to see Grace Nichols. Yeah. I got business with her. Yeah. So tell her I'm here. Blow. You always like this, or did you miss lunch today? I don't know who you are, Pilgrim, but I don't like you. Beat it. I know you. There's something about a guy in a lineup. Yeah? He memorizes real easy. Copper. Investigator. Private or city, I don't care. You all smell the same. 
This isn't hunting season. You always carry a 38. Does it show? Maybe you got a broken rib. A real funny guy. I met all kinds of funny guys. Drift. I said I wanted to see her. And I said she wasn't in. All right, I'll tell you once more. I got business with her. So do a couple of hundred other guys. Watchdog? Now you're getting smart. You aren't. What kind of a crack is that? I want to see her, I'm going to see her. A trick I learned a long time ago. Shoot a guy in the knee and he'll never walk straight again. You ever done it? Oh, yeah. That's how I learned. <coughs> That's what I learned, baby. Well, I might have to get a new chauffeur. You looking for a job? I already got one, lady. Timmy's going to be awfully upset when he finds out what happened to him. When someone works for me, they have to be perfect. Want his job? They wouldn't let me in. I'll let you in. You, uh, do that kind of thing often? When I have to. I suppose you have a name. It's Regan. I'm a private investigator. All right, Mr. Regan, you've ruined a perfectly good chauffeur and bodyguard, and you're in my house. What have we got to talk about? A guy named Cairo. The prince? Must we talk about him? He thinks you're dangerous stuff. So do a lot of people. Tell me, Mr. Regan, what do you think? About what? Me. Right now, or when I'm a couple of feet away? Right now. Look, remember, I just got here. I know. He must have a first name. What is it? Jeff. Oh, Jeff will get along. He's in the card. Pretty fast deal. I like it this way. Fast. Might be a bum deck. Never mind. Deal. That's the bell. How much time between rounds? Well, you know me better. Hello? Yes? Yes, right here. You know a man named Lion, Jeff? Uh-huh. He seems to be roaring. Give it to me. Yeah. Regan, is that you? Well, now, how do you figure it? Now, don't be smart. Who's the name who answered the phone? Our client's friend. Sounds like she's a friend of yours now, or maybe you have been doing some road work. Did you have something to say, or is this the day you turn scoutmaster? I'm busy. Well, you can stop being busy, lover. It's all off. Don't tell me you're passing up a fee. I'm passing up nothing. Prince Carroll called me ten minutes ago and told me to forget the whole thing, and that's what I'm telling you. How'd you know I was here? The prince told me, so it's all over. Finished. Forget it. I've already started something. I don't care what you started. I just remember. You finish it on your own time and expense sheet. Hmm. You look worried, Jeff. Anything I can do? I'm called off. You mean you're out of a job? I got one. Remember, you put my bodyguard out of commission. You owe me something. Well, Tim, boy, he'll come around. I don't want Tim anymore. I want you. Mm. <laughs> I'll get you a drink. We can talk about it. Caro told me that Tim was a pretty good boy. You can fill his shoes. Come here and get your drink. Oh, tell me about 9 o'clock tonight. we get dark. Got a new dress. I think you'll like it. I probably would. The place above Malibu, we could have dinner and listen to some music. I want to be with you, Jeff. That deal's fast again. I don't care. I don't care. I just decided something, Jeff. I'm gonna like being with you. I'm gonna like it a lot. <laughs> Well, she didn't want me to go, but I was thinking about the prince and the way everything looked. I told her I'd see her that night. I was just climbing into my car when Tim Rogers, her ex-number one boy, stepped out from the gate. I waited for him to walk over. You're pretty good with your women, Regan. You look lonely, Timmy. Somebody stole your popsicle? Bum what? joke, Regan. I've been waiting to talk to you. You were so quiet in the house, I didn't want to make any noise. Any better here? You came out champ this afternoon. But you won't even make the prelims next time. You got something to say? Stay away from her. You're shaking. You need a drink. Stay away from her, Regan. I've been with her too long. Known her too long to take the bounce from a two-bit gum heel. Mm. Goodbye. I'm not finished yet. That's your version. Now get your foot off that running board, punk, or I'll take it with me. I left him standing in the middle of the driveway. If I'd have waited another minute, he'd have been crying. I stopped off and had some barbecued ribs at a drive-in out on Sunset. It was just getting dark when I got to my place. I had company. It was Velma Carmen, Prince Cairo's right-hand man. She was sitting on the edge of my sofa. Her back was as stiff as a filing cabinet, and there was a little ring of white around her lip. She looked like she'd just been measured for a coffin. 
There was a 25 automatic sitting in her lap. I've been waiting for you, Mr. Reed. I asked the janitor to let me in. Yeah? He was very nice about it. I told him I was associated with one of your clients. Yes, I told him I was associated with one of your clients. Did you know that Prince Carol was my husband? Since when? Oh, a long time now, a long time. Not many people know that. Is that what you came here to tell me? No. I... I came to tell you that you don't have to worry anymore. That none of us have to worry anymore. You mean you're calling me off the case? That's it. That's exactly it. I'm calling you off the case. Yeah. Well, I've already been called off. My office phoned me when I was over at her house. Where's Nichols? Yeah. Then it was about her? Yeah. <laughs> well, then, we don't have to worry anymore, do we? No. She's very pretty, isn't she? I've seen her many times. I think she's quite pretty. I, I could hardly blame the prince. I could hardly blame him at all. What are you getting at? I was told the others were pretty, too. Where'd you get that gun? This? I bought it for $30. Let me see it, huh? Oh, yes. I brought it here so I could show it to you. I, 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 I paid $30 for it. I paid $30. I'd imagine the air would be cleaner in there, don't you? What are you talking about? I mean, it's really very humane, they tell me. It's just like sitting down and never waking up. I've read all about it. You just walk in and sit down, and if you don't try to hold your breath, you... you go to sleep, don't you? You've met murderers before, Mr. Regan. Do I make a good murderer? Do I make a good murderer? Stop it. Stop it, will you? You trying to tell me you killed him? Oh, Mr. Regan, that's why I came here. I shot him. I walked up behind him, and I put the gun close to his back and pulled the trigger. They don't make such a great deal of noise, do they? I left him sitting there in his house by the sea, and he looked very much alive. Only, only he's not alive at all. Now what is to me? Now what is to me? Do I make a good murderer? Do I make a good <laughs> We're listening to the story of the House by the Sea, tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator. They're still available for qualified nurses. Yes, the Army Nurse Corps Reserve still has commissions available. If you are a graduate registered nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, you may be eligible for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps section of the regular officer's reserve. To find out if you do qualify for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps Reserve, apply to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. And now, back to the story of the House by the Sea and Jeff Regan, investigator. Well, after she got through, she settled down to a slow, even kind of a giggle that started somewhere around her shoelaces and didn't get past her knees. It was one of those things that gives you a feeling like somebody's standing in back of you with a red-hot iron ready to press your pants before you get them off. But she wasn't going to do any more talking, so I went downstairs and brought back a doctor friend of mine named Sammy Wing. He brought his little black bag with him and gave her a shot or something. She wilted like last night's orchid and went to sleep on my couch. Sammy began talking. Some playmate. Wish I'd have been here for the party. I had four appendectomies and one broken leg today. Said so they're alive. Well, how is she? You know her better than me. No, is she going to be all right? But she'll wake up in five or six hours and I want some water. And then what? She might ask you what happened or it might start all over again, whatever it was. By the way, what was it? Well, I found her here when I got home. I should find something like this. She said she killed an ex-client of mine. Oh, maybe I'm lucky at that. What does all the past tense mean? I was called off the case. Oh, nice. It's all clean. No clients to protect. Is there a court someplace? I don't know, Sammy. Call the police. they find out. And then you and me can go out and get a drink. She said she used this gun. Smell it, Sammy. It hasn't been fired. Safety catch is still on. She's pretty and she's nice. And I'll bet she looks like a million bucks in a bathing suit. But if I'd have met her within the last three hours, I'd have run for help. Call the police. Is that professional? This is acute hysteria. The kind that pops off guns and pops off people and does a lot of things they can't remember later on. 
Call the police. What about the gun? Call that gun. Call the coroner while you're at it. Tell him to go out there with some DOA forms. He'll use them. Or you stay here with it like it back? Corpse hunt? Just an idea. Hitler had an idea. The odds were against him. You got about as much chance as a three-legged horse in the Kentucky Derby. She's bit somebody and she's told you about it. I want to make sure. What do they do when a private eye walks in and messes up a nice clean murder? Sammy, will you stay? Had any bourbon around here? Yeah. Okay, take your time. Maybe both of us will get our pictures in the paper. I left him with a kind of a soft smile on his face like he had some inside information on Tuesday's winner at Del Mar. Well, it was 9.30 by the time I got there, and it was dark enough to give a ghost a creep. It was different, too. Maybe it was the fog. I used that ring of keys I'd taken from her purse. It smelled dry and funny inside, and it was real quiet, like somebody was waiting for the world to fall apart. I clicked on my flashlight, and I walked down the long hall to his office. He was there, just like she said. There were three holes in the front of his shirt, but it wasn't the laundry's fault. I spotted the 38 on the floor by his hand. I broke it, and three cartridges came out was the right gun for the job. It was pretty messed up. While I was standing there trying to figure Velma Carmen's story, the light came on. A fat man wearing a sheriff's star was standing by the switch. There was a taller man in a brown overcoat next to him. They both looked like they'd just finished dinner. Scavenge your hut, son. You don't talk, Charlie. Ain't much for him to say, is that, Cap? Guess not. Well, son... Well, it looks like you're going to be calling me names. What do you like best? Killer, murderer, or slayer? The papers use slayer a lot. I don't like any of them. Kind of breezy for a hot boy, ain't you? Mind giving me a name? It's Regan. I'm a private detective. It's Regan. He's a private detective, Cap. Yeah. Got a card or something with you, son? Yeah. Yeah, he's right. But international. Lion still there? Yeah. Who's that? An old bum I used to know. Regan, why do you go around killing people? The lion will be mad. Look, this is a fix. Now, why do you want to say a thing like that? Somebody tip you? Phone call a little while ago. Huh? Funny kind of a voice, a whisper. Said we'd find a stiff up here, but didn't say we'd find you. You're extra. Look, I just came here to see what it was all about. Same thing we did. Only we come up with a suspect and a corpse. No cop could ask for anything better. Charlie, better call a coroner. Ocean Town, just a small place, Regan. Only me and Charlie around. We borrow from the county when we get something like this. I can find you a real answer in an hour. You let me and Charlie worry about that. You look good enough for the time being. All right, son. Let's go. I had as much chance as an elephant in the tea room, and if those two locked me up and booked me... So I leaned back into his gun and spun around and knocked his wrist down. He pulled the trigger, and by that time I flicked the light switch and was out the door. I didn't run for my car. I cut across the driveway and doubled back up the hill. I could hear him yelling and shooting out in the dark. I hailed a cab about five blocks away, and he took me to the place above Malibu. I found her in a booth with a piano player. She was wearing one of those black strapless things, and it was worrying a couple of ball-headed guys sitting at the bar. You're late, Jeff. We said nine o'clock. I had three drinks all alone. You want me to get mad or are you going to catch up? How long you been here? You sound like you're out of the mood. I thought we were going to look at the stars together. How long you been here? It's nine o'clock. What's the matter? I've been working tonight. Well, it's after hours now. Tell me how you like my new dress. It's the right color with the wrong cut for a funeral. I haven't read the obituaries today. It'll be in tomorrow's paper, only it'll make the front page. Have a drink. Let's wait for tomorrow. Your friend was killed tonight. What friend? Kru. He was no friend of mine. I told you that. So did he. Car smash up, or did he fall off his house? Thirty-eight. We didn't talk about him this afternoon. Let's not start now. Look, two cops in Ocean Town are kind of crowding me. They think I'm going to take a good picture. Is that why you're late? It's a murder rap, lady. We should have had dinner together. They'll be knocking down your door in the morning. Why, darling? Because you threatened to kill him because he hired me to call you off. Oh, wait a moment, Jeff. You've been having fun up there now. Who told you that? What did you think he sent me over today to sell magazines? I never found out you were called off. Suppose he hired you to scare me. Jeff, we're old friends now. I can tell you a family secret. I know about him blackmailing you. And that puts you ahead of me for the cops. Did you do it? I don't know. Did you? What he told you don't sound right. What does sound right? 
I went to him one day and put him in a trance, only I used scotch. Found out what he was doing and how I was doing it, so I turned the tables. It was good, clean fun, but expensive for him. You been draining him? I thought that's why you came today. That's why I had Timmy around. Well, some of this is beginning to make change. If he was your meal ticket, then you got an alibi. I don't feel like stars anymore, Jeff. Let's go over to my place and talk. On the way over, she didn't have much to say, and I couldn't think of anything. I was all too mixed up. If she'd really been shaking him down, then she figured out. And the girl back in my apartment figured in. Only she had the wrong gun. And then there was a little business that I'd have to explain with the Ocean Town cops. Well, when we turned in the driveway, I stopped figuring. Kim Rogers, the man with the guns, was there standing on the porch. Oh, gorgeous. I've been waiting to see you. You're home late. I thought I fired you. Still tramping with this tramp, huh? I thought you'd be sick of him by now. For once, I'm glad to see you, Tim boy. That sounds cozy, but I don't want to see you. I know where your 38 is. You're wrong. It's her 38. And it's got her prints on it. Jeff, he's making it look bad for me. Ask me. Ask him what he's doing here, will you? Just in for a showdown, Angel. You're tagged for his murder. They'll want you. I fixed it good. I can fix it so you can get away. How? A friend of mine shoving off at Pedro. Four o'clock. Go all over the world. Jeff, if all of this is straight, I'm in a spot. Relax. This guy never did anything right. Tell me how I'm wrong. All right, that tip of the Ocean Town cops was wrong. Trying to pile up a scare on me was wrong. Killing Cairo was wrong. And this clinches it. Yeah? Well, that's where you're twisted, Pilgrim. I got a warrant out for you right now. Plugging a murder suspect is something they'll thank me for. You said her prints were on that gun. They'll find that out in the morning. And how was I to know? Just happened to hear on the radio they were looking for you tonight. I see you, I plug you. Everybody will be sorry, but it'll be manslaughter and suspended. I worked it once in Toledo. What do you say? Do I plug him and meet you somewhere in two weeks? Let me have a smoke. Let me think it over. Sure. Sure, go ahead. Angel. Well, the gun's empty now. I carried this for three years. I never used it. He deserved to die, didn't he? Didn't he, Regan, didn't he? I don't know, lady. You knew him better. unwound like red thread in the Levi factory. Grace Nichols had been putting the shake on the prints. He got tired of it and called me in and told me his phony story so he'd have a good self-defense angle when he finally got around to shooting her some afternoon. He had Tim planted there to keep me from really seeing her. Oh, it was a nice idea, only I bounced Tim and got inside. And then Tim made a phone call and the lion jerked me before I had a chance to compare notes with her. I guess Tim went kind of crazy, seeing how well we got along together, and he figured Grace would do anything if she was wanted for murder. So, he killed the prince and made her the patsy with those fingerprints. She'd handled the gun before, see. But then I had my caller, Velma Carmen, the prince's wife. She went kind of crazy, too, when she walked in and found him dead. It took three doctors a couple of weeks to tell her what really happened. When I told it all to the lion, he was mad at first, but then he saw Grace Nichols' picture in the paper. He asked just one question. What was I doing at Grace's place all afternoon? I didn't even bother to answer. with Wilms Herbert as Anthony J. Lyon. It's CBS same time next week for hard-boiled action and mystery with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Written by E. Jack Newman, produced by Sterling Tracy. The role of Grace Nichols was played by Betty Lou Gerson, David Ellis was Tim Rogers, Lorene Tuttle was Velma Carmen, and Marvin Miller was Prince Carew. 29,000 nurses are needed to join the new Army Nurse Corps Officers Reserve. 4,000 of them, if they wish, may choose active duty. All nurses who receive reserve commissions will benefit from the opportunity for specialized training offered to them by the Army. The educational opportunities offered the nurse by the Army Medical Department will be of great advantage to her in her work. Don't wait. If you're a registered graduate nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, drop a card now for complete information to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. <laughs>
Original music for this program is by Dick Aron. Jeff Regan, investigator, is heard every Saturday at 9.30 over CBS. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, the Mole Mystery Theater. Presented by M-O-L-L-E. Mole, the heavier brushless shaving cream for heavy beards. Good evening. This is Jeffrey Barnes welcoming you to the program that presents the best in detective and mystery fiction. Tonight we have selected for you a masterful story of suspense entitled Red Wine. In Red Wine, we have an unusual thing. It's a mystery story that stood a good chance of being completely lost to mystery fans. It was published more than 15 years ago and to the best of my knowledge has never been republished in any mystery anthology. And so it is with great pleasure that we now present... L.G. Blockman's Red Wine. It's an extraordinary story, and one that certainly does not deserve to be forgotten. Before you begin your story, Mr. Barnes, here's something it will pay the men in our audience not to forget. If you have wiry, hard-to-cut whiskers or a tender skin, and you dread the agony of that morning shave, then shave with Mole, the heavier brushless shaving cream. Yes, sir, man, it's smooth. So smooth. It's slick. So slick. It's a smooth, smooth, slick, slick shave you get with M-O-L-L-E. Mole, the heavier brushless cream for tender skins. That's right. Mole is a heavier cream. The kind of cream you need if you have a wiry, hard-to-cut beard or a tender skin. Because Mole is heavier, it softens your whiskers, holds them up straighter, and makes them easy to cut. So you shave faster, closer, easier, and you shave painlessly with Mole, the heavier brushless cream for tender skins. Mole. And now here is Jeffrey Barnes with tonight's Mole mystery, Red Wine. This happened at Bohar Plantation, down in the valley of the Amazon. And the men who grow rubber in the jungle will vouch for the story, and they tell it nights in the bars of Maracas. And they say that it had to do with three who were hunted, and the fourth, the hunter. Four in all, they say, and the bitter ending in a bottle of red wine. The four sit at the table, no sound as the dealer flicks the cards. The lamp shines wearily on the set faces. The dealer's eyes move slowly, watching each man. Joe Best, hard, heavy-lipped, sensual. I open for two bucks. Dick Hallop, easy, full-muscled, sometimes smiling. I'll bump that three. William Carr, quiet, quick, handy with a knife. All right, along. The dealer's eyes move slowly, watching each man. Inside the stifling room, the never-ceasing smell of coagulating rubber from the mill, of the dull, wet heat of the jungle. Cards, gentlemen? The dealer spoke. Boyd Trasker, the dealer. I'll take two. Joe Best takes two cards. And now the fifth man in the room, Don Hernando Valca, gets up from his chair in the far corner and comes close to the table. Uh, is permitted to watch, senors? Uh, mm, thank you. Cards, Halep? Three cards. Car? One card. Dealer stands pat. Well, best, you open. Opener checks the bet. Halep? Check. Car? Check. I'll bet 50 bucks. I don't know all I can stand in this cat and mouse stuff. What do you mean? I Trask- mean, Trasker, you're an out-and-out phony. 
You're not watching the game at all. You're watching us. You heard what I said, Trasker. I heard you best. What are you here for, Trasker? Yeah, Trasker, you said you were a stockholder in Boha Rubber. Boha's privately owned. There are no stockholders. Somebody was snooping around my bunk this morning. What are you here for, Trasker? Somebody went through my footlocker two days ago. I'm warning you, Trasker. You better go back where you came from. We don't like you. Ah, oh, gentlemen, gentlemen. We don't like you either, Vacker. Easy, Helen. Easy for what, a native fly cop? So he's Don Hernando Vacker. So he's police chief of Maracas. So what? So we're American citizens, all three of us. What are you here for, Trasker? Maybe we can help you find what you're looking for, Trasker. Maybe you can, Carr. I'm looking for a murderer named Jerome Steak. Jerome Steak. So? Yeah. Jerome Steak wanted in San Francisco for the murder of his wife, known to have escaped to Brazil. Brazil's a big place, Trasker. Also known to have paddled down the Amazon Valley to Bohar Rubber Plantation. Appearance, of course, will be altered. Dark hair, probably bleached blonde. Now, I'm blonde, Trasker. See, si, all three of you are. That is what I told the Senor Trasker when he first came to my office in Maracas. I said, all three men are blonde, Senor. I said, go on, three... Trasker. Jerome Steak is an American. Quite cultured, very well read, connoisseur of wine. Fond of horse racing, women, good clothes. Also a heavy gambler. So that's why you arranged this poker game, to see how we bet. Jerome Steak is also very clever. He's a good actor. He's capable of concealing his breeding, of passing himself off as a ship's engineer, say, or a stevedore. Field hand. Or... I'm a ship's engineer. You want to see my papers? I don't want anything, Halop, except... Except what? Except... To admit, I've made a mistake. Okay. Yeah, that's better. Don Hernando, I apologize. I should have listened to you. I told you it was a wild goose chase. I had to see for myself. Well, have you? Yes, it's quite obvious that none of you is Jerome Steak. So when the launch comes up the river again, I'll take it and return to the United States. The launch won't be here for a week. That's unfortunate, Best. You'll have to put up with me until then. A week is a long time, Trasker. Four guys could get on each other's nerves in a week. We'll have to take a chance on that car. My nerves are pretty good. <laughs> yes, this Joe Best trunk, all right? Must be something here. But for the love... Oh, Don Hernando, I... Didn't hear you, right? Your nerves, Senor Trasca. Don't be foolish. I would not blame you, my friend. Coming here to the bunkhouse and snooping. This is an unwise thing you do. If that Joe Best saw you going through his trunk. Senor Trasca, please, come away from here. I have heard the men talk. I am responsible for your safety. You're a good guy, Hernando. Relax. Please, I have heard the talk. These are dangerous men. You know what I'm going to do when I get home, Hernando? I'm going to make you an honorary member of the San Francisco police. Ah. Don Hernando Vaca. San Francisco police. <laughs> that is nice. An honorary member for helping us catch Jerome Steak. Steak, Santa Maria. Why you keep mentioning this name? You already said you have made a mistake. That you do not believe any of these men could I be... said that for a reason, Hernando. One of them is Steak. Come here. Now, if you were a field hand on a rubber plantation, would you be reading the poems of Charles Algernon Swinburne? Senor, I do not understand. Maybe I do. Well, Senor Best. What's the matter with reading Swinburne, Trasker? Nothing at all, Best. It's just a little unusual. Jerome Steak is the sort of a man who might read love poems. Joe Best wouldn't? He might and he might not. Now put that book back in my trunk, Trasker. Close the trunk and get out of here before Joe I... Steak was known to have a severe temper. Why, you... Oh, no, no, Senor Best. It would not be good to resort to violence. After all, there is a law in Maracas district. I am only its humble instrument. Okay, but still... okay, okay. Put the gun down. And I'm telling you, Trasker, you're poking your nose into trouble. <laughs> Yeah, our car seems to have an 
those bottles hanging around here. Looking for something, Mr. Trask? What? Oh, hello, Carr. I cut myself. I was told there was some peroxide in this first aid cabinet. Funny they told you to come all the way down to my shack for peroxide. Is it? I think so. They have iodine up at the main office. Is that so? Yeah. Iodine's much better for cuts, particularly little scratches like that. Thanks, Carr. I'll remember that. I would if I were you, Trasky. You can't be too careful. That's right. Especially when your bottle labeled machine oil contains peroxide. Might fool people. Meaning? Nothing important. I was just thinking peroxide is bad for the hair. It tends to bleach it. Does it really? That's what they say. Trasky, you lied to us the other day. That apology of yours was a stall. You still think one of us is this Jerome Steak? Could be, Carr. I've got five days to find out. Yeah, Trasky, you've got five days. If you live that long. <laughs> As the curtain falls on act one of our story, it looks as though Boyd Trasker is in for plenty of trouble, and very shortly. The chances are Mr. Trasker would much rather be back in San Francisco right now than risking his life in the Brazilian jungle. Well, Mr. Barnes, I don't know about Mr. Trasker, but I do know this. There are a lot of men who'd rather face all the tortures of the worst jungle than go through the punishment of a morning shave. Well, almost. You see, many a man has a wiry, hard-to-cut beard or a tender skin. And shaving can really be painful. And yet it needn't be. Not if they shave with Mole Brushless Shaving Cream. The heavier cream for tender skins. Yes, Mole is a heavier cream. The cream that softens your whiskers, sets them up straighter, and lets your razor sweep right through them. With Mole, you shave faster, closer, easier, and you shave painlessly. Try it and see if you don't say, it's smooth. So smooth. It's slick. So slick. It's a smooth, smooth, slick, slick shave you get with M-O-L-L-E. Mole. The heavier brushless cream for tender skins. Mole. And now back to Jeffrey Barnes and act two of the Mole mystery, Red Wine. Boyd Trasker, San Francisco detective, is on a rubber plantation in the jungles of the Amazon looking for a murderer named Jerome Steak. He is convinced that one of the Americans there is the murderer. When he challenges the three men, each denies he is Jerome Steak. The search becomes a hunt. One man hunting, three hunted. Joe Best, William Carr, Dick Hallop, the hunted. Boyd Trasker, the hunter. But as the hours of the week slip by, the tension grows tighter. The hostility comes out in the open, and the tables are turned. The hunter becomes the hunted. Then one afternoon, the four go off into the jungle to shoot wild pigs. Senor! Senor Trasca! Senor Trasca! You are all right. Where did you come from, Hernando? You... You are all right. I told you not to worry about me. I could not help it. I had to come when I heard you had agreed to go pig hunting with those men. I can take care of myself. But such unnecessary risks in this jungle, anything... What would you happen. want me to do? They came to me this morning, all three of them, and said they always hunt pig on a day off, and would I like to come along? But it would be so easy. A hunting accident. Pig. Everybody is so sorry. And you are dead. Yes, I'm expecting it any minute. What? The hunting accident. One of those men out there on a brush is Steak. I feel certain of it. He already has one murder to his credit. And I'm going to find out if he has nerve enough to try a second. Senor Frasca. You see that little rise of ground ahead? See. Si. They gave me that as my post when a pig is sighted. A car is somewhere to the left. Best is over there to the right by that clump of trees. And Halop is behind us. Now when... Here he comes! 
Please, do not go to your post, Senor Trasker. I don't intend to. Huh? But my sun helmet is going. My sun helmet will show just above the bushes in the spot where I'm supposed to be. Oh, wait, wait. I am coming with you. Please, Senor Trasker, please. Stay down, Fernando, and stay down. This is your post right here? Yes. Senor. Boy Trasca's helmet showing just above the bushes. No one would. Trasca's helmet, gentlemen. There's Jerome Steak watching. Well, this will prove nothing. Let's I... see. Now watch. <coughs> Santa Maria. Yeah, it didn't take him long, did it? Clean through the helmet. Mother of heaven. Clean through the helmet. And the direction indicated clear as a weather vane. It came from behind us. Behind? Senor Halep is behind. Halep was behind us, but Carr and Best could have dropped back. It could have been any one of them. But it was one of them. What do you say now, Don Hernando? What do I say now? I say you are right, senor. One of these three men is the murderer. Jerome Steak. <laughs> That was the first attempt on board Trasker's life. The second attempt involves a melee man-catcher, that horrible machine that is set off by a concealed wire and plunges spiked bamboo stakes into its victim. Senor! Senor Trasker! Senor Trasker! I'm all right, Hernando. Luckily for me, I've traveled in Java. I know the setup of a melee man catcher when I see one. My houseboy wasn't so fortunate. Oh, poor Manuel. Those bamboo stakes pierced right through. But how could... How could a melee man catcher suddenly appear outside my shack? Jerome Steak lived many years in Java. He could answer that. <laughs> was attempt number two on Trasker's life. And then that night, attempt number three. Don Hernando, this way, quick! See, si, si, senor! See, si. what has happened? Mother of heaven! A bushmaster! Yeah, it was curled up between my bed sheets. I got it just in time. If I hadn't been on the lookout for something... The deadliest snake in all the world! Yes. Another quaint device of our friend Jerome Steak. <laughs> The hunter has become the hunted, and both are working against time. One day left. Senor, I, I cannot stand much more of these. You won't have to, Hernando. It has been Steak's life or mine. Now it's going to be Steak's. You are sure? The river launch arrive tomorrow. I know, but I still haven't played my trump card. Your trump? Yes, Fernando. In North America, we call it our ace in the hole. This is a private party. I don't expect to stay, Best. Good. Amen. I came to extend an invitation. Yeah? How far you'll get with any of your invitations, Trasker? Will you listen or not? If it'll help get you out of here any faster, go ahead, spill it. Tomorrow, I'm leaving Bohar for good. Oh, oh, hooray! Hooray! Best news of hand. But I'd like to leave with no hard feelings, if you'll let me. Boys, I want to throw a party for you. We're having a party. A real party. On board the steamer before I sail. I know the skipper of the Salvador, and the skipper knows food. He has a top-notch wine cellar aboard, specializes in Chateau Malheur. He also has a fine Chinese cook. Now, what do you say? Ah, uh, the devil with you and your pocket. Now, wait a minute, fellas. Wait a minute. We don't like Traskin. We've made no bones about it. But I think we should take him up on this offer. After all, good food and wine don't turn up around here every day. I'll eat your chow, Trask. Thanks, Halep. And you, Carm? Uh, if it's okay with Halep, it's okay with me. That leaves you, Best. Well, I wouldn't like you any better, Trasker, but count me in. 
Thank you, gentlemen. You'll come on the launch with me? No, we'll paddle down the river ourselves. As you like. Well, good night. I'll see you on the steamer tomorrow. But I have an idea of it'll be a party you'll never forget. <laughs> This is Jeffrey Barnes again. In just a moment, we'll return you to Act Three of Red Wine. Don't let specks of dandruff on your coat or collar embarrass you. Do what thousands are doing for relief from this social and business handicap. Use double dandarine. You'll quickly discover that double dandarine is unlike so many hair preparations available today. Preparations that really do no more to fight a common type of dandruff than plain water does. That is, they simply remove loose dandruff. Double dandarine, you see, actually combats this dandruff by killing on contact the germs that many outstanding authorities contend are a cause. I repeat, it actually kills them on contact. Now, the amazing effectiveness of double dandarine is due to a special ingredient called Alzan, an active antiseptic so remarkably efficient that many hospitals use it. And among hair preparations, double dandarine and double dandarine alone has it. So try double dandarine and see if you don't agree that most ordinary hair preparations can't compare with its dandruff-combating effectiveness. If you're not satisfied, return the empty bottle and get your money back. Buy Double Dandarine at your druggist's. All right, Mr. Tasker. Flight shims ready. Our swings on toast ready. Everything ready. You taste? <laughs> no, Yang, everything smells perfect. That's proof enough for me. You agree, Don Hernando? Mm. See, si, see, si. as the Chinese say, Ho Yang is number one cook. My guests have arrived? They are waiting in the ship's salon. Let's go, then. Everything is all ready. Now, don't forget, you bring in the ice cubes when I call for you. See, si, I will bring them. I will remember. He's all planned. Good. Now, Don Hernando... I'm ready for my ace in the hole. Yes. I told you before, Jerome Steak is a connoisseur of good food and rare wine. Now, this little bottle of Chateau Malheur will be his finish. This little bottle? It will? As surely as he meant his melee man catcher to finish me. Now, midway through the dinner, I'll rise and call for silence. Gentlemen, I'll say, in a moment, I'll open this rare vintage wine. I'd be pleased if all of you will join me in a farewell drink. Having a good time, boys? Yeah, fine. fine. Good. Now, may I have your attention for just a moment? Gentlemen, please. Gentlemen, in a moment, I'll open this rare vintage wine. I'll be pleased if all of you will join me in a farewell drink. Why not? Pour it out. Oh, might as well go to the limit. This wine is Chateau Malheur, 1911. Pour it out. Never mind the buildup. Ah, the vineyards produce real nectar that year. Yeah, let's drink and not talk. Okay, best. Here she comes. Mmm, the bouquet. Pass the bottle around, just have a whiff of it. Here, Best, smell it. Mmm, mm, smells okay. Here, here, guys, take a sniff, make the man happy. Ah, oh, look, Trask, I prefer drinking some. As you say. The glasses, gentlemen? <laughs> now we're getting somewhere. Pass them down, Chase. All right. Precious stuff, you'll taste no other like it. Glass for Joe Best. One for Dick Hallop. And one for William Carr. Well, let's hope it tastes as good as you've tried to make it sound. It will, Hallop, I assure you. Uh, Don Hernando. Uh, Don Hernando, what's he doing? He was with me in the launch. Don Hernando. Oh, coming, Senor Trascar, coming. Have the ice pail? See, si, right here. Ice pail? Yes, Hallop. Look, are we going to drink this wine or not? We're going to drink it, Carr. You just remove the cover from the pail and drop a cube of ice into each glass. It'll add to the refreshment. Oh, it's yeah. all right, huh? Oh, it's yeah, it's not so bad. Ah, uh, one cube for Joe yeah, Best. I can't wait to have any. One cube for Dick right. Hallop. Yeah, so nice party, huh? And one cube for William Hey, Trump. hey, you're not going to put ice in my Chateau Malheur. Hey, what's the matter, Carr? Why not, Carr? Well, because uh, any, any fool knows it. Yes, Carr? Well, well, I mean, 
Everyone knows that Chateau Malas is drunk at room temperature. Everyone does? I don't think so, Carr. I think that is something only Jerome Steak would know. William Carr, or if you prefer Jerome Steak, I arrest you for the murder of your wife. William Carr was arrested, but Joe Best and Dick Hallop are freed. The next morning, Best and Hallop push their canoe into the river and start paddling upstream toward home. Two of you are at liberty to return upriver to Bar. That pompous fool. Yeah. I just can't get it through my head. Quiet Billy Carr. Who'd have thought it could be our friend? Billy Carr. Yeah. Nice guy, all the same. You know, Best, when you come to think of it, that was pretty darn clever, Trasky. He figured only a guy who really knew his liquor would balk at having ice put in his wine. Mm. He sure enough trapped Bill with those cubes in the Chateau Malheur, 1911. Pretty clever, I'd say. Maybe. And maybe not so clever. What do you mean, not so clever? Any wine merchant could tell you, Halep, there was no Chateau Malheur in 1911. It was a bad year. The vineyards didn't bottle. Yes, that's... Hey, Best, wait a minute. Only one man around these parts would know a thing like that. Jerome Steak. That's right. Oh, keep right on paddling, Halep, and don't turn around. You might be sorry. You, uh... You're gonna kill me. I suppose so, yes. You're the only man alive who knows I'm Jerome Steak. I can hardly allow you to return to Boa with that knowledge. I'd be embarrassed. Yeah. You'll be even more embarrassed when you try to shoot that revolver. I emptied the chambers this morning. What? You see, Bess Trask and I have been trying to find you for months. We narrowed it down to you and Carr, but we were stymied from there. We had to hear it from your own mouth. We chose this way, counting on your ego. I, I wouldn't you... try anything, Joe. The chambers in this gun are quite well loaded. I see. Shall we be getting back to the Salvador? Trasker will be waiting. I guess so. We can finish the bottle if you like. Finish the bottle? If you like. Okay, Halep. <laughs> Always was a sucker for red wine. <laughs> Now, this is Jeffrey Barnes again, inviting you to be with us next week when we present a comedy mystery by Joseph Rusko entitled The Case of the Missing Mind. You'll meet a delightful little Broadway wise guy named Kenny, who has one of the most mad, exciting, hilarious experiences on record when he meets a strange mystic named Aladdin. So join us next week to meet two wonderful characters in The Case of the Missing Mind. <laughs> Original music for the Mole Mystery Theater is composed and conducted by Alexander Sandler. Red Wine was written by L.G. Blockman and adapted for radio by Louis Pelletier and Jacques Fink. Kenneth Lynch was featured in tonight's program. This is Dan Seymour saying good night until next Friday when the Mystery Theater presents The Case of the Missing Mind.
Perpetual Broadcasting System presents The Mysterious Traveler, written, produced, and directed by Robert A. Arthur and David Cogan, and starring tonight two of radio's outstanding personalities, Frank Reddick and Jan Miner, in an original play titled Death Has a Cold Breath. This is The Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, and it will thrill you a little and chill you a little as we discover that death has a cold breath. Your name is Andy Marlowe. Once you were a very successful publicity agent. But this morning, as you slouch behind your big mahogany desk, you feel terrible. You're nursing a hangover. You're worrying about the IOUs you've been passing out the last few months to certain rather tough individuals who run gambling houses. You're slipping, slipping fast. Your bankroll is gone. Your girl, Julie, who's just as hard and beautiful as the diamond she loves to wear, is looking for greener pastures, and you're on the skids. Unless you come up with a smart idea. You stare at your appointment pad with bleary eyes. The first name on it is Harold Farrington. Harold Farrington, the matinee idol of 20 years back. Now he's a has-been ham. You almost tell your assistant to send him away, but you change your mind and have him sent in. Andy, Andy, old boy, you're looking splendid. I just got back from Florida. Thought I'd drop in and say hello. Sit down, Harold, and cut out the hot air. You haven't the price of a trip to South Jersey, much less Florida, and I know it. <laughs> you're always bluffing direct, Andy. That's uh, what I like about you. Yes, it's embarrassing to admit it, but I am financially substandard at the moment. If it's a touch, Harold... The answer is no. I wouldn't dream of asking you for a loan, Andy. I want to retain you, to enlist your services, to put me once again on the front pages. Remember six months ago, you dreamed up that idea of a national theater that I hoped to found? That got me nice headlines, Andy. Yes, but you didn't get a job out of it. I'm going to be frank with you, Harold. Of course, old man, of course. The only way you'll ever work on Broadway again is to get a job in the street cleaning department. Andy. But I know you're only joking. Just remind the public of me and the women will clamor to see me again. I've always had success with the women, you know. The answer is no. I like to get paid for my services. But you will, Andy. Six months ago, for your last campaign, I made you sole beneficiary in my will. You'll collect when I die. Sole beneficiary in your will. What a laugh. I think I fell for your line about having trust funds that would pay off when you died. I checked up later. You don't even own a spare suit of clothes. I admit I exaggerated. I confess oh, it. Oh, that's mighty wide of you. However, this might interest you. A letter that was forwarded to me last week. Read what it says. Six pages in a woman's handwriting. Reeking with gardenia perfume. Phooey. It's from a wealthy widow in Boston. Twenty-five years ago, she was an admirer of mine. Her name is Abby Wilson, Mrs. Abby Wilson, and she's worth half a million dollars. Harold, you bore me. So does Mrs. Abby Wilson. Now get to the point, will you? I am, Andy. She's ill, slowly dying. And uh, having read about my plan to start a theater, which I would run in the interest of a free, untrammeled stage, she decided to make the dream possible by leaving me all her money when she dies. Now, don't you see, Andy, that will of mine is now worth something. When Mrs. Abby Wilson dies, I'm a rich man. Pipe dreams, Harold. She's probably a crackpot in an old lady's home. And to show you what I think of your will, in which I'm sole beneficiary, let's see, it ought to be in this drawer here. Yeah, here, here it is. Now, watch, Harold. There. There's your precious will where it belongs, in the wastebasket. Now, get out of here, you old has-been. I'm busy. Your exasperation finally has gotten the better of you, Andy. You kick Harold Farrington out. Then, 
feeling worse than ever, you slump in your chair again. You're still slouched there half an hour later when the telephone rings. Hello. Hello, darling. Oh. Oh, hello, Julie. My. The Wonder Boy sounds as if he had a hangover this morning. No, I'm all right. Just catching a little cold, that's all. Well, then you'll probably be glad to have me break our date for tonight. Break our date? Yes. I won't be able to make it tonight, Andy. So sorry. Why won't you be able to make it? I've had those tickets for weeks. I'm flying out to the coast at midnight, sweetheart. Bill Wentworth is throwing a really big house party and then a cruise on his yacht afterwards. What? He phoned last night to invite me and I accepted. Julie, you can't walk out on me like this just because Wentworth has money. And you have charm, Andy. But the charm's been wearing a little thin lately. And so has your bankroll. So goodbye, darling. See you around. Julie, wait. Hard poor little gold diggers. I'll get another bankroll somehow. And she'll come running back. I know Julie. For a moment, Andy, you daydream about being rich again. But you're rudely interrupted by the sound of an argument outside and your office door open. Hello, Marlowe. Your office boy didn't want to let me in, but I persuaded him I had business with you. Oh, hello, Rocky. I'm glad you dropped in. Yeah. I, I've been planning to get in touch with you. I've, I've got a big deal in the fire. Yeah? Yeah, going to get a big fee out of it. Oh, I hope you do, Andy, for your sake. So, uh, Rocky, I just wanted to ask you if you could just uh, wait a few days on his IOUs. I'll really be flush. Well, nobody ever said Rocky Smith wasn't a reasonable man. What's your idea of a few days? Well, uh, naturally, I don't get my fee until my client begins to see himself in the headlines, so... Well, uh, how about uh, 60 days, Rocky? Huh. Of course, I never got past the eighth grade, Marlowe. But 60 seems to me considerably more than a few. I'll let you have three days. And that's all. When he's gone, you hastily pour yourself a drink, Andy. Just then your telephone rings. You let it ring. What can it be but more bad news? Finally, the ringing gets on your nerves. You answer it. Hello? Hello, is this Mr. Andrew Marlowe? Yes, this is Marlowe speaking. Well, my name is Phelps, Mr. Marlowe. I'm calling from Boston. Yes, yes, Mr. Phelps. Well, Mr. Marlowe, I'm very anxious to contact Mr. Harold Farrington. I believe he's a client of yours. Well, you could call it that. Yeah, he was here. Left about half an hour ago. Oh, well, can you possibly locate him for me, Mr. Marlowe? It's rather important. You see, I represent the estate of the late Mrs. Abby Wilson. I'm anxious... Wait a minute. Uh, did you say the estate of the late Mrs. Abby Wilson? Oh, well, yes, Mr. Marlowe. Mrs. Wilson died day before yesterday. And it appears that her new will leaves everything she owns to Mr. Farrington. I believe she was once an admirer of his. Oh, yes, yes. I, I, I know all about that, Mr. Phelps. I'll tell you, I'll locate Harold for you. You just leave it to me. Well, I certainly appreciate it, Mr. Marlowe. I'd like him here for the probating of the will. Of course, as soon as the news gets out... He goes on talking, but you're not listening, Andy. Your mind is working story. like lightning now. Course, so that crazy story of Harold's about a rich widow leaving him everything was like true. Like, that, so like a fool, you tore up Harold's will, Marlo, making you his heir. There must be some way to save the situation. Then it comes to you. The whole plan in one like brilliant inspiration. So, Mr. Marlowe, I want to stress... Oh, Mr. Phelps, excuse me, please. Oh, yes, Mr. Marlowe? If you let me handle all the publicity, I can keep it dignified and still make it a valuable asset to Mr. Farrington's plan. Oh, yes, I can understand that. Now, if... If you'll see to it that nobody else hears about this until you and me and Mr. Farrington can get together... Why, I think that can be managed, Mr. Marlowe. Good, good. Then I'm going to hang up now and find Farrington. And when I do, I'll phone you. So, goodbye for now, Mr. Phelps. You hang up and snatch that torn-up will from the wastebasket. Carefully, you paste the torn will together with scotch tape. Then you set out to find Harold Farrington. You try his rooming house first. No, Mr. Farrington ain't in. I don't know where he is, and I don't care. Unless he comes back with a $35,000 rent he owes me. He might try Tim O'Sullivan's saloon around the corner. That's where he usually hangs out. 
You hurry to the coroner's saloon, but the actor's not there. Desperately perspiring in your anxiety, you try all the other local saloons. At last you find him. In a corner table in the cheapest bar of them all. You can see he's almost fire. Merely this is my good old friend Randy. Have a drink. It's uh, not good liquor, but it's cheap. Uh, that's his great recommendation. It's cheap. Oh, yes, I, I'm sorry, Harold. I can't drink now. I've hunted you up to apologize. I was only joking this morning. I am going to put on a campaign for you. I'm going to get your name in all the papers. Well, uh, that's mighty fine, Andy. Calls for a celebration. Uh, waiter, uh, two more. You sit down, Andy, controlling your impatience. You bring out the damaged will and get Harold to initial each torn section. Then you tell him about your publicity scheme for him. He's to disappear, you explain, after threatening to kill himself. Threaten to kill myself, man. To die, to sleep, for chance to dream. Aye, and there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. Shakespeare, Andy. All right, sounds like a good scheme. I'll uh, cooperate. Your plan is working, Andy. Working beautifully. You get Harold Farrington into the phone book. You phone Ross of the Daily Ledger. And Farrington talks to him. Hello, uh, hello, Ross. This is uh, Harold Farrington. Just wanted to tell you I'm uh, going to play a big role soon in uh, The Tragedy of Man. I'm going to play the corpse. Uh, what am I talking about? I'm just trying to tell you, old boy. The time has come to ring down the curtain. Going to end the little drama of Harold Farrington. Hello. Uh, Andy, how do you like that? He said I was drunk, and he hung up. Yes, your scheme is working beautifully. You have Harold Farrington phone all the critics and tell them he's going to kill himself. But then Farrington collapses. Desperately, you realize you have to have help. You telephone Julie. You persuade her to bring her car and meet you. You show her the will. Tell her about Mrs. Abby Wilson. Surely, Julie, you understand. If this will is legal, I'll come at a half a million dollars soon. I understand that, darling. But just how are you going to collect? I mean, suppose dear Harold decides to stay alive and then changes his will. Uh, he won't. I, I mean, how, how long can he live drinking as he does? He's on his last legs. You mean you'll keep him supplied with free liquor until he obligingly drinks himself to death, Andy, dear? Yes, something like that. I haven't time to tell you the details now, but... Somebody has to get Harold to my cabin up in the woods and keep him hidden there. That's your job, Julie. Get him there, keep him there, and don't let anybody know he is there. Darling, for both our sakes, say you'll do it. Well, it means missing Bill Wentworth's party, but... All right, I'll do it. Only Andy, darling. This scheme of yours had better pay off. So that's taken care of. Julie starts off for your secluded cabin in the mountains with Harold Farrington. You promise to join her the following night. The next morning, you get busy on the phone, ostensibly trying to trace Farrington. Among others, you call your old friend, the theatrical critic, Paul Milton. Yes, Paul, I am worried about Harold Farrington. It's no gag. I know he called you yesterday and threatened to commit suicide, and I think he meant it. I'm really worried about him. Okay, I'll keep looking. See you soon, Paul. We'll have a drink together. Paul Milton's skepticism is typical. And it's just what you want. Last of all, you call another old friend, Captain Harry Banning, in the Bureau of Missing Persons. Oh, now, Harry, I'm not trying to drum up a story. Farrington really is missing. I want you to put out a missing persons notice on... Well, if that's the way you feel about it, I'll have to find him without any help from the police. You hang up, and you're pleased, Andy. Very pleased. 
That evening, you catch the train for the little town of Ridge Gap, where your cabin is located. At the Ridge Gap station, you slip away into the darkness without being noticed. It's bitterly cold, but you walk the two miles to your cabin. There you find Julie and Harold Farrington having a drink in the living room. After the necessary greetings, you waste no time in getting down to business. Well, kids, we're rolling. The editors are beginning to believe in your suicide, Harold. Andy, I'm not so sure that this suicide is a good publicity angle. The more I think of about it... Of course it's a good angle. Isn't it, Julie? Why, of course it is, Harold. Why, it'll get the critics to writing long, appreciative articles about you. The kinds of thing the producers all notice. Well, maybe, but I still think... Harold, Harold, you hired me to do the thinking. Now listen, you write me a long letter of farewell. Understand? A letter of farewell... Well, I could do that with the quotations from my great plays, Macbeth, Hamlet. Well, that's it, Harold. Yes, yes. I'll take the letter back to New York with me. I'll call all the critics. I'll get a couple of them to rush up here with me. Now, just before we get here, you take one sleeping tablet. Then pretend to be unable to wake until we've worked over you for at least half an hour. You got it? Yes, yes, of course. I could do that. And look absolutely on the level. Tomorrow evening, your name will be headlines from coast to coast. Well, if you're sure, and I'm positive. Now, sit down at my desk and start writing that suicide note. And be sure to apologize to me for using my cabin. You understand, Harold? You leave Harold Farrington busy writing the suicide letter. You take Julie into the next room to tell her the rest of your plan. And as soon as he finishes that letter, Harold's going to die. You understand that, don't you, Julie? Die? Andy, you didn't say anything about that when you sent me up here with him. I'm not going to have anything to do with murder. Harold will drink himself to death in another six months. What difference does it make if he goes now? It means half a million dollars to us, me and you. It's perfectly safe. By now, half New York knows Harold was threatening to kill himself. You go on talking, married you. persuading You're rich. her. rich. And when you All want to be, you can be there. You're very persuasive. Maybe a few hours. At last, Julie gives in to your scheme. All right, Andy, I'll do it. But let's get it over with quickly. You go back into the living room. Harold has finished writing his farewell to you and the world, and he's reading it aloud with great self-appreciation. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage. And then is heard no more. Oh, uh, there you are, Andy. Listen, I think this is rather good. He begins at the beginning and reads the whole letter to you. It's what you want, exactly. As he reads, you busy yourself fixing him a drink. And into the drink, you pour the contents of a small bottle. Harold Farrington finishes his letter and waits for your applause. That's splendid, Harold. Simply terrific. It nearly made me cry, just listening to it. I think without undue modesty, one could say it's good theater. Oh, is that a drink for me, Andy? Well, it isn't for anybody else, Harold. Thank you. I've earned this drink. Well, bottoms up. He drinks, and in five minutes, it's all over. For one last instant, he stares at you accusingly, then his eyes close, and he falls forward on the desk. He's dead. Perfect, Julie. Couldn't have worked out better. Well, now, now what, Andy? Back to New York and come find him tomorrow or the next day? Yeah. It's all going to be settled tonight. Tonight? Yes. The very special reason why. I owe some money, but tomorrow I've got to be able to prove I can pay it from the inheritance. Now, we're going to drive to Ridge Gap, have dinner, and pretend we're on our way up here from New York. Then we arrive here, find Harold dead, and phone the sheriff. That's all there is to it. Uh, Andy, now, wait a minute. What is it? What time is Harold supposed to have died? Well, sometime last night when I was in New York. That's impossible. Here's his body. It'll still be warm when the sheriff gets here. The sheriff will know that Harold must have died this evening. Yeah. That's right. I forgot that. I can't wait till tomorrow. Just can't. I got it. What? It's cold out. Only about 15 above zero. Yeah. But put Harold out on the terrace, chair and all, for half an hour. And then he'll be cold, plenty cold. 
It seems if he died hours ago. Swiftly, you and Julie lift the chair in which Harold Farrington sits. You carry it out on the terrace in the bitterly cold wind. There you leave Harold uh, to cool a bit. Back in the house, you set everything straight, remove all evidence of Julie's having been there. You wait half an hour, 45 minutes. Then you carry Harold back in, chair and all, and pose him properly in front of the desk where his touching suicide note waits. The picture is perfect. Cold enough now. Feel his forehead. He's like ice. Yeah. That's because he died last night, my dear. Now let's go. Have dinner at the village. Make sure we're seen. Then come up here and discover Harold. Your program goes off without a hitch, Andy. In the village of Ridge Gap, you make sure witnesses see you eating. You tell the waitress you're just on your way to the cabin. Then you drive up and find poor Harold's body. In half an hour, the sheriff is there with the coroner. The sheriff looks around, listens to your story, reads the letter Harold so obligingly wrote, and nods. Yep. Certainly is plain enough story, Mr. Marlowe. Poor fella. Down on his luck, decided to end it all. You say you gave him a key to this cabin six months ago? Yes, yes, that's right, Sheriff. Six months ago, I did a publicity campaign for him, and we used to come up here to work out our plans. I gave him a key then, and he kept it. And poor Harold crept here to die in hiding. That's how it goes. Well, I guess there's no use our hanging around any longer. Poor fella's stone cold. Means he died last night or this morning, I guess. Well, Doc, let's phone Williams, the undertaker, and get this over with. I guess we better wait a mite before we call the undertaker, Sheriff. Wait? What for? There's something a bit peculiar here. Peculiar? Well, what do you mean, Doc? Let's feel this fellow's forehead. Mighty cold, isn't it? That's right. Cold as ice. Shows he's been dead quite some time. Yes, everybody knows that. It's in every detective story. His forehead was as cold as ice. I wish I had a dollar for each time I've read that. Yes, but I'm afraid you don't get my point. See, a dead body can only cool off to the temperature of the room it's in. Oh, well, uh, what are you getting at? Just this. I took the temperature of this suicide. His body temperature's only 45 degrees. 45 degrees? Right. Well, how could that be, Doc? This room is 70 degrees. It ain't possible. Andy. Be quiet, Jelly. You're right, Sheriff. It isn't possible. Unless this uh, suicide walked outdoors and practically froze himself. He came back in, sat down, and waited for us. And I don't think he did. What you're saying, Doc, is um, it's not suicide. It's murder. And I reckon we got the murderers right here in this room with us. Well, folks, how about it? <laughs> Mysterious traveler again. Dear me, it's a cold wind that blows nobody good, isn't it? Yes, Andy and Julie were persuaded to confess. <laughs> it wasn't hard to get a confession, since each rushed in to blame the other. Such a clever scheme, too. Not a flaw in it. If only Andy hadn't been in such a hurry to cool the corpse off. The moral is... Never rush a corpse and let it take its own time, even if it kills you. Oh, that reminds me of next week's story, The Hot Seat. It's about a dim-witted fellow with but one thing in mind, revenge. However, his weapon was not the knife, gun, or poison. It was... Oh, you have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train every week at this same time. You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. The role of The Mysterious Traveler is played by Maurice Tarplin. This is Jack Farron speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.
Ladies and gentlemen, the American Broadcasting Company brings to its entire network one of radio's most unusual programs. Pat Novak, for hire. Sure, I'm Pat Novak, for hire. That's what the sign out in front of my office says. Pat Novak for hire. If you're trying to make a living down on the waterfront in San Francisco, you gotta run things like a smorgasbord. You take a little of everything you can get your hands on. Even then, it's a bumpy ride, because down here, everybody tries to pad his part. Oh, I rent boats and do anything else good men pay bad men to do. You don't get many gold stars that way, but you pay the bar bill, and it's about as safe as a closet full of tigers. The only way you can make friends down on the waterfront is to die. I found that out Tuesday night. I went to the wrestling matches and watched gorgeous George throw some guy around like a poker chip in Tijuana. I was in the middle of the crowd on my way out of the place when this guy stepped up behind me and started talking. You got company, Novak, huh? I said you got company on both sides. Oh, did your friend get his face at a fire sale, too? Can't all be pretty. Keep walking, Novak. That gun in my bag supposed to help? That's up to you. Straight ahead and out the side door. You got the right growl, but the wrong guy, mister. You keep working your mouth, but nothing comes out. All right, this way. What are your plans? Shall we take the kids? The car, right down here. Now look, big shot. In a drugstore, I get all the mystery I want for two bits. You want things explained? Yeah, besides Shovelhead here, I don't understand a thing. We just want Joe Deneen. I never heard of him either. We just want Joe Deneen. All right, you can have him. You're welcome. See his wife. See anybody you like. I don't even know the guy. You're full of talk. As soon as you want to make it the right kind, you can go home. Here we are, into the back seat. You drive, Eddie. You boys run on. I'll grab a cab. Get in, Novak. We're not going to take a vote. That's it. Just be a good mouse. You got a lot of time to waste it this way, mister. You're too gabby, Novak. And you're too tough, Junior. And this noise is beginning to give me a headache. Oh. Let's go, Eddie. Novak's going to sulk a while. He could have taken three bases on that wallop. I spread out on the back seat like a bowl of cake batter and tried to think of a guy named Joe Deneen. There was nobody on my list by that name. But the way these two Gunsels acted, he was supposed to be a blood relative. I could hear him talking dimly, and I tried to follow the conversation, but it was like trying to put a smoke ring in your pocket. I don't know how long the tour lasted. It must have been about 30 or 40 minutes when the car pulled up and the big gun up started to yank me. Wake up. Wake up, sweet boy. Come on, it's time for your 10 o'clock feeding. Uh, yeah, wait till I borrow some legs, huh? Come on, you never looked better. All right, down the dock here. Are we playing a new game or hunting a guy named Deneen? That's right. Good, now I know the rules. Uh. Is that your boat, Novak? It's got my name on Is it. Is that your boat, Novak? Well, what's it look like, the Normandy? Of course it's my boat. Who threw the blood all over it? One of your friends? Maybe Deneen. Now look, you better back up and start a recap. I never heard of Deneen, and from the size of his friends, I'm just about as happy. He didn't rent a boat off you? If he used that boat, he stole it, mister. I closed up tonight at seven. You make it sound good. It is good. I've been off the waterfront four hours. In the meantime, somebody takes my boat and gets a shot full of holes and sends you around to weep. Who is Deneen? A friend. I don't blame either of you for hanging on to one. You were supposed to meet him at your landing at 10. He was going to rent one of your boats, and we were going to meet him at 10. There's the boat. You want to pay the damages? We came early and found the boat piled up. Blood all over and no Deneen. You got any ideas? Maybe he cut himself shaving. Dragged the bay, mister. I don't know your guy, but somebody did. They met him out there in the bay and cut him down. You sound happy. Now, look, I don't care one way or another, except he used my boat. If he wanted to die, he should have hired a Davenport. That's all I know. I never heard of Joe Deneen. Yeah. You and your friend here better go sap somebody else. Sure, Novak. We'll look around, but hang on to your cards because you've still got a hand in this game. Thanks, Mother. I'll remember that. Watch out, Eddie! Watch out, Ben! You all right, Eddie? 
Nice curve, Novak. You're wrong, mister. My friends ride the cable car. You made a bum pitch, Novak. Can I trust you? All right, let go. You can't afford a fight now. I want you for Eddie, Novak. Sorry, fellow. The water's going to be cold. Hey, what's the trouble? Trouble going on? No. Whatever gave you that idea? I'm a night watchman over here. That fellow lying on the dock there dead? Well, if he's not, he's going to catch cold. What about the other fellow? Maybe he can't swim. What do you care? He doesn't. Oh. They come here looking for something? Yeah. Guess they didn't find it, huh? Somebody's satisfied. They were trying to find the guy that came out of that boat down there. Oh, you mean the funny-looking guy? Huh? A guy got out of that boat a few hours ago, all banged up. I think he was in a fight. Yeah? Sure, somebody shot him. I think he was in a fight. Where'd he go? Down the dock toward the street. He asked about a fellow and went down the dock. Oh. He asked about a fellow named Novak. Do you know him? Yeah, but I'll do my best to forget. It wasn't going to be easy to forget. I knew there was a guy wandering around San Francisco waiting to jog my memory. And before long, somebody was going to find out those two dead guys weren't doing light housekeeping down on the dock. Once homicides smell that red meat, they turn Inspector Hellman loose. That's like pouring a bottle of cyanide in a wedding cake. Oh, he's a smart cop with a heart the size of a full-grown pea. I got off the dock in a hurry and I went home. When I left, the watchman was still standing there waiting to check in the next murder and smiling like a vulture with a first option on a massacre. Well, I had to get home and look sweet in case Hellman showed up. When I opened the door to my place, Hellman was on the couch with a pencil in one hand and a movie magazine in the other. Hello, Novak. You busy? No, I'll just stand here and watch you. A little more of that pencil and movie magazine routine and you'll break out in a cold sweat. Where have you been? Staying out of other people's apartments. I got an answer for that. You haven't got an answer for anything, Hellman. You can't fill in the return address envelope. What's on your mind? Can I make a call? No, not to play cat and mouse. If you want to know about that bloodbath down on the dock, say so. Yeah? They're close strangers. I never saw either of them before. You're getting loose around the mouth, Novak. Huh? That's right. If some of your playmates stub their toes, it's news to me. You better tell me, though. It'll save time. Oh, what's the use? If a fact walked up and sat in your lap, you'd lose it. Suit yourself. Have a drink? Yeah, I will. Where's the bottle opener? Huh? The bottle opener. You got teeth for it. I need a bottle opener, Helen. I don't know. Try the kitchen. All right. Yeah. Try the light. Well. About this guy on the floor, Novak. Don't tell him to move because I don't think he can. <laughs> When I looked down at the guy on the floor, I felt like a burlap sack from the neck down. He was a big guy lying on his back, and he got the idea he took it hard. He didn't like the way the vote came in. Because he wasn't relaxed the way most people are when they're on the prowl for a harp. He was about as rigid as a coil of wet line on a steamer deck. His face was pockmarked in the color of an old piece of abalone. Hellman was standing over him, and the shadow cut across the lower part of his face. It almost blocked out the gun, a big 38 lying about four feet away. Oh, the rest of the kitchen was a mess. It was torn up worse than a Japanese lantern in a high wind. Hellman was leaning against the cabinet and smiling like the banker in a crooked blackjack game. Does he belong to you, Novak? No, he's not pretty enough. Roll him over. We'll find out who he is. I've already been through his stuff. Wipe your hands. The green still shows. His name is Joe Deneen. <laughs> you sure we're popular, Joe. Why? A scavenger hunt. Every Ghana in town's been looking for him. I figured you for the prize. Two of them picked me up and lugged me down to the waterfront. Yeah? I told you about them. They ran into bad weather. Why'd they take you? Because I looked like a bird dog, maybe. I don't know why, Hellman. They just took me. In the meantime, Sunshine here took my boat out and got shot up. And he came up here to borrow your adhesive tape. That's all I know, Hellman. He must have figured me for a part. I got the same trouble, Novak. That gun on the floor helps, too. That gun's second lead at best. I never saw it before. It's the murder gun. How'd it get here? I don't know. Maybe the scullery maid left it. Come on, Novak. You're in the spot. You better start digging. If I do any digging, the dirt's gonna go in your face, Hellman. You've got a nice face, too, Novak. You better buy a big shield, Hellman. You've got a lot to hide behind. Stop beefing. You're the host. What about the safety deposit box? You're ahead of me on that one. You ought to have your picture taken. He was talking about a safety deposit box when I got here. He was alive when you got here? That's right. Show more joy. The neighbors heard the shooting and phoned in. Well, who did it? What did he say? He said, tough luck, copper. That's all he said. 
Something about a safety deposit box and tough luck copper. Oh, that's real fine. You let him die clammed up. You're smart, Hellman. You let him off with a third-rate tagline. You're lucky, Novak. This way it's going to take me 12 hours to wrap you up. I'm going to run that gun through and check a couple of things, then I'll be on your tail. I want to see you follow something up, Hellman. With that big nose of yours, you couldn't find a moose in the bathtub. Look, Novak, you're a small-time waterfront punk. You've been lucky so far, but you're still a punk. I don't like you, and I'm going to hang you by your heels. I'm going to get you. If it's the last thing I ever do, I'm going to get you. Hellman, if I thought you were on the level about that, I'd give myself up. When Hellman left, things were about as dim as a glowworm at high noon. All the leads were tucked away in the morgue. Those two stiffs on the dock checked out with nothing but a grunt, and the guy up in my place left a thirty-eight and some mild regrets. I had the funny feeling there was a lead up there in that apartment, but I couldn't get a hold of it. Something waiting to be understood, the way a thing gets balanced on the edge of your brain, half in, half out, like the melody, but not the words of an old song. Well, I didn't know where to turn. I was hunting for the shoreline on a dark night. So I looked up the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. Oh, he's all right, but he's got the idea that all liquid that isn't 100 proof lacks character. I finally found him in a little bar down near Union Square. He was talking to a blonde girl and a sailor when I walked in. Ah, Patsy. You find me in the late October of my life, trying to recapture a few April moments. Yeah, Jocko, I gotta talk to you. That's what I like about good whiskey. It makes you too sentimental to be mad at yourself for growing old. Now, look, I'm in a jam. Lay off that stuff long enough to listen. Patsy, you underrate the grape. It's a terrible mistake. It's thrown off the whole perspective of history. All right, Jocko. Like that story about young Washington and the cherry tree. They blame him for that. But actually, it was his first hint of future greatness. Yeah, yeah. They talk about vandalism, whereas the truth of the matter is he was just preparing a few Manhattans for the family. The whole perspective of history has been altered, Patsy. Oh, stop it, will you? I'm in trouble. Will you help me out? Yes, if you'll allow me to get a word in edgewise. What kind of trouble? There's a dead guy up at my place. Oh, I don't know why you're in trouble. Think of his bleak outlook on things. Hellman's nosing around and he thinks I did it. Did you? No, he got shot in relays, but he picked my place to quit. And there are two other dead guys down on the dock. What were their practices? They strong-armed me about 10 o'clock and took me down to the waterfront. We were supposed to find a guy named Joe Deneen. But they looked too ripe to somebody. How about Deneen? He's that guy up at my place. When Hellman got there, he was muttering about a safety deposit box and staring at a big 38. Oh, come on. You gotta help me, Jocko. Yes, sir. Uh, where would you like me to spread the ashes? I want you to get out and find out everything you can about Joe Deneen, will you? He's your house guest. Why don't you go? Hit the Chronicle and the Examiner morgues and try to find out if he has a safety deposit box in any of the banks, huh? Where are you going? Uh, before prison, I mean. I'm going down and lie in Hellman's shadow until something turns up. I need every minute, Jocko, so hurry. Well, I'll, uh, I'll need a quick one for the road first. You'll get going right now, Jocko. Patsy, you have a defiant attitude for a man on the doorstep to the next world. Try to be sweeter until you discover your normal disposition will do. You can uh, start by paying my bar bill. All right. Will you hurry? How much do you owe? Oh, about $11. What have you been doing all night? Are you crazy? I may owe $11, Patsy, but so far I've had a better night than you have. Good night, lover. I had to get started on some answers because once Hellman checked on those two guys at the dock, he'd go to work on me. He'd keep hacking away and finally cut me down like a piece of flint in a cigarette lighter. Well, after I left Jocko, I started down to headquarters. It was a little after midnight and the streets were wet and silent. Except that now and then you could hear a woman's laughter coming out of the dark as you passed along. That's the only sound the night keeps whole. Well, I was cutting down Leavenworth Street when it came to me. I knew what my lead was up in that apartment. It didn't hit me suddenly. It kept shoving in like a piece of old seaweed on the water, moving in and out and finally brushing up against you. If that guy was alive when Hellman got there, that meant that maybe he could have phoned somebody. And if he did, then they'd have a record of it down at the desk. Well, I got back to my place and asked the operator. Well, it feels good when you got the right sweepstakes ticket. She said a call had been put in from my place at 10.15 to the Ambrose Hotel, room 204. Well, at last, things were beginning to make sense. They must have made sense for about five seconds because Hellman called. The girl handed me the phone and he started in. I got news for you, Novak. We 
You check the prints on that murder gun. They don't add. Take your troubles to the chaplain, Hellman. I got my quarter. Yeah. You got fancy friends, too, Novak. The prints belong to Jake Fidello. Yeah, how do you spell that? F-I-D... You're cute, aren't you, Novak? To Jake Fidello, I'm nothing. Who is he? Cheap punk like you, Novak. He's working out a 20-year stretch in Alcatraz. Huh? Yeah, Alcatraz. So there's no tie between the murder gun and the murder. Maybe Fidello bought himself a two-day furlough. We already checked. Guard saw him in his cell at 11 o'clock tonight, reading a book. Guards pay the rent, too, Hellman. My boat was out in that bay tonight, and it came back full of bullets and blood. Now you're trying to tell me there's no connection. You better find out if a guy can skip Alcatraz for a few hours. I'll wait, Novak. Maybe you can tell me how it's done before long. Well, nothing matched now. It was like the chorus girl's legs in a cheap nightclub. If Jake Fidello was smart enough to beat Alcatraz for a couple of hours, then he wasn't dumb enough to leave that murder gun behind. And what was the connection between Deneen and Jake Fidello? And who lived at the Ambrose Hotel? Well, I went up there to find out. It was a small place up near the top of Telegraph Hill, and when I rode by, I could see Alcatraz sitting out in the bay, a lonely island full of birthdays. The Ambrose turned out to be a high-toned little joint, the sort of place with the welcome mats printed in Old English. I went up to 204. The card in the door said Frederica Sims. I knocked, and when the door opened, it was like shaking hands with a flamethrower. She was a tall number, and she screamed final edition all over. She stood in the doorway for a minute and swayed in a nice, contented way like a snake on the right diet. And when she said hello, you wanted to hand her your arm and say twist. Good evening. Yeah, my name's Novak. I'll remember. Won't you come in? It'll save an argument. Good. I hope you don't mind crowds, Mr. Novak. She means me, Mr. Novak. I'm Mike Trevor. And I'm Freddie Sims. Well, that brings us up to date. A drink would do so much more. You need a drink, Mr. Novak. You look a little dusty. Don't mind her, Novak. She addresses all people as peasants. All right, now suppose you two landowners tell me who killed Joe Deneen. You know, Mike, I don't think he wants the drink. We'll all celebrate when you get around to Deneen. I don't think we know a man by the name of Deneen. Particularly if he's dead. Yes, I'm sure we wouldn't like him. Come on, let's drop the smart talk. Come on, back in the saloon. A guy by the name of Joe Deneen died all over my kitchen tonight. Don't get tough, Novak. If you missed your dinner, all right, but don't come up here screaming about your dead friend. Now, look, I'm about ten feet behind a phone call. Deneen put in a call for this number just before he died. Then it was whimsy, Novak, or anything else you'd like to call it. We don't know the man. You can mull it over on your way downstairs. Yeah, and you can use the time to think over that safety deposit box. What safety deposit oh, box? Oh, you're jumping your cue, lady. Make it more casual, huh? Do you know what you're talking about, Novak? You think so. I'll tell you what I'll do, Novak. I'll buy that key from you. You got a deal, unless you want to pay it off with money. You mean Joe, Denny? That's right. I'm running front on a murder rap. You want that key. If you want it bad enough, come on down to headquarters and we'll make a trade. No, thanks, Novak. You didn't look bright, but I thought you might be hiding your brain somewhere. This way, you lose money. You lose even more, Trevor. I was going to ease you into that murder rap, but the offer's out. You'll have to struggle in, and you'll be too tired to get out. Can I loan either of you boys a pickaxe? No, thanks. Well, I'm going to run along. Can I uh, drop you any place, Novak? I'll stay. You know, I didn't think I could drop you any place. Novak, you ought to sell that gleam in your eye. Some airport could use it. Good night, Freddie. Be careful. Good night, Mike. I can take care of myself. Yes, if you try. That's all I was worried about. Your friend reads the wrong books. I'll bet you never wasted your time that way. Why don't you sit down on the couch here and have a drink, Pepsi? Now that the argument's over. Is it? Well, at least we need a drink. Yeah, sure. That'll make the talk come easy. About that key. You think I want the key? Like nothing else in the world. Oh, that's a little rash, Patsy. But I do want it. I want it very badly. Those are famous last words, lady. You heard the round with Mike. The prices haven't changed. Mm -hmm. Got too expensive, darling. Here's your drink. What are you looking at, Patsy? You? The way you slide around on that couch? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You belong in the Everglades. If I were there, Patsy... I think you're the kind of a guy who'd be right around the next bend. You sound pretty sure. That's a good way to lose your shirt. I am sure, Patsy. I know that about us. We belong in a swamp. Yeah. We belong together. Because we're the same kind. 
We're neither good nor bad. We just are. And that has to do. You make it sound corny, baby. Try to hide, darling, but I can see you peeking through your fingers. I can see you awfully good from here, Patsy. Watch out. You're backing into a corner, Angel. But I've got you with me. Make some more noise, huh? I like it. It's true. I've got you with me, haven't I, Patsy? I can still struggle. I'll bet you don't struggle good. I'll bet you don't struggle good at all, Patsy. I still got that key, baby. Yes, you see. It stays at my place. I could eat you, Patsy. You're all wonderful. Yeah. You never been hand me my drink. And the soda at the end of the table. Sure. That's it, darling. <laughs> It doesn't pay much to fall in love. I spent enough time on her rug to work my way into the design. And when I finally came to, it was morning. There was nobody around the place, so I started for home. On the way, I tried to fill in the blind spots, but it was like trying to match pearls in the dark. Somebody had killed the name for the key to that safety deposit box, but where was the key? If the girl or Mike Trevor did it, then why were they still on the trail? Well, when I got to my apartment, the place was torn apart. Looked something like a mop closet after a New Year's Eve party. Jocko was sitting in the middle of the room listening to the water fizz. Good morning. Where'd you get the bump on the head? Romance. What'd you find out, Jocko? Janine had lots of friends and enemies. Yeah, one of them's Jake Fidello. Uh, he's number one on the list. Janine had a brawl with Fidello two years ago. Jake promised to square the beef. He's in a bad spot for it now. Maybe. Janine has no safety deposit box. Oh, that was my out. Perhaps you can take up folk dancing in prison. I'll send you diagrams of new steps from time to time. Uh... Fidello has a safety deposit box, though. Yeah? Yeah, he's got a lot of money floating around somewhere. Well, well. And a lot of women doing the same thing. Well, we're getting a better shuffle now. Is the girl's name Freddie Sims? That's right. Fidello loves her like the last 15 minutes of life. That's why he won't like it. Get to the point, huh? She's supposed to be waiting for him, but she's got married in Mexico to a guy named Mike Trevor, Fidello's best friend. Does it make sense? No, it doesn't. Suppose Jake's found out about his sweetheart and best friend. Why would he kill Deneen? I don't know, except you'll find out, Patsy, that sometimes the difference between your best friend and your worst enemy is only a matter of opportunity. Yeah, Novak talking. Yeah, how's the dent in your forehead? Oh, you get around, Hellman. Yeah, we picked her up at your apartment. Did she tell you about that key? A little. She made a confession, too. She's generous. Not to Mike Trevor. She pinned the whole thing on him and signed a statement. I'm going out to pick him up now. I'll see you in ten minutes. Why? In case he wants to shoot somebody, I'm offering you. Things were moving fast now. I sent Jocko down to start repair work on the boat, and Hellman picked me up five minutes later. We drove out Geary and turned on Van S. Oh, Hellman was real subtle. He stopped right in front of the rooming house where Mike Trevor was living. The girl had mapped it out for him. Trevor was in a first-floor room. It was a quiet neighborhood. But as we opened the front door and started in, I got the idea it was going to be a tough place to get any sleep for the next few minutes. Down on the right side here. Stay ahead of me, Novak. You're one copper who will die in bed, Hellman. Down the hall and be quiet. Yeah, this is it. On this lap, you go first. Stand back while I throw it open. Not empty, Hellman. Girl said he was here. Now, what's that? Your boy's up at the top of the stairs. Did you see him? Well, he's not wearing neon pants. Go up and get him. Come on down, Trevor. Your girl talked. Come on down and sign a confession. I've got a better idea, Copper. You come up and hand me the pen. All right, Novak. Move over, Hellman. He's going to argue. He's heading for the roof. Let's go. Hold it, Hellman. If that door up there is locked, we'll run right through the barrel. You get one more chance, Trevor. Come on down. That roof door is locked. All right, Copper, I'm coming down. Make a hole. Now you got your hole, Trevor. Yeah. 
Novak. You better get to that safety deposit box. Get there in a hurry. Before the girl. Well, the city opens them now, Hellman. Let's get to that safety deposit box. Let her have the key. What do you care, Novak? She's Fidella's girl. No, no. There's a queer twist here somewhere. How do you know what's in that box? So, Fidella's in love with the girl. He's grateful. What do you care? That's what makes it good. That's the way it is with love and gratitude. The love goes on, Hellman, but the gratitude changes. Well, the way things stood, there was only one place that key could be. I got to a phone and called Jocko. I told him to check out on the boat for a key somewhere on the floorboards. Jocko seemed happy when he said that some girl had come by 15 minutes ago and nosed around the boat for a while. Well, Hellman and I rushed down to the bank. When we got downstairs, Freddie was just starting into the vault. Hello, Patsy. You look rested. If you're on your way to that deposit box, you better think it over. Can he stop me, Copper? No, but we can hold the dough until we check with Fidello. Go ahead. I don't think he's going to like it. Oh, we'll have to see. I'll be back in a moment. Let's go, Novak. We can hold the door upstairs. No, let's hang around. I just want to see 18 karat greed when she opens that box. There's the gratitude helmet. Well, Patsy, I got the key, huh? Yeah, you got everything, Angel. How about Mike? What happened to him? He beats you over the line by 20 minutes. Oh, that's a nice way to let me know, anyway. I'll try again, because you don't rate a nice way. You're not worth anything Fidello ever had. I started an argument. I couldn't finish it. I was wrong about one thing, Angel. When I said Fidello wouldn't like this, I think he will. Yeah. He was a key. Fidello was a thorough guy. The way he told Hellman, everything worked out but the right inning. Fidello found out about the girl and Mike Trevor, so he pulled a switch. He hired his enemy, Joe Deneen, to do the job. Deneen planted the bomb in the safety deposit box, and just to prove it was a square pitch, Fidello gave Deneen a gun with his prints on it. Deneen was supposed to kill the girl and leave the key for Mike to blow his head off. And just to make it clean, Fidello got in touch with Mike on the side and told him to look up Deneen if anything happened to the girl. That way, he figured to wrap up all three of them. But Mike jumped the gun. He started tailing Deneen and shot him up out in the bay. He followed him to my place and killed him with the fingerprinted gun Deneen was carrying. Deneen didn't get onto the double cross, but he called the girl and told her there was a lot of money in that safety deposit box. It began to look awfully big, so the girl finally double crossed Mike Trevor and turned him in. If Trevor killed those two guys in the pier, and he'd have lost Deneen in the fog, and when he drove up, a couple of gunsels around got scared. Well, Hellman asked only one question What could that girl have said to Jocko to make him let her walk in and breeze out with that key? I mentioned that to Jocko, but he just smiled. The American Broadcasting Company has just brought you Pat Novak for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Pat Novak is directed and produced by William P. Rousseau. Jocko Madigan is played by Tudor Owen. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Adler. In our cast were Yvonne Fatey, Tal Avery, Harley Bear, and Herb Ellis. This program is being released to our servicemen and women overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is George Fenneman inviting you to be with us again next week when over most of these same ABC stations we'll bring you Pat Novak for Hire. The program came to you from Hollywood. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. presents the 
Screen Guild Players. The Screen Guild play tonight, The Maltese Falcon. The starring players, this is Humphrey Bogart. This is Mary Astor. This is Sidney Greenstreet. And this is Peter Laurie. Tonight, Lady Esther presents the Screen Guild players in Warner Brothers' sensational mystery story, The Maltese Falcon. It stars Humphrey Bogart as private detective Sam Spade, Mary Astor as Miss Wonderly, Sidney Greenstreet as Casper Gutman, and Peter Laurie as Joel Cairo. <laughs> This is the story of the Maltese Falcon and of the people whose lives it touched and seared. It began in San Francisco when a beautiful young woman who identified herself as Miss Wonderly walked into the offices of Spade and Archer, private detectives. Miss Wonderly had just told Sam Spade why she wished to engage detectives when Spade's partner, Miles Archer, entered the office. Oh, excuse me, Sam. Well, it's all right, Miles, come in. Miss Wonderly, this is Miles Archer, my partner. How do you do? Oh, I'm pleased to meet you. Miss Wonderly's sister ran away from New York with a fellow named Floyd Thursby. They're here in San Francisco. Miss Wonderly has seen Thursby and has a date with him tonight. Maybe he'll bring the sister with him. The chances are he won't. Miss Wonderly wants us to find the sister, get her away from Thursby and back home. But I want you to know that he's a dangerous man. I don't think he'd stop at anything. I don't believe he'd hesitate to kill Corinne, my sister, if he thought it would save him. Uh-huh. What time is he coming to see you, Miss Wonderly? After 8 o'clock. All right, Miss Wonderly, we'll have a man there. Oh, I'll look after it myself. Thank you, Mr. Archer. Will uh, $200 be enough for a retainer? Well, plenty. Oh, it'll help if you meet Thursby in your hotel lobby, Miss Wonderly. I will. Thank you again. Goodbye. Well, Archer, what do you think of her? Sweet. <laughs> I'm going to enjoy shadowing her. Okay, sucker. You call me if you run into any trouble. Hello? Yes, this is Spade. This is Lieutenant Dundee, Spade. Well, what's on your mind, Copper? I thought you might be interested in knowing that your partner, Archer, was found in an alley near the St. Mark, shot through the heart from close range. Last burnt his coat. Can he down for a look at him before he's moved? No. You've seen everything I could. His gun was tucked away on his hip. It hadn't been fired. His overcoat was buttoned. Was he working, Sam? Well? He was supposed to be tailing a fellow named Floyd Thursby. What for? But I don't crowd me. I'll see you after I break the news to Archer's wife. I'll be there in a couple of hours. <laughs> Copper, come on in. Break the news to Archer's wife, Sam? Uh-huh. What kind of a gun do you carry? None. I don't like them much. You don't just happen to have one on you. Search me. Turn the dump upside down if you want to. I won't squawk if you got a search warrant. Why were you tailing Floyd Thursby, Sam? I wasn't. Archer was. For the swell reason that we had a client who was paying good money to have him tailed. Who's the client? Sorry, I can't tell you that. You didn't go to Archer's house to tell his wife. I called up and the girl from your office was there and she said you told her to go. What are you leading up to? Just this, Spade. Floyd Thursby was shot down in front of his hotel about a half an hour after I talked to you. Oh. I came into my apartment just a few minutes ahead of you. I was walking around, thinking things over. I knew you weren't here. I tried to get you on the phone. Where'd you walk to? Just around. Thursby die? Yeah. How'd I kill him? I forget. He was shot four times in the back. Hotel people know anything about him? Nothing. Except he'd been there a week. Alone? Alone. You find out who he was, what his game was? No, I thought you could tell me that. <laughs> I've never seen Thursby dead or alive. Now, look, Spade, you know me. If you did get Thursby, you'll get a square deal from me. 
and most of the breaks. I don't know that I'd blame you a lot, man that kills your partner, but that wouldn't keep me from nailing you. That's fair enough. Now, would you mind scramming? I got some thinking to do, and I'd like to get a little sleep before daylight. <laughs> Yeah, this is Sam Spade. Oh, I was just going to call you. Where are you? Well, the Coronet on California Street, apartment 101. What's that? The name's Miss LeBlanc. <laughs> okay, I'll I'll be right out. <laughs> I have a terrible, terrible confession to make. That, uh, that story I told you yesterday was all just a story. <laughs> oh, that. Well, uh, <laughs> we didn't exactly believe your story, Miss, uh, is your name Wonderly or LeBlanc? It's really O'Shaughnessy, Bridget O'Shaughnessy. Oh. Well, Miss O'Shaughnessy, as I said, we, we didn't exactly believe your story. We believed your $200. Oh? Yes, you see, you paid us too much to be telling the truth. You knew that when you accepted the money? Oh, I suspected it. I was positive when Joel Cairo called on me. Joel Cairo? Yeah. Yeah, he seems interested in Floyd Thursby, too. What did he say? About what? About me? Nothing. Well, what did he talk about? Well, he offered me $5,000 for a black statuette of a bird. He was pretty sure I had it or knew where it was. Do you? Oh, well, I think I know someone who does, and... $5,000 is a lot of money. But right now, the police are trying to find out who hired us to tail Floyd Thursby. Mr. Spade, do they know about me? No, oh, I don't think they do. I've been able to stall them so far. Must they know about me at all, Mr. Spade? Couldn't you manage somehow to shield me from them? Maybe. But I'll have to know what it's all about. I can't tell you now. Later I will, when I can. You must trust me, Mr. Spade. Oh, I, I'm so alone and afraid... I've got nobody to help me if you won't help me. Be generous, Mr. Spade. You're strong. You're brave. You can spare me some of that strength and courage, surely. <laughs> Sister, you don't need much of anybody's help. You're good. Chiefly your eyes, I think, and that throb you get in your voice when you say things like, be generous, Mr. Spade. All right. I deserve that. But the lie was in the way I said it. And not at all in what I said. Ah, now you are dangerous. Still, Cairo offered me $5,000. Far more than I could ever offer you if I must bid for your life. And <laughs> yeah, that's good coming from you. Have you given me any of your confidence, any of the truth? I can't go ahead without more confidence in you than I have now. Can't you trust me just a little while? Well, how much is a little? And what are you waiting for? I must talk to Joe Cairo. Oh. Well, you can see him tonight. I know where to reach him. Oh, he can't come here. I can't let him know where I am. I'm, I'm afraid. Well, we'll all meet at my place, then. All right. <laughs> I'm delighted to see you again, Mr. Shaughnessy. I was sure you would be, Joe. Mr. Spade told me about your offer for the multi falcon. How soon can you have the money ready? Oh, it is ready. You are ready to give us $5,000 if we turn the falcon over to you? I shall be able to give you the money as soon as uh, the bank opens in the morning. But I haven't got the falcon. Then why did you send for me? Because I'll have it in another week. Yes? Where is it? Where Floyd hid it. If you know where he hid it, why, why must we wait a week? And why are you willing to sell it to me? I'm afraid. After what happened to Floyd, I'm afraid to touch it except to turn it over to somebody else right away. Exactly what did happen to Floyd? The fat man. Gutman? Is he here? I don't know. I suppose so. Uh, if you two let me interrupt for a second, I can answer that. Gutman is here. How do you know? Because he called me and asked me to see him. Have you? Not yet. I thought that after our friend Cairo here left, I'd find out just how you and I stand before I took on any more clients. <laughs> Do you know 
how you and I stand, Sam. Yeah. If I can believe anything about you. But you're such a liar. I am a liar. I've always been a liar. <laughs> but I, I wouldn't brag about it. Was there any truth at all in that yarn you were telling me about Thursby and the Falcon? Some. Not very much. Well, we've got all night before us. Oh, I'm, I'm so tired. So tired of lying and thinking up lies and not knowing what is a lie and what is the truth. I wish... Now look, honey. I think I'd better have a talk with Gutman in the morning. <laughs> Now, Mr. Gutman, shall we talk about the Falcon? <laughs> oh, by all means, Mr. Spade. But first, sir, answer me a question. Are you here as Mr. O'Shaughnessy's representative? Well, there's nothing certain about it either way yet. It depends. Maybe it depends on Joel Cairo? Maybe. The question then, Mr. Spade, is which you'll represent. It will be Mr. O'Shaughnessy or Mr. Cairo? I didn't say so. Who else is there? There's me. <laughs> oh, well, that's wonderful, sir, wonderful. I do like a man who tells you right out he's looking out for himself, don't we all? Uh-huh. Now let's talk about the Blackbird. Let's, Mr. Spade. Have you any conception of how much money can be got out of that Blackbird? No, but you just tell me what it is and I'll figure out the profits. You mean you don't know what that bird is? Well, I know it's black enamel and about a foot high and I know the value in human life you people put on it. Mr. O'Shaughnessy didn't tell you what it is? He offered and me... Cairo didn't either? He offered me 10000 for it. Do either of them know what that bird is, sir? What is your impression? Well, there's not much to go by, but uh, I don't think so. If they don't know, I'm the only one in the whole wide, sweet world who does. Good. And when you tell me, there'll be two of us. <laughs> Mathematically correct, sir. But I don't know for certain that I'm going to tell you. Well, you think again and think fast. You'll do your talking today. You're through. What are you wasting my time for? I can get along without you. That remains to be seen, Mr. Spade. There are ways. And there's another thing. Keep that gunman of yours away from me while you're making up your mind or I'll kill him. <laughs> well, sir, I must say you have a very violent temper. Take it over. You got till 5.30. Then you're either in or out for keeps. Wilma. I'm going to kill that guy. I could have done it easy when he was standing there with his back to me. Of course you could, my boy. But business before pleasure. And we'll be seeing Mr. Spade again before 5.30. <laughs> so ends Act One of the Maltese Falcon, starring Peter Lorre, Sidney Greenstreet, Mary Astor, and Humphrey Bogart. Act Two in just a moment. But first, here's a word from our hostess, Lady Esther. Some weeks ago, I was being shown through a shipyard, one of the largest in the country and stopped to chat with a young woman wearing a safety mask. It gave her a stern, rather severe look. But when she removed the mask to chat with me, she was young and blonde and very lovely. Her skin looked so dainty and fresh that I just couldn't resist saying, my, you look as though you just stepped out of a bandbox. She laughed and said, oh, wife, I've been on the job since early this morning and I haven't even had time to repowder my face. But after all, I do use your powder, you know. Of course, she's only one of millions of busy, important women who use Lady Esther face powder, partly because of its remarkable clinging quality. They explain that when they use Lady Esther face powder, they have the comfortable feeling that their skin always looks smooth and fresh, never streaked, caked, or shiny. But that's only one of the reasons why more lovely women now use Lady Esther face powder than any other kind. There are two other important reasons. First, the texture of my powder is so flattering that it hides little lines and blemishes, makes your skin look younger. And second, the shades of Lady Esther face powder are so rich, vivid, and alive, they give new interest, a look of new beauty to your skin. And both the unusual texture and the flattering shades are the result of my patented twin hurricane method of making face powder. So if you'd like to have your skin look softer, smoother, younger, and look that way for hours at a time. Just try Lady Esther face powder. And now the curtain rises.
passes on the second act of the Maltese Falcon, starring Humphrey Bogart as Sam Speed, Mary Astor as Bridget O'Shaughnessy, Sidney Greenstreet as Casper Gutman, the fat man, and Peter Lorre as Joel Cairo. <laughs> Afternoon following Sam Spade's visit to Gutman's apartment, a dying man staggered into Spade's office and collapsed on the floor. He died before he could speak to Spade, but his papers identified him as Captain Jacoby of the steamship La Paloma, and clutched to his bullet torn chest was the Maltese Falcon. After depositing the Falcon in a railroad station check room and mailing the identification check to his private post office box, Sam met Bridget O'Shaughnessy and took her to his apartment. You know, Sam, I never would have placed myself in this position if I hadn't trusted you completely. Oh, oh that again. But you know that's so. Uh, you don't have to trust me as long as you can persuade me to trust you. But Sam, darling. Oh, well, I think we'd better let it go at that until we see what happens after Gutman gets here. The fat man? Here? Certainly, why not? Anyway, that should be him. So it's too late to change our plans. I'll be right back. Oh, hello, Gutman. Good evening, sir. I see you brought company. I can understand the gunman, but I didn't know Cairo was a friend of yours. Oh, we're old acquaintances. Now that we're all here, let's go in and sit down and be comfortable and talk. Oh, sure. Come on in. Now, look, Angel. Gutman brought a couple of friends along. Good evening, Mr. Shaughnessy. Hello, Joe. You look unusually charming this evening, my dear. Thanks. The uh, gunsel doesn't talk, Angel. Get away from me, punk. Stand still and shut up. Listen, you're not going to frisk me, touch me, and I'm going to make you use that gun. Ask your boss if he wants me shut up before we talk. Never mind, Wilma. <laughs> you're certainly a most headstrong and unpredictable individual, Mr. Spade. Now, why did you send for me? You ready to make the first payment and take the falcon off my hands? The falcon? That's right, Angel. I've got it. Well, sir, I have in this envelope $10,000. 10000 Well, we were talking about more money than that. Yes, sir, we were, but there are more of us to be taken care of now. <laughs> well, that may be, but I've got the falcon. I shouldn't think it would be necessary to remind you, Mr. Speed, that uh, though you may have the falcon, yet we certainly have you. Yes, I'm trying not to let that worry me, but uh, let the money wait. There's another thing to be taken care of first. We've got to have a fall guy. A bigger pardon? Police have got to have a victim, somebody they can stick for those three murders. Two, two, only two murders, Mr. Speed. Thursby undoubtedly killed your partner. All right, all right, too, then. Now, the point I've got to give the police a victim when the time comes. If I don't, I'll be it. Uh, let's give him, uh, let's give him Wilmer here. Why, you dirty He rats. actually did shoot Thursby and Jacoby, didn't he? Anyway, he's made to order for the part. Let's turn him over to them. <laughs> By God, so you are a character, that you are. <laughs> There's ever, never any telling what you'll say or do next except that it's bound to be something astonishing. Well, it's our best bet. With him in their hands, the police will forget the rest of us. Your plan is not at all practical, sir. Let's not say anything more about it. All right. I have another suggestion. Let's give him Cairo. Well, by God, sir. Suppose we give him you, Mr. Spade, or, or Mr. Shaughnessy. How about that, huh? Sam, you wouldn't. You people want the fork, and I've got it. The fall guy is part of the price I'm insisting on. You seem to forget you're not in a position to insist on anything. No? If you kill me... How are you going to get the falcon? Hey, Gad, sir, you are a character. <laughs> well? Well, what else can I do? I'm sorry, Wilma. Terribly sorry. I want you to know that I couldn't be any fonder of you if you were my own son. But, well, if you lose a son, it's possible to get another. And there's only one Maltese falcon. You rat, I'll kill you for this! <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Spade. When you're as young as Wilma, one simply doesn't understand these things. <laughs> And how about some coffee, Bridget? Put the pot on, will you? I don't like to leave my guests. Charlie, anything to get out of here. Now, sir, let's get down to business. I ought to have more than 10000 Of course, sir, you understand this is the first payment. You still don't understand the falcon's worth. Well, a black enamel bird can't be worth millions. But it is. Otherwise, I should not have spent 17 years of my life trying to acquire it. The black enamel you refer to, sir, is merely camouflage covering a solid gold bird encrusted from head to foot with the finest jewel. Okay. So I get millions later. How's about 15,000 now? Frankly and candidly, and on my word of honor as a gentleman, 
10,000 I gave you is all the money I can raise right now. But you didn't say positively. <laughs> positively. Well, if that's the best you can do, it's the best you can do. But it's understood the punk has to stand as the fall guy. That is part of our agreement, sir. Okay, I'll make a phone call. The falcon will be here in an hour. <laughs> Not the Maltese falcon. This is a lead imitation covered with the same enamel. See where I've shaved it off with a knife lead? Your lead. You bungled it. You, Gutman. You and your stupid attempt to buy it from the Russian who owned it. He caught on to how valuable it was. No wonder we had so little trouble stealing it. You, you imbecile. You, you bloated idiot. Well, sir, what do you suggest? Shall we stand here and shed tears and call each other names? Mm -hmm. Or shall we pay the Russian another call in Istanbul? Uh, are you going? Seventeen years I've wanted that little item, and I intend to get it. Another year? Well, sir, that will be an additional expenditure of time on only five and fifteen seventeenths percent. I, I go with you. Good. And Wilma? Wilma, he Where? Where is the boy? He must have had made his getaway while we were unwrapping the fog. A swell lot of thieves. Well, sir? I left to ask you to return my 10,000. I held up my end. It's your hard luck, not mine, if you didn't get what you wanted. I'm sorry, but I must insist. Oh, a uh, hideout gun, huh? Okay. Thank you, sir. The shortest farewells are the best. Adieu. And to you, Miss O'Shaughnessy, I leave the fake fault and falcon as a little memento. <laughs> Come, sir. Hello, police department. Lieutenant Dundee there, put him on. Tell him Sam Spade's calling. Now look, Angel. Gutman and Cairo will talk when the cops nail them about us. We've only got minutes to get set for the police. Now give me your whole story fast. Well, where... where shall I begin? Uh, the day you first came to my office. Why did you want Thursby shadowed? I, I suspected him of betraying me to Gutman, and I wanted to find That's out. That's a lie. Gutman tried to make a deal with him. You had Thursby hooked, and you knew it. You wanted to get him out of the way before Captain Jacoby arrived with the falcon. Isn't that so? What was your scheme? I thought if he saw someone following him, he might be frightened into going away. Now look, Archer hadn't many brains, but he wasn't clumsy enough to be spotted the first night. You must have told Thursby he was being followed. I told him. Yes. But please believe me, Sam. I wouldn't have told him if I'd thought Floyd would kill him. If you thought he wouldn't kill Archie, you were right, Angel. Didn't he? Archie had been a detective too long to be caught shadowing a man up a blind alley with his gun tucked away in his hip and his overcoat button. But he'd have gone up there with you, Angel. He was just dumb enough for that. Sam. And then you could have stood as close to him as you liked there in the dark. Put a hole through him with a gun you'd gotten from Thursby that evening. Don't, don't talk to me like that, Sam. You know I didn't. Now, the police will be blowing in any minute now, Angel. Talk. No, oh, why do you accuse me of such a terrible... Why did you shoot Archer? thought Thursby would tackle him and one or the other would go down. If Thursby was killed, then you were rid of him. If it was Archer, then you could see that Thursby was caught. Was that it? Something. And when something you find like out that. that Thursby didn't mean to tackle Archer, you borrowed the gun and did it yourself, right? I guess so. I know so. You didn't know Gutman was here looking for you until you learned Thursby was shot. Then you needed another protector. So you came back to me. Yes, but... No, oh, sweetheart, it wasn't only that. I, I would have come back to you sooner or later. From the very first instant I saw you, I knew that... You ain't. Well, if you get a good break, you'll be out of San Quentin in 20 years. Sam, you're not... Yes, Angel. I'm going to send you over. But if they hang you, I'll always remember you. Don't, Sam. Don't say that. Even in fun. It's not fun. I happen to be in the detective business, and you killed my partner. Bad business to... Let the killer get away with it. Bad for every detective in this country. You're taking the fall. You've been playing with me. Only pretending you cared to trap me like this. You didn't care at all. You don't love me. Uh, I... I think I do. But what of it? I won't play the sap for you. You know it's not like that. You can't say that. I am saying it. You know down deep in your heart, you know that in spite of everything I've done, I love you. I don't care who loves who. You killed Archer. 
You're going over for it. Come in. Oh, hello, copper. Hello, Sam. You got Gutman in Cairo? We got Cairo. Gutman's dead. Kid Wilmer had just finished shooting him when we got there. So I ought to have expected that. You better put the cuffs on Angel, copper. We're taking her down to the station. What charge? Damn. Murder. She shot Miles Archer. Oh, and you better bring that blackbird along, too, copper. It's part of the evidence against Cairo. Hey, this is heavy. What's it made of? The uh, stuff that dreams are made of. And so ends the story of the Maltese Falcon. Thank you, Mary Astor, Humphrey Bogart, Sidney Greenstreet, and Peter Laurie for appearing with the Lady Esther Screen Guild players tonight and also for telling us the most exciting story. It was our pleasure, Mr. Bradley. We all had a wonderful time making the picture and the radio version tonight brought back some wonderful memories. Then, too, knowing that the benefits from these programs that support the motion picture country house and clinic give us an added incentive. And now, before we tell you about next week's program, here's a word from one of America's best-known beauty authorities, Lady Esther. Thank you, Miss Arthur. Ladies, you know it's surprising the number of letters new users of Lady Esther face powder have sent me in the last few months. So many of them say the same thing, that Lady Esther face powder is an entirely different kind of powder, that it does wonderful things for the appearance of the skin, <clears throat> makes it look softer, smoother, and often years younger. Well, Lady Esther face powder is more flattering, more becoming, because my powder isn't just mixed just blended like ordinary face powder. It's made by a method new, unique, exclusively mine. You see, Lady Esther face powder is blown at whirling speed by my famous twin hurricanes. Yes, my patented twin hurricane process blows and whips color and powder particles together until they're evenly married, blended into a fine, smooth, sheer mist of beauty finer in texture and truer in shade than powder ever made by ordinary methods. That's why Lady Esther face powder smooths on so much more evenly, and why the shades of my powder are so clear and alive, they make your skin younger looking, more vivid, far lovelier. Why don't you try Lady Esther face powder and see how much happier you'll be with the appearance of your skin? <laughs> Before we tell you about next week's program, Humphrey Bogart has a word to say from our government. As you all know, the third war loan drive is on full steam. The drive to back the attack our fighting forces are making against our enemies. As our share toward victory, we at home must buy $15 billion worth of war bonds, which means each one of us must dig down deeper into our own pockets. Each of us must buy at least one extra bond this month. We have to win this war, and we will win, all right. But how soon we win is up to every one of us. So buy an extra war bond this week, sure, to help speed our day to victory. Next week, the Lady Esther Screen Guild players will present highlights from Warner Brothers' great new musical picture, Thank Your Lucky Stars. It will star Joan Leslie, Dennis Morgan, Diana Shore, and Eddie Cantor. Be sure to listen. Humphrey Bogart can soon be seen in the Warner Brothers production, Thank Your Lucky Stars. Mary Astor is currently playing in the Metro-Golden-Mayer Technicolor production, Thousands Cheer. Sidney Greenstreet and Peter Laurie appeared through the courtesy of Warner Brothers. Music on tonight's program was arranged and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. To help your government save tin, buy the larger size of Lady Esther face cream, and at the same time, you will save yourself money to invest in war bonds and stamps. Truman Bradley speaking for Lady Esther. Thank you. Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Theater Guild on the air. Our stars, Josephine Hull and Kenny Delmar. Our play, You Can't Take It With You. Produced by the Theater Guild, one of America's foremost theatrical producers.
Good evening, everyone. You Can't Take It With You by George S. Kaufman and Moss Hart was a great success on Broadway and was tremendously popular as a motion picture. Josephine Hull, currently starring in Harvey, will recreate the role of Penny Sycamore, which she played in the original cast. Kenny Delmar, the famous Senator Claghorn of the Fred Allen program, will play Grandpa Vanderhoff. Carol Stone plays Alice, and Paula Truman, also of the original Broadway cast, will play Essie. Now, meet the Sycamores. In every city and county in the United States, in almost every village and township, you'll find one particular family considered by everybody else to be just a little touched in the head. Let's consider a case in point, the Sycamore family. First, there's Grandpa, whose name isn't Sycamore at all, but Vanderhoff. Grandpa keeps snakes and likes to talk to them. His favorite is an Arizona rattler named Terrence. Uh, good morning, Terrence. How are you feeling this morning? <laughs> well, that's fine. Tell me, Terrence, aren't you glad you're a snake instead of a human being? <laughs> and then there's Mrs. Penny Sycamore, Grandpa's daughter. One afternoon, about eight years ago, without any explanation whatsoever, Penny decided to write a play. Why? Well, let's ask her. Penny, uh, what made you take up playwriting? It's very simple. A man delivered a typewriter by mistake. I see. Well, <laughs> how many plays have you written? Forty-seven. Mm -hmm. Ever had any produced? Oh, is that what you're supposed to do with them? As for the rest of the Sycamore family, well, uh, Paul, Penny's husband, makes firecrackers down in the cellar. Essie, their daughter, sings, and Ed, uh, that's Essie's husband, uh, plays the xylophone. Alice, the unmarried daughter who works on Wall Street, is the one conventional member of the family, while the rest concentrate on getting fun out of life. Maybe they're crazy. But then again, maybe they're not. Maybe it's just barely possible that you and I are. Well, here they are, in the combination dining and living room of their brownstone house in New York City. Ladies and gentlemen, come in and meet the Sycamores. Ed, you're getting better on that xylophone every day. I like the music, too. Yours? No, Beethoven. Got a lot of you in it. Oh, Ed, I finished that new batch of candies this afternoon. You know what I call them? Love dreams. Gee, that's pretty. You can take them around and sell them tonight. All right. Now get this finished, Essie. This is me. Hey, Ed. Hey, cut it out. You're scaring my snake. Sorry, Grandpa. First thing you know, they'll be shedding their skins again, and then I'll never be able to tell when it's spring. Oh, Ed, dear. Yes, Mother Sycamore? I was just thinking, why don't you and Essie have a baby? Oh, I don't know. We could have one if you wanted us to. What about it, Essie? Do you want to have a baby? Oh, I don't care. <laughs> I'm willing, if Grandpa is. Grandpa, what are you doing? What? Oh, uh, please, Essie, not now. The snakes are nervous. <laughs> Penny, whatever made you bring that up? Uh, well, dear, in this play I'm writing, Cynthia is alone in an air raid shelter with 40 sailors, and I just got to thinking... Oh, Paul, dear. How are the firecrackers coming? Oh, it's fine, Penny, fine. Just invented a double-action whiz-bang. Sell like a house of fire. Just when you think it's over and stoop to pick it up, bang! Starts all over again. <laughs> Grandpa, did you get that letter for you? Letter for me, Essie? I don't know anybody. Had your name on it. Where's Grandpa's letter in? I guess I put it down someplace. We'll run across it. I think I'll do a little printing on my printing press, Essie. Some wrappers for the love dream. Uh, who was the letter from? Did anybody notice? The United States government. Oh. There was one before that, too, from the same people. Really? Wonder what they wanted. What are you printing, Ed? God is the state. The state is God. Who says that? Trotsky. Well, that's all right. I thought you said it. <laughs> I found it in a book I picked out of an ash can about the Russian Revolution. Nice for printing, you know. Good and short. G-O-D space I-S. Good evening, Tammy. It's Alice. Oh, Alice, dear, you're home early. 
Have a hard day at the office. Where's my kids? <laughs> Here you are, Grandpa. Well, what's new around here? Ed, play Alice that Beethoven thing you wrote. Certainly, yes. No, not now, dear. I've got a dress. A young gentleman is taking me to dinner. Really? Mm -hmm. Who is he? Well, I did everything possible to keep him from coming here, but he's calling for me. Well, isn't that nice? Now, don't read him any plays, Mother. Oh? And don't let a snake bite him, Grandpa, because I like him. Yeah. And I wouldn't sing for him, Effie, because he's taking me to the Metropolitan Opera House tonight. Well, you can't do anything. Who is he? President of the United States? <laughs> no. No, Grandpa. He's vice president of Kirby and Company. Mr. Anthony Kirby, Jr. The boss is so uh -huh. well. Are you going to marry him, Alice? Oh, of course. Any minute now. Well, will you let me know the minute he comes, Mother? Of course, dear. And I mean the minute he comes. Well, what do you think of that? Well, she seems to like him, if you ask me. Listen, everybody. Wouldn't it be wonderful if she married him? We could have the wedding right here in this room. Now, wait a minute, Penny. This is the first time he ever called for the girl. The boss is dumb. I think he's crazy about her. Oh, there he is. Now, remember, everybody, what Alice said. And is very nice to him. Oh, welcome to our little house, Mr. Kirby. I'm Alice's mother. Do come right in. I'm afraid you must be making a mistake. Oh, no. We know all about you, Mr. Kirby. Do you mind if I call you Tony? Madam, this is my business card. Would you mind reading it? Oh, not at all. Wilbur C. Henderson, Internal Revenue Department. Oh. Does a Mr. Martin Vanderhoff live here? Yes, sir, that's me. Well, Mr. Vanderhoff, the United States government wants to talk to you about a little matter of income tax. Income tax? Oh, dear, couldn't you postpone it and come around next year? You see, my daughter's fiancé... No, madam, I cannot postpone it. The United States government is not in the habit... All right, Mr. Henderson, keep your shirt on. I you suppose the United States government would be insulted if I asked you to step into the kitchen? Why, no, not at all. Very well, then, follow me. <laughs> now, Mr. Henderson. Mr. Vanderhoff, according to our records, you have never paid an income tax. That's right. Why not? I don't believe in it. <laughs> well, you've got a business, haven't you, that gives you an income? No, sir. Haven't had one for 35 years. You mean you haven't had any salary or commission or earned increment in that time? No, sir. Way back in the year 1911, I had one. Yes, sir, I was in the thick of the battle. Biting, scratching, clawing, regular jungle stuff. And then one day, as I was about to take the elevator up to my office, a thought suddenly occurred to me. If I kept on working like a dog for the next 40 years, I'd die a rich man. But I wouldn't have any fun. So I turned around and came home. I haven't been back since. Well, you own property, don't you, from which you receive a yearly income of about $3,000? Yeah, about that. Well, it seems, Mr. Vanderhoff, that you owe the government back taxes for 32 years. Or ever since the income tax law was passed. You know, Mr. Vanderhoff, there's quite a penalty for not filing an income tax return. Is there? People have gone to jail, you know. Have they? What for? Well, never mind. Look, suppose I pay you this money. Now, mind you, I don't say I'm going to pay it, but just for the sake of argument. What's the government going to do with it? What do you mean? Well, what do I get for my money? If I go into a department store and buy something, there it is. I see it. What's the government give me? Why, the government gives you everything. It protects you. From what? Invasion. Uh, that's what they said before. Hitler's dead. Who's going to invade us now? Puerto Rico? <laughs> well, what about the Senate, Congress, and the Supreme Court? You've got to pay them, don't you? Not with my money, no, sir. <laughs> now, wait a minute. I'm not here to argue with you. All I know is that you haven't paid an income tax and you've got to pay it. They've got to show me. We don't have to show you. I just told you. All those buildings down in Washington... Interstate commerce and everything. Uh, by the way, what is interstate commerce? <laughs> there are 48 states, see? And if there weren't interstate commerce, nothing could go from one state to another, see? Why not? They got fences? 
<laughs> no, they haven't got fences. They've got law. Great jumping G hospital. I never came across anything like this before. Well, I might pay about $75, but that's all it's worth. You'll pay every cent of it like everybody else. And let me tell you something else, Mr. Van Hoff. You go to jail if you don't pay. Do you hear that? There's a law. And if you think you're bigger than the law, drop. Great jump. What's that thing crawling on the floor? Only a rattlesnake. Come here, Terrence. Only. Go on, Terrence. Bite the United States government. Let me out of here. Let me out of here. Me... Uh, goodbye, Mr. Henderson. Now, uh, Terrence, come on up on Grandpa's lap. That's a good boy. <laughs> well, now we can all go back in the parlor and wait for Alice's young man, Mr. Kirby. <laughs> Kirby, just sit right down over here. Oh, I'll just get these firecrackers out of the way. Is that Mr. Kirby, Mother? Yes, Allison, he's lovely. I'll be right down. I, uh, I hope I'm not keeping you from dinner. Oh, no, no, not at all. Oh, uh, by the way, Mr. Kirby. Yes, Mr. Sycamore? Wasn't I reading about your father being indicted the other day? Well, hardly that, Mr. Sycamore. He just testified before the Securities Commission. He's in Wall Street, you know. Yes, oh. of course. I'm sure there was nothing crooked about it, Paul, dear. You're awful young, Mr. Kirby, aren't you? To be vice president of a big place like that. Now, Essie, I think vice president's a very nice place. To start. I suppose you make enough to get married on, Mr. Kirby. Well, I... Well, here I am, Tony. I see you've had time to get acquainted. Oh, yes, Alice, dear. Mr. Kirby and I were just having a delightful talk about love and marriage. Oh, dear. I'm sorry, Tony. I came down as fast as I could. Oh, that must be Professor Kalenkoff, my voice teacher. I'll answer it. You just adore Professor Kalenkoff, Mr. Kirby. Ah, my little songbird, my nightingale. Come here, Mr. Kalenkoff. I'm so hungry I could eat even cornflakes for dinner. That's what you're going to get, Mr. Kalenkoff. With fair ribs and ice cream. Ah, Madame Sycamore <laughs> and my little Alice. Never have I seen you look so flourishing. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Kalenkoff. Tony, this is Mr. Kalenkoff, Essie's vocal teacher. How do you do, sir? I click the heels and bow from the waist. And now we really must go. Excuse us, Mr. Kalenkoff. We're going to the Metropolitan Opera. The Metropolitan Opera? It stinks. <laughs> The Metropolitan Opera. Isn't Mr. Kirby lovely, everybody? Isn't he just... Oh, Esty, is dinner ready? It's all on the table, Mother. Better sit down before the ice cream melts. We're having that first, you know. Well, all right, Esty, all right. You think we had to go to Siberia for it? Mr. Klenkoff, you sit over there next to Ed. The Metropolitan Opera. Jesse, Penny, Paul. Sit down, all of you. My, the cornflakes look nice. Always like cornflakes. Could eat them with every meal. Well, that's what we do, silly. <laughs> Grandpa, if they do get married, can we put the altar where you keep the snake? Can we? <clears throat> Quiet, everybody. Caruso shall up and then you head over. Mr. Klenkoff, please. Grandpa's waiting to say grace. Well, sir, we've been getting along pretty good for quite a while now. We're certainly much obliged. Remember all we ask, just to go along and be happy in our own sort of way. Of course, we want to keep our health. But as far as everything else is concerned, we'll leave that to you. Thank you. <laughs> Midnight at the Sycamores, and all is strangely quiet. The xylophone and printing press rear their ghostly heads, and the slumbering snakes are under the sofa. But the room's not empty of human life. Seated on the sofa, regarding each other fondly, to say the least, are Alice and Tony. Alice, dear. Yes, Tony. Good Lord, what's that? It's just the clock striking 12, dear. 12? Well, it sounds more like 24 to me. <laughs> Dad just fixed it. He loves to fix things. I suppose I ought to go home. I don't want to, you know. I don't want you to, dear. All right, I won't. Alice, someday I won't ever have to go home. I mean, we won't ever have to separate. I mean, would you like that, dear? Very much, darling. Oh, Alice, baby, I... 
Yes, Tony, dear? I... I want to ask you. Is that you, Alice? What time is it? Oh, Mr. Kirby. I didn't I believe the clock just struck 17, Mother. Oh, Mr. Kirby. <laughs> I had no idea. Am I interrupting anything? Not at all, Mr. Sycamore. I just came down for a manuscript. Oh, where is that play? Oh, here it is. Sex takes a holiday. <laughs> well, well, good night, Mr. Kirby. Just go right back to whatever it was you were doing. See now, where were we? Oh, I know. Alice, I want to tell you. Well, that is, I want to ask you something. Wait, Tony, I, I think I know what you're going to say, and, and first I'd like to... Tony, that's only father in the cellar. He's making firecrackers. Firecrackers? This time of night? Any time of night, any time of day. Alice, you're more beautiful, more adorable. No, no, don't fear, please. Tony, Tony, I can't marry you. What? I can't, Tony. But why? Well, I've been thinking about it. Tony, you're of a different world, a whole different kind of people. Oh, I don't mean money or socially, that's too silly, but... But your father and, and mine... Well, it just wouldn't work, Tony. But don't be ridiculous. Why, I love your family, every one of them. They're... Well, they're charming. All right, Essie, have it your own way. She can't sing. Ed, I don't call that singing what she does. Oh, hello, you two. Uh, good evening. Ed and I just saw a movie with Deanna Durbin. Do you think she can sing, Mr. Kirby? Why, yes, I always thought so. Now, look, Mr. Kirby. Okay, Essie, you're just as good as Deanna Durbin. We all agree. But, but... Come on, now, we're butting in here. Good night, Mr. Kirby. Uh, good night. Say, Essie, I just remembered. Did you ask Grandpa about us having a baby? Yes. He said go right ahead. <laughs> well, good night, you two. You see, Tony, that's what it would be like always. Oh, but I didn't mind that. Besides, darling, we're not going to live with our families. It's just you and I. Oh, no, it isn't, Tony. It's never quite that. Oh, I love them, Tony. Some people could cut away, but I know I can't. Oh, I know they do rather strange things, but they're, they're gay and they're fun. And, well, there's a, there's a kind of nobility about them. They're really wonderful, Tony. Well, sure they are. But I know your father. I see him every day at the office. And you just couldn't explain my family to him. He'd never understand. Oh, I love you, Tony, but I love them, too. And it's just no use, oh, dear. Alice, I... It's no use. And they can't change. I don't want them to change. Well, Alice, they don't have to change. And I'm sure my father would love them. Mother, too. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll bring them over here to meet your family. Maybe we could have dinner or something. Oh, Tony, I, I'm afraid. I... Nonsense. Your family's as normal as anybody's, especially Grandpa. Let's make it sometime next week. Say Thursday. Thursday? Thursday it is. And now, how about a kiss? Well, I... Oh, pardon me. Grandpa. Uh, do you mind getting up off that sofa a minute, Mr. Kirby? Thank you. Come on, you shoulder. Come on, Terry. Yeah. Isolde, who are they? Just Grandpa Snake. Snake? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Kirby. Now you two go right on with your romance. Now the curtain rises on the second act of You Can't Take It With You with Josephine Hull as Penny Sycamore and Kenny Delmar as Grandpa. <laughs> afternoon of the following Wednesday. The living room of the Sycamore homestead is as normal as usual. Penny's working on a new play. Essie is practicing her scales. Ed has forsaken the xylophone for the printing press. And his father-in-law, Paul Sycamore, is stretched out on the floor, creating a duplicate of the Eiffel Tower with an erector set. Yes, the Sycamores are at home. Ed! Yes, Essie? I wish you'd stop printing and go out and sell those candies. I will. Just about finished these models I'm printing to wrap around the love dreams. Found some very fascinating thoughts in that political book. Mostly political. Find any interesting new words, Ed? Yeah. 
I don't know what they mean, but they're interesting. Hmm. Proletariat. Say, that's a nice one. Hurry up, Ed. You've got to get back in time to play for me when Kalenkov comes. Oh, hello, Grandpa. What do you mean, hello? Give me a kiss. Kalenkov coming tonight? Yes, tomorrow night's his night, but I had to change it on account of Alice. Oh, big doings around here tomorrow night, eh, Penny? Isn't it exciting? <laughs> you know I'm so nervous. Uh, what do you think he'll be like, Grandpa? His mother and father. Uh, oh, excuse me, Dad. I didn't see you on the floor there. What are you making this time, Paul? The Eiffel Tower? I'm ready to take the love dreams around now, Essie. Would you mind opening the door and see if there's a man standing in front of the house? Why, Ed, whatever for? Well, Mother Sycamore, the last two days when I've been out delivering, I think a man's been following me. Ed, you're crazy. No, Essie, I'm not. He follows me and he stands and watches the house. I'll go out and look, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And don't anyone touch the Eiffel Tower while I'm gone. And why do you suppose anyone would want to follow you for, Ed? Well, there's lots of kidnapping going on, Grandpa. And you got any money, Ed? No. Have I got any money? No. Has anybody in this house got any money? No. Well, I guess they won't be kidnapping you then. There's nobody out there, Ed. Nobody at all. You sure, Dad? Positive. I just saw him walk away. <laughs> you see, Grandpa? Well, I guess the coast is clear now. Ed, be sure and sell every one of those boxes of candy now. Don't worry about me, Essie. I'm a star salesman. I can sell anything to anybody. And you know what my secret is? I size them up. Yes, sir, I study their faces. I say to myself, if I had a face like this guy, would I buy a box of candy? That's the whole secret of selling. Size them up. Well, so long. Now there's a guy. Nice open face. Probably got a mother or a sweetheart somewhere. Say, mister, how'd you like to buy a box of candy? Is it hot? Hot? Why, no, Essie keeps them in the refrigerator overnight. What's in them, happy dust? No, just chocolate and corn syrup, marshmallow, and chopped pistachio nuts. Pistachio nuts, eh? What's the alcoholic content? There's no alcohol in them. You mean they're legit and you want to sell them to me? Sure. Essie makes them. Go on, scram. Okay, okay. Hey, wait a minute. You look like a smart cookie. How'd you like to buy a genuine silver fox fur? That was a bad one. I gotta do better than that, or... There's a guy standing in that doorway. Say, that's the one that's been following me. Hey, you, I got you. Huh? What do you mean by following me? Why, I wasn't following you. I was looking for you. Uh, I want to buy some of your candy. Oh, is that it? Say, mister, I had you all wrong. I well, thought... what kind have you got today? Love dreams. My wife, Essie, just invented them. Here, have a sample. Mm-hmm. That's a nice printing job you do on these wrappers. Do you really mean it? Say, are you a printer? Well, no, but I'm interested in printing. Uh, what do you got on them today? Political models. The Russian Revolution. Speeches by Lenin and Trotsky. Uh, fine, I'll take them all. Say, you're a sport, Mr. Uh, oh, just call me Jack. Okay, Jack. What are you going to do with them all, if I may ask? Oh, it's, it's uh, my wife. <laughs> she likes to eat candy and read in bed. Say, that's a wonderful idea. Wait till I tell Essie. Hey, would you like for me to run home and print some more? Say, could you? Certainly. I'll drop by at your house in about a half an hour. Fine. Don't disappoint me now. Oh, I'll be there. Meanwhile, back at the Sycamore home, Alice has just come in and is telling her family what not to do when the Kirbys come to dinner the following night. Look, Mother, tomorrow night before they come, will you have everything down in the cellar? Uh, the typewriter and the snakes and the, the printing press and the erector set? Certainly, dear. Well, the Kirby's are certainly going to get the wrong impression of this house. Oh, Grandpa, I'm not trying to impress them or pretend we're anything we aren't. I, I just want everything to go off well. Well, there's no reason why it shouldn't, we're Alice. We're going to do everything we can, dear. Oh, my darlings, I love you. You're the most wonderful family in the world. And I'm the happiest girl in the world. I didn't know anybody could be so happy. I'll see you all at dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll have to have someone help us carry all this stuff down the cellar tomorrow, Grandpa. Uh, what we need is one round Louie. Poor Louie. 
What a pity he's dead. He used to be such a help moving things around. How long is it, Grandpa? Uh, it's eight years since we buried him. Oh. Fine man. Came to move the piano and stayed 14 years. <laughs> Remember the funeral, Grandpa? We never knew what his real name was, and it was kind of hard to get a certificate. Yeah. What was the name we finally made up for him? Martin Vanderhoff. We gave him your name. Oh, yes. I remember. And it was a lovely thought, because otherwise he never would have got all those flowers. Certainly was. <laughs> it didn't hurt me any. Why, I've not been bothered with mail anymore, and I haven't had a telephone call from that day to this. <laughs> hey, look what I found in the cellar. Why, Paul, my unfinished portrait of you. Oh, the discus thrower. <laughs> Not bad. Uh, you've put on a little weight since then, Paul, dear. Well, I'd like you to finish it sometime, Penny, will you? You know, I think I'll do some work on it right now. You will? Go down in the cellar, dear, and bring up the easel and get into your discus thrower's costume. You know, tights and things. Uh -huh. I'll go upstairs and put on my tam shanter and my smock and my winter thigh. Well, all right, Penny. Come in. Come in. Ooh, where is everybody? Uh, I'm here, Mr. Klinkoff. Grandpa, I greet you. I greet you in the name of... What is this miserable object? Uh, it's a picture of Paul. Penny painted it. It stinks. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, how are you, Klinkoff? What's new in Russia? Any more letters from your friend in Moscow? They sent him to Siberia. Uh, so, how's he like it? It's cold. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Kalenkov, I didn't know oh, you. Oh, my dear Rosini, my little songbird. I'm sorry I'm late, Mr. Kalenkov. I'll get into my singing clothes right away. Wait, a little sample first, please. I am in the mood for being overcome. La, la, Is uh, la, she making any progress, Mr. La, Kalenkov? La, Confidentially, it's la. deep. <laughs> would you like me to hit high C, Mr. Kalenkov? This I would like to hear. Well, here I am, my tights. Where's Penny? Here I am, dear. Oh, what do you think of my portrait, Mr. Kalenkov? A discus thrower with such a bay window I have never seen before. Get out of my way, everybody. Why, Ed, where are you coming from? I ran out of models. I got a new customer. Who is it? The fellow who's been following me. Says he's been chasing me all day to buy some of my love dreams, but he won't touch him without the models. Got to print some up right away. And you've been running away from him? Well, it just goes to show you. Excuse me, Grandpa. Yeah. I guess I'll take the snakes out of the bowl and feed them. Come on, Terrence. Come on, Miss Alden. My nightingale, give me a high C, please. <laughs> no, no, I see like this. La, 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 la. Now we'll do it together. Yes, me first. La, 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 la. La, 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 la. Gee, suppose he buys another dozen boxes. At 60 cents a box, that's 7.20. Essie, Essie, we're rich. What's the matter, Terrence? Don't you like cornflakes? Well, don't look at me that way, Terrence. Oh, dear, Paul, you've got to hold still, dear, if you want me to paint you. I can't. I've got an itch. What? An itch, an itch. Well, then scratch it with the other hand. Why, it's the Kirby's. We knock, but nobody sees. Tony, my boy, are you sure you brought us to the right place? Oh, oh, dear me. So this is the right place, all right, Dad. Come in, Mother. Well, Tony, nice to see you again. Are we uh, too early? No, no, it's perfectly all right, isn't it, Penny? Why, yes. Only we thought it was to be tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. What? Now it's perfectly all right. Please sit down and make yourselves at home. Yes, thank you. Tony, how could you... Well, how could I, you... I don't know. I thought, well, isn't this Thursday? Certainly not. It's Wednesday. Really, Tony, this is most embarrassing. Not at all, Mrs. Kirby. Why, we weren't doing the thing. No, just spending the evening at home. That's all. Yeah, now, don't let it bother you. This is Alice's mother, Mrs. Sycamore. Hi, Alice's you? sister, Mrs. Carmichael. Hello. Mr. Carmichael. How do you do? Alice's father, Mr. Sycamore, How do you do? and Mr. Kalenkoff. How do you do? How do you How do? Do? Excuse me, I'll tell Alice you're here. No, Paul, dear, you're always so undiplomatic. I'll tell her. Alice, dear, your future in-laws are here. <laughs> 
You better come down in a hurry. They seem a little embarrassed. <laughs> Wasn't that a nice dinner? Did you enjoy the Frankfurters, Mr. Kirby? Uh, How about you, Mrs. Kirby? Did you like the beans? Well, <laughs> Alice just loves them, don't you, dear? Yes, Mother. Well, as I was saying, Mr. Kirby, pickles, pig's feet are a, are a treat for the gods. Everybody loves them. Oh, yeah. Yes, indeed. Mr. Kirby has stomach ulcers, Grandpa. Oh, you don't say. Well, every man do his hobby. <laughs> you know, uh... You know, Mr. Kirby, we all have hobbies in this house. Yes, that was the Meccano set I sprained my ankle on, wasn't it? Oh, no, that's not a Meccano. That's an erector. Oh, it's quite a difference, you know. Oh, is that so? I never would have thought it. Oh, yes. Uh, you see, Mr. Kirby... Oh, it's yours, Mr. Sycamore. Yes. Now, what do you do? Use it as a model of some sort? No, I just play with it. I see. Maybe you'd be better off if you had a hobby like that, Dad. I haven't got time. After a week in Wall Street, I'm crazy enough as it is. That place really drives a man out of his head. And why don't you give it up? How's that? Oh, Mr. Vanderhoff was just joking, dear. Weren't you, Mr. Vanderhoff? Not at all, Mrs. Kirby. <laughs> Seriously, though, I think it's necessary for everyone to have a hobby. Of course, it's more to me than a hobby, but my great solace is spiritualism. Now, Mrs. Kirby, don't tell me you fell for that. Why, everybody... Ideal, a hobby should improve the body as well as the mind. The Romans were a great people. Why? What was their hobby? Rattling. In rattling, you have to think quick with the mind and act quick with the body. Yes, quite, Mr. Kalenko. But I'm afraid wrestling is not very practical for most of us. Now, I wouldn't make a very good showing as a wrestler. You, you could be a great wrestler. You're built for it. Look, I show you. Stand up. No, 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 no. Please. Now, first, I put one hand behind your head from the front. So, then I push the other hand behind your back. So, see, I'm a lot. Can you move? No. With my foot, I push out your legs from the back. What happened? You sit down. Oh! Oh, 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 get off! Get off! Don't uh, tell me, Miss Ellis. Uh, the demonstration is finished uh, and no broken bones yet. Almost, but not quite. That is enough. Mr. Kirby, are you hurt? Are you, are you all right, Father? Uh, where are my glasses? Oh, here they are, Mr. Kirby. Uh, uh. Oh, Mr. Kirby, they're broken. Oh, I'm sorry. But when you wrestle again, Mr. Kirby, you will, of course, not wear glasses. I do not intend to wrestle again, Mr. Kalenko. Come, Martha, let us go home. Yes, Anthony. Mother, mother, it's early yet. You don't have oh, to. Mrs. Kirby, please, please don't go. Mr. Kirby, please don't go. I'm sorry if I did something wrong, and I apologize. I don't care how many times you apologize. I am going home. Stay right where you are, everybody. Good Lord, now what? Don't move. Whatever you do, don't move. Good heavens, it's a man with a gun. What is all this? You'll find out. Come in, Jack. Here I am, Chief. Well, which one is it? This is him, right over here. That's the fellow that stole him to me. Me? Hey, Eddie, what do they mean? Frisk him good, Jack. Well, well, what do you want? This is an outrage. Shut up. You. What's your name? Edward Carmichael. I haven't done anything wrong. Oh, you haven't, eh? It seems rather high-handed to me. What's it all about? Department of Justice. Oh, my goodness. Jay, man. Oh, Ed, Ed, you <laughs> If I haven't done anything, Essie, what's the boy done, officer? Never mind. That door lead to the cellar. I'm asking you. What's your name? Paul, uh, Paul, Paul Sycamore. Take that pipe out of your mouth and answer me. Does that door lead to the cellar? Yes, sir. Jack, take this guy down with you. See what you can find. Okay, Chief. Come along, Mr. Sycamore. Now, Mr. Carmichael, I want to talk to you. I haven't done anything. Ever see these before? Why, they're my mottos. Uh, the ones I print on my wrappers. Oh, you print this stuff, huh? Yes, sir. And you put them into boxes of candy to get them into people's homes. I love dreams. But I didn't mean anything. You didn't, huh? Well, get a load of this. Hooray for the proletariat. Dynamite the Capitol. Dynamite the White House. Dynamite the Supreme Court. <laughs> but I didn't mean that. I just like to print. Don't I, like Grandpa? Why, of course. Now, officer, the government's in no danger from Ed. 
Printing is just his hobby, that's all. He prints anything. Oh, he does, eh? Now, listen, officer. My name is Anthony Kirby, Sr. I refuse to stay here. Oh, shut up. Uh, well, Jack, did you find anything? Did I find anything? Why, Chief, they got enough gunpowder down in that cellar to blow up the whole city. Huh? But, uh, hey, hey, where do you think you're going, Mr. Sycamore? Downstairs. I left my pipe downstairs. You stay where you are. But my pipe, I left it down in the you cellar. You shut up. Everybody in this house is under arrest. Oh, good heavens. What kind of a house is this, anyhow? Tony, I forbid you. I absolutely forbid you to marry into this family. Oh, Father. dear, Mr. Kirby, you mustn't think. Oh, my poor dear Alice. Officer, I'm warning you. You'd better let me get down and get my pipe before... You're the... warning me. Why, you... Officer, I... I'm quite sure we can explain everything. Oh, you are, eh? Well, let me tell you, I'm madam, warning you that... again, officer. Something's liable to happen Happened? if you don't let... Nothing's going to happen. We're all just going to sit right here and wait for the patrol wagon. What's that? I'm telling you, if you'd only let me down there and my I told you to let me get my pipe. on the third act of You Can't Take It With You with Josephine Hull as Penny and Kenny Delmar as Grandpa. Well, it's the next day now. In the combination dining and living room, Penny Sycamore listens with a doleful face as her husband Paul reads an account of last night's catastrophic doings in the newspaper. After spending the night in jail, the defendants, including the well-known Wall Street tycoon Anthony Kirby, Mrs. Martha Kirby, Anthony Kirby Jr., and Ivan Ivanovich Kolenkoff, were brought before Judge Callahan and given suspended sentences. Oh, dear. Oh, now, now, Penny, don't cry. I can't help it, Paul. Somehow I feel it's all our fault. And now Mr. Kirby's angry and the marriage is off and, and Alice is going away. Oh, it's my fault, Penny, not yours. Oh, don't say that, Paul. You're a wonderful father and husband, too. Well, maybe I'd like, given a firecracker has been an architect. I was going to be one, you know, Penny. Well, you dear, I never knew that. Mm -hmm. Did you belong to an architect's fraternity at college? You never gave me your pin. Penny, if I'd been an architect... Alice could have been proud of me. I felt that all last night, looking at Mr. Kirby. Oh, Paul, but we've all been so happy. I know, but maybe that's not enough. I used to think it was, but... Well, I'm all kind of mixed up now. Uh, hello, Penny. Paul. Grandpa, have you been upstairs with Alice? Now, Penny, let the girl alone. But it's all so terrible, Grandpa. <laughs> her going away to forget like this. I don't see anything to laugh at. I was just thinking of Mr. Kirby getting out of that patrol wagon last night and the expression on his face when he and that bum in his cell had to take a bath together. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was even worse with Mrs. Kirby when the matron took her clothes off. There was a burlesque dancer there and she kept singing a song while Mrs. Kirby undressed. Take it off, take it off, take it off. <laughs> well, I bet you that... Swanky Long Island is going to seem pretty dull to the Kirby's for the rest of the summer. Yeah. Uh, hello, Alice. You need any help with your packing? Oh, no, thanks, Grandpa. Ed is helping me with the bags and I'll... Get... I'll bring that big one down as soon as you're ready, Alice. Oh, thanks, Ed. Come in, Effie. I won't bite you. I just thought... Would you want me to make some love dreams to take along on the train, Alice? Oh, no, thanks, Effie. Really, Alice, you could be just as alone to forget here as you can in the other on that mountain. Sure, Alice. We could lock you in your room. You know, Ed, I, I want to be away from everybody. Oh, I love you all. You know that. But I just I just have to get away for a while. Uh, Father, did you phone for a cab? No, dear. I didn't know you wanted one. But, Mother, I told you to tell Dad. I told I... Essie to tell Ed to... Oh, she told me, all right. But I forgot. Oh, I wish I lived in a family that didn't always forget everything. That behaved the way other people's families do. Why can't we behave like other people with everybody acting normal in a house you could bring your friends to without... without... My goodness, she's upset. 
What should we do, Grandpa? Suggest something. Well, my suggestion is we just go about our business like we always do. There's an hour and a half yet till Alice's train leaves. Lots of things can happen in an hour and a half. Well, Grandpa, we're still waiting for something to happen. Give it time. Give it time. Well, I told you, all you got to do is give it time. Why, Tony, what are you doing here? I came here to see Alice. I want to tell her something. What do you want to tell her, Tony? I want to tell her that I love her and I'm going to marry her and I don't care what my father says. All you got to do is give it time. I'll tell her you're here, dear. Oh, Alice, Tony. Tell me I'm not at home. Oh, is that so? Then you better tell your ghost to have some clothes on because I'm coming up. I love impetuous young men, don't you, Grandpa? <laughs> oh, Paul, dear, look at you. You've been down in the cellar. Oh, everything's burnt up. All my firecrackers, even my portrait you were painting yesterday. Yeah, I told you there was a bright side to everything. <laughs> All except my 32 years back income tax. They're still pestering me. What are you going to do about that, Grandpa? Well, Ed, I had a kind of idea. It may not work, but... I'm trying it anyhow. What is it, Grandpa? Well, you see, it's like this, Essie. Good I... evening, everybody. Oh, Mr. Kalenkov. Hello, Kalenkov. You'll excuse my coming today. I realize you are upset. I don't think I can take a lesson, Mr. Kalenkov. My throat just closed up on me right after the explosion. Oh, but you stay to dinner, Mr. Kalenkov. Oh, I will be happy to, Madame Sigamore. And now... I wonder if I know you well enough to ask of you a great favor. Proceed. You have heard me talk about my friend, the Grand Duchess Olga Katrina. Why, yes. Of course, Mr. Kalenka. Well, she is a great woman, the Grand Duchess. Her cousin was the Tsar of all the Russias. And today she is a waitress in a chain restaurant, Columbus Circle. If there's anything we can do. I tell you, the Grand Duchess Olga Katrina has not had a good meal since before the revolution. She must be hungry. <laughs> Mr. Kalenkov, if you mean you'd like the Grand Duchess to come to dinner, why, we'd be honored. Yeah. In the name of the Grand Duchess, I thank you. Well, where is she? I can hardly wait to meet her. Outside in the hall she waits. I bring her in. Ed, straighten your tie. Paul, dear, put on your shoes. Essie, fix your dress. How do I look? All right. The Grand Duchess, Olga Katrina, Walter Asher. Your Highness. Permit me to present Madame Sycamore. Welcome to our Madame humble Tom abode. Michael. No. Grandpa. Welcome, madam. Uh, Mr. Sycamore. How do you do? Uh, Mr. Carmichael. Uh, Royal Highness. Uh, won't you sit down, Your Highness? Thank you. You are most kind. What time is dinner? <laughs> you know, Your Highness, I think you waited on me once. The 72nd Street place. No, no. That was my seat. The Grand Duchess Natasha Andreevna. Hmm. Well, quite a lot of your family over here now, aren't there? Oh, yes, many. My uncle, the Grand Duke Sergei, he is a freight elevator man at Macy's. A very nice man. Then there is my cousin, Prince Alexis. He will not speak to the rest of us because he is in business for himself. He has cards printed. Prince Alexis Alexander Romanov got a bitch removed. Yeah. <laughs> When he was conductor on the IRT, he was willing to talk to you. Ah, so Our time is coming. Soon I will be salad chef, and then he will remove my garbage. <laughs> <laughs> Your Highness, did you know the Tsar? Personally, I mean... Of course. He was my cousin. Uh, Essie, the Grand Duchess is hungry. I suggest that you go into the kitchen I and... will help, too. I am a very good cook. Come, Kalenko. If they have got sour cream and pot cheese, I will make you some princess. Oh, princess. Come, Essie, my songbird. We'll show you something. Oh. oh, well, Grandpa, I'm still waiting for something to happen. Do you suppose Tony's convinced, Shh, Alice? They're coming. No, Tony, I won't like Will that. you listen to me? Will you listen to me for just a minute? No, I... Dad, did you phone for my cab? Alice, will you just listen? Oh, oh, that must be the cab now. Well, if it is, it's certainly wonderful service we haven't called him yet. <laughs> Alice. Tony, please. Well, I've got to answer the door. Now, I wonder who that is. Well, maybe it's the fire department. I heard we had a fire yesterday, and they're coming to see if we put it out. Why, it's Mr. Krugin. Mr. 
Tony here, Alice. Uh, yes, yes, he is. Won't you come in? Oh, good afternoon. Forgive my intrusion. Tony? Yes, Father. Tony, I want you to come home with me. Your mother is very upset. I hardly need mention that this situation is as painful to Mrs. Kirby and myself as it is to you people. I'm sorry, but I'm sure you understand, Mr. Van Hoff. Well, yes and no. Well, I'm not the kind of person who tries to run other people's lives, Mr. Kirby, but... Grandpa, will you please not do this? Well, I'm just talking to Mr. Kirby, Alice. The cat can look at the king, can't he? If you'll excuse me, I've got a telephone call to make. Certainly, Alice. Come, Tony. Hey, just a minute, Mr. Kirby. Uh, I suppose after last night you think this family is crazy, don't you? No, I wouldn't say that. But I am not accustomed to being exploded after dinner and spending the rest of the night in jail. Well, you've got to remember, Mr. Kirby, you came on the wrong night. Now, tonight, I'll bet you nothing will happen at all. Well, I wouldn't bet on it. Mr. Vanderhoff, it's not merely last night that convinced Mrs. Kirby and myself that this marriage would be unwise. Father, I can handle my own affairs. Alice, for the last time, will you marry me? No, Tony. I know exactly what your father means in these rights. No, he's not, Alice. Alice, you're in love with this boy. You're not marrying him because we're the kind of people we are. Friends, I know you think the two families wouldn't get along. Well, maybe they wouldn't. But who says they're right and we're wrong? I didn't say that, Grandpa. I only feel Well, that... what I feel is that Tony's too nice a boy to wake up 20 years from now with nothing in his life but Wall Street. All mixed up and unhappy like his father here. Well, I beg your pardon, Mr. Vanderhoff. I am a very happy man. Are you? Certainly I am. Well, I don't think so. What did you get your ulcers from? Happiness? No, sir. You got them because most of your time is spent in doing things you don't want to do. I don't do anything I don't want to do. Yes, you do. You said last night that Wall Street drives you crazy. Why do you keep on doing it? Why do I keep... Why, it's my business. A man can't give up his business. Why not? You got all the money you need. You can't take it with you. That's a very easy thing to say, Mr. Vanderhoff. But I have spent my entire life in building up my business. And what's it got you? Same kind of mail every morning, same kind of deal, same kind of meetings... Same kind of stomach ulcer. Where does the fun come in? Don't you think there ought to be something more, Mr. Kirby? Well, what do you expect me to do? Live the way you do? Do nothing? Well, I have a lot of fun. Time enough for everything. Read, talk, visit the zoo. And I haven't taken bicarbonate or soda in 35 years. Hmm. But suppose we all did that. A fine world we'd have. Who'd do the work? Well, there's always people who like to work. You can't stop them. But from what I've seen of you, Miss Kirby, I don't think you're one of them. I, I think you miss something in your life. I am not aware of missing anything. I wasn't either until I quit. What I'm trying to say, Miss Kirby, is that I've had 35 years that nobody can take away from me. No matter what they do to the world. See? Yes, I do see. That's a very dangerous philosophy, Mr. Vanderhoff. It's, uh... It's un American. And it's exactly why I'm opposed to this marriage. I don't want Tony to come under its influence. Yes, sir, it's un American. You didn't always think so, Father. I most certainly did. What are you talking about? Father, wasn't there a time when you wanted to be a trapeze artist? Oh, don't be an idiot, Tony. Oh, yes, you did. I came across those letters you wrote to Grandfather. No. Why, isn't that wonderful? Did you wear tights, Mr. Kirby? I'd love to paint you. Certainly not. The whole thing is absurd. I was 14 years old at the time. Well, 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 Mr. Kirby. Something tells me that when you were 18, you probably wanted to be a saxophone player. Why, Grandpa, how did you know? Tony? Why, a saxophone is still home in the closet. I've seen it. That will do, Tony. We'll discuss this later. No, oh, I want to talk about it now. I think Grandpa is dead right. I'm never going back to Wall Street. I've always hated, and now I've got Alice to listen to me, I'll tell you something else. I didn't make a mistake last night. I knew it was the wrong night. I brought you here on purpose. Tony, because I... Because I wanted to wake you up. I wanted you to see a real family as they really were. A family that loved and understood each other. You don't understand me, Father. You've never had time. Well, I'm not going to make your mistake. I'm clearing out. Clearing out? What do you intend to do? I don't know, but I'm not going back to Wall Street. Maybe I'll be a bricklayer or a librarian or a six-day bicycle racer. But at least I'll be doing something I want to do. Good for you, Tony. And welcome into the family. That must be my cab. Answer it, Ed, please. Uh, ask him to wait a minute, Ed. Please, Grandpa. Now, do you mind, Alice? You know, Mr. Kirby, Tony is going through just what you and I did at his age. 
I think if you listen hard enough, you can hear yourself saying the same things to your father 25 years ago. We all did it, and we were right. How many of us would be willing to settle when we're young for what we eventually get? All those plans we make, what happens to them? It's only a handful of the lucky ones that can look back and say that they even came close. Well, I must admit I've never thought of it uh, quite that way. So before they clean out that closet, Mr. Kirby, I think you'd better get in for a few good hours with that saxophone. I beg your pardon. Before I make the blinkses, how many will there be for Dean? Why, I don't know. Uh, your Highness, uh, may I present Mr. Anthony Kirby and Mr. Kirby Jr., the Grand Duchess Alga Katrina. How do you do, Mr. Kirby? Please, somebody, I have to know how many... Oh, of I'd make quite a stack of them, Your Highness. You can't ever tell. Good. The Tsar always said to me, Olga, do not be stingy with the bling, says. <laughs> Who did you say that was, Mr. Van der uh, The Grand Duchess, Olga Katrina of all the Russias. She's cooking the dinner. You're staying, of course. Well, I, I'm uh... staying, Father, if Alice sends away that cab. How about it, Alice? Going to be a nice crowd. Don't you think you ought to stay to dinner? Oh, Mr. Kirby. Oh, Tony. Darling. Grandpa, you're wonderful. Well, I've been telling you that for years. <laughs> Give me a kiss. Hey, Grandpa, here's a letter for you. We found it in the icebox behind the patches. <laughs> well, thank you. Ah, the government again. Must have come today. Well, well, well. What is it, Grandpa? United States government apologizes. I don't owe him a nickel. Seems I died eight years ago. <laughs> what do they mean, Grandpa? Well, remember one round Louis, the piano mover, you know, who lived with us? One who was buried under my name. You know, Penny, we were just talking about him last yes, night. Yes, yes, I remember. Well, I just told him they made a mistake, and I was Martin Van der Hoff, Jr., so they're very sorry, and I may even get a refund. You can sit down, everybody, please. Now, Mr. Kirby, in St. Petersburg, when they serve Quiet, dinner... please. Grandpa wants to say grace. Well, sir, here we are again. We want to say thanks once more for everything you've done for us. Things seem to be going along fine. Alice is going to marry Tony. Looks as if they're going to be very happy. Of course, the fireworks blew up. But that was Paul's fault, not yours. We've all got our health. And as far as anything else is concerned, we'll leave it to you. Theater Guild on the Air is under the supervision of Lawrence Langner and Teresa Helburn with Homer Thicket Director, Carol Irvin, Production Executive, and Armina Marshall, Executive Director of the Radio Department. Music was composed and conducted by Harold Levy and the play adapted by Arthur Aaron. Your announcer is Norman Brokenshire. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, 
hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler, rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. And Signal Gasoline is top too, tops in quality. It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal Circle sign in yellow and black that identifies friendly dealer-owned Signal stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story, Nightmare. In the bouncing glare of the headlights, the narrow shoreline road twisted and turned dangerously. Signposts, clumps of pine trees, driveways to darken the state whirled past Philip Adams as he raced through the night, and behind him the sirens grew louder and louder. As Philip Adams ran from the car into the brush, he patted his coat pocket. The bulging manila envelope was still there. Branches tore at his clothing. He stumbled on the rocky path, fell. Quickly, he staggered to his feet and plunged on into the thick undergrowth. And then he heard right, voices and out, stopped boys. to listen. Turn out. Back. You and Charlie, come to the creek there. Okay. Oh, Eddie, get that spot on the road, will you? All right, the rest of you, come on. Hey. Hey down there, any luck? Found be around here somewhere. Are you sure this is the guy we're looking for, Lieutenant? Yeah, yeah, we checked the license number. It's Adams, all right. Hmm. Think he might still have the doll on him? Yeah, it's hard to say. You know, he's no piker, this Adams. 200,000 bucks. Yeah, well, it was easy for him. He worked for the bank, knew his way around. He hadn't got so anxious and barreled out so fast trying to get away. Say, but... Lieutenant. Huh? I uh, wonder if he had time to make it inside one of these estates along here. Hmm? Maybe. You have a tough time getting into this one, huh? Oh, here, uh, throw your light up there along the wall, will you? Yeah. No, uh, uh, don't say a thing. All right. Now, come on. Let's take a look over this way. Keep your eyes open. You know, I got a hunchy head of tight across the wall. As the officers move away to continue their search, you breathe a little easier, don't you, fellas? Painfully, you crawl from the underbrush and carefully hobble across the street. The entrance gate to the estate is locked, but you've got to get over that wall. A last desperate, agonizing leap gives you one more chance at freedom. But it isn't much of a chance, is it, Philip? As you lie there in a cold sweat on top of the wall, clutching the rough stone with bleeding hands, you feel the sharp pain spread slowly up your leg. You know you've hurt your ankle badly. Luck has been against you from the start. The officer was right, wasn't he? If only you'd taken your time. If you hadn't been so anxious to get away with the money, this wouldn't have happened. And the perfect crime isn't so perfect now. Is it, Philip? Moments later, as the moon creeps from behind a cloud, you see the house a short distance away. Its windows are dark. Carefully, you drop to the ground. Move across the lawn. Your twisted ankle making each step an eternity of pain. The windows on the ground floor are locked. Then as you cross the porch, you kick the doormat and hear the clink of metal. Huh. A key. It's a door key. I wonder if... Let's see. Yeah. You open the door cautiously. Smell the musty odor of a closed house. See the furniture covers and the rolled up rugs. Heaving a sigh of relief, you close the door. Hobble across the living room. In the kitchen, you turn on the water faucet. Let the cold water run over your bleeding hand. And then... Well, <laughs> hello. Oh. Oh, hello. I, I was sound asleep. I thought when you came, the noise of the car would wake me. The car? Oh, you, you mean... Well, I didn't really know if you'd take the train, taxi, drive, or what... 
That's why I sent you the wire about the key. Oh. Oh, you're the key. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, I found it all right. Oh. Oh, your hand. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't notice. Here, let no, me... No, no. <laughs> no, it's nothing. Oh. oh, we'd better take care of this. I, uh... I tripped walking up the drive. Afraid I twisted my ankle. Oh, too. I, I'd better call a doctor. Oh, no, no, please. No, that won't be necessary. No, I'll be all right in a few days. But he lives just down the road. No, there. I don't need a doctor. Now, really. Well, then I'll get some bandages. <laughs> After all, that's what I'm here for. To take care of you. Oh? Oh. Oh, I'm Miss Wyatt. Hilda Wyatt. Oh. Why? Oh, yes, of course. How do you do, Miss Wyatt? In a few moments, she's back with bandages and iodine for your bleeding hands. And you watch her as she runs steaming hot water into a basin and wonder who young, attractive Miss Wyatt is. You wonder, too, who you're supposed to be. It's fantastic, isn't it? To sneak into a strange house and be greeted so cordially by a woman you've never seen before. There now. If you'll put your foot in the water... Ah! Uh, no, I, I'll get used to it. It should take the swelling down. Oh. I'm certainly glad you're here. Yeah. This is such a big house. Oh. I guess I was a little frightened. I've been here alone the past two days. You've been alone? Oh, well, the employment agency didn't want to send any of the other servants down until they heard from Evans. Evans? The, the new butler, you know, you know. Oh, oh, yes, yeah, of course. I spoke to him on the phone last night. Sounds rather nice. I think you'll like it. Oh, yes. <laughs> sure I will. Uh, where is uh, Evans now? He was in San Francisco. He said he'd be down in a day or so. You see, he was under the impression you wouldn't be here for several days. Something you said in one of your wires from Chicago. Oh, yes. Well, I changed my mind. Well, he's likely to arrive any time. Anyway, everything's practically ready for you. I made up your room myself. And if you don't mind my cooking for breakfast... Well, of course not. Uh, you're very thoughtful, Miss Wyatt. <laughs> oh, that's just professional instinct. And now that you're here in your new home, I hope you like it. And your new secretary, too. I, I hope so, too, Miss Wyatt. Uh, who told you I was just moving in? Uh, the employment agency. They told me quite a bit about you. And the gardener next door is very talkative. Says he even knows what you paid for the house. Oh, ow. Easy with that hand, Miss Wyatt. Oh, I'm sorry. Not much of a brownie, I'm afraid. But I am a good secretary. Yes, I'm sure you are. I appreciate your hiring me, Mr. Crane. Oh, you do? Is something wrong, Mr. Crane? Mr. Crane? Huh? Oh, wrong? No. No. <laughs> Oh, everything's fine, Miss Wyatt. Yes, just fine. With the prologue of Nightmare, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. But now, news about ethyl gasoline. Signal Ethyl is already back at many signal service stations and will soon be available at all signal stations. So tonight, on behalf of all the independent signal dealers throughout the West, I want to take this opportunity to thank you loyal signal customers for your patience during the period when unavoidable conditions made it impossible to supply this extra quality gasoline. Naturally, Signal Oil Company is doing everything in its power to get signal ethyl into all signal stations as soon as possible although it will take a little longer to supply stations located farthest from refineries. For your convenience, each signal dealer will post a sign at his station the moment his supply of signal ethyl arrives. That sign will be your signal that you can again enjoy the faster starting, more flashing pickup and smoother, knock-free power of signal ethyl gasoline. So for the very tops in performance from your car, Watch for the sign at your signal station that says, We have Ethel. And now back to the whistler.
You're bewildered by the curious turn of events, aren't you, Philip? Fleeing the police in the middle of the night, entering a strange house, being greeted as though you belong. Greeted by the perfect secretary, Miss Hilda Wyatt, who somehow thinks you're the owner of the estate, a man named Crane. And now as you stretch out on the long leather couch in the study, you can't sleep, can you? This strange refuge from the police is almost as nerve-wracking as last night's chase. Your swollen, twisted ankle makes walking almost impossible. And you know you're going to have to stay here in this house until your ankle gets better. But you think of what could happen. Perhaps the servants will arrive from San Francisco and expose you. Maybe the real Mr. Crane will show up. Something you'll say will arouse Miss Wyatt's suspicion. She'll call the police. As the first rays of the morning sun creep through the window, you try to ignore the pain in your ankle as you slip through the hall to the front door. All you want is escape. Escape to Mexico with the $200,000 you stole from the local bank. And then as you open the door... Oh, oh. hello. Just about to ring your bell here. Well, what is it you want? My name's Haskell, Lieutenant, Norville Police. And you're... Uh... Oh. My name, uh, my name's Crane. I see. You, uh, you own this place? Uh, that's right. I, uh, I bought it a little while back. He's Hudson Willard Crane. He owns the oil club in Arena. Oh, Wyatt, good morning. Oh, you shouldn't be on that ankle, you know. I, uh, oh, uh, this is Miss Wyatt, my secretary officer. Oh, how do you do, Miss Wyatt? Oh, so you're the Hudson Crane that owns the oil club, huh? Mm-hmm. I see. Oh, you said you were looking for someone, Lieutenant? Oh, yeah, a man named Adams. He ran off with a couple of hundred thousand from the local bank. He was in the neighborhood last night. Thought he might have climbed over the wall, gotten into the estate here. You, uh, you didn't see or hear anything during the night? Why, no. No, nothing at all. Uh-huh. Well, uh, thanks, Mr. Crane. Sorry I bothered you. Thank you, Miss. Oh, quite all right. Goodbye. Well, Miss Wyatt, you seem to know quite a bit about me. Oh, no, not really. Actually, I only know what they told me at the employment agency. They said you, uh, you were young, rather good-looking, a successful nightclub operator, but I'll learn more in time. Yes, yeah. for a new secretary, Miss Wyatt seems to know quite a bit about her employer, Mr. Hudson Willard Crane. Doesn't she, Philip? But it's lucky for you that the employment agency told her as much as they did. You couldn't have told the officers anything, could you? Not even Crane's first name. And you have to convince everyone that you are Mr. Crane for a day or so. Yes, Miss Wyatt was a lucky break for you. She's efficient, too, in many ways, as you find out the next morning. More coffee, Mr. Crane? Oh, no, thank you. It's fine. I thought after you finished breakfast, we might get right to work. That is, if you feel up to it. There are some checks you should sign for the real estate people. Checks? Oh, well, yeah, I'll attend to that later. And the mail. Your correspondence is piling up. Well, later, Miss Wyatt. Well, all right. Oh, oh, I suppose you'll want to talk to Evans, the butler. Evans, he's here? Uh, he arrived a short while ago. He came on the bus. Oh. I'll send him in. No, uh, no, wait, not just yet. But he'll be anxious to know... How you want things done, Mr. Crane. After all, some of your friends may be dropping in. And... Oh, Miss Wyatt, please. I I'll take care of everything later. Very well, Mr. Crane. You notice the strange, puzzled look on Miss Wyatt's face as she turns and walks away. And you wonder if she's beginning to think that something is wrong. You realize that your only chance to evade the police is to stay in the house for another 24 hours, at least until your ankle's better. Yes, that's all you need, isn't it? Twenty-four hours. And the police will have left the neighborhood by then. And you'll be able to slip away unnoticed. But in the meantime, you've got to somehow keep one jump ahead of the efficient Miss Wyatt. And to do that, you've got to know more about this man, Crane. You hurry to the study. Oh, Mr. Mr. Crane, I'm I... looking for something, Miss Wyatt? Oh, well, I... I was just sorting things out. I thought I made it perfectly clear that you were not to bother with business. But these are the files you sent from Chicago. I was just going to straighten them out. Uh-huh. I'll take care of them, Miss Wyatt. Mr. Crane, 
I don't want you to think I was deliberately prying into your personal affairs. I... Oh, I'll get it. Hello? Yes, Chicago. Oh. Oh, yes, I'll take the call. Just a minute, Miss Wyatt. Let me have the phone. Whoa. Oh, all right, Miss Crane. Hello? Hello, this is Mr. Crane. I'm uh, gonna... One moment, please. Miss Wyatt, this is personal. Do you mind? Oh, of course not. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Crane? Hey, what's going on there? Oh, uh, let me apologize for the confusion, sir. Uh, we were just opening the house, and I'm... Who is this, the new butler? Uh, yes, I'm the new butler. I'm Evan, sir. All right, now get this. I'm leaving Chicago in a few minutes, flying out to San Francisco. Uh, do you wish me to meet you, sir? Never mind, I'll pick up a car at the airport garage and drive in myself. Oh, very good, sir. My plane lands sometime tomorrow. Pardon, sir, would you mind telephoning uh, from San Francisco when you arrive? Why? Well, I want to have the house ready for you, sir. Oh, of course. You'll be bringing guests, sir? No, no, I... I'll be alone. Yes, sir. One more thing. If anybody asks you, anybody, you don't know when I'm coming back, understand? Oh, yes, of course, sir. I don't want to see anybody when I get there. Just get away from everything and everybody. I quite understand, sir. Uh, is that all, sir? See you tomorrow, Evans. Your hand trembles as you replace the receiver. You haven't much time now, have you, Philip? And yet, somehow, you sense in all this a real chance for escape. A few minutes later, you put things in motion in a conversation with Evans, the new butler. And you're no longer afraid because you know now that he's never met Crane face to face. Evans, I hate to have you just arrive and then send you off again, but uh, something urgent's come up. Very good, sir. Whatever you wish. I'm going to have to make a quick trip to Canada. I want you to run into San Francisco and make the arrangements for me. Oh, uh, here's some money. Buy anything you think I'll need. Well, this might all take some time, sir. When oh, it's you... all right. Uh, well, I'd like to leave day after tomorrow, and you stay on in the city until everything's taken care of. Very good, sir. I'll handle everything. <laughs> Yes, Philip. Evans will handle everything. He's very efficient. Too bad you have no intention of actually using his service. But it will look good to the police, won't it? When Crane finally arrives and they piece it all together, discover that you planned a clever escape to Canada. It will throw them off while you're actually continuing on your way to Mexico. <laughs> It's later that night, with Evans gone, that you decide to speak to Miss Wyatt. Plant some things in her mind that will add to your plan in evading the police. You go downstairs and wonder why it's so quiet in the house. Suddenly you feel panic. Miss Wyatt. Miss Wyatt. Miss Wyatt. You wonder if she's gone, Philip. If she learned the truth and slipped away from the house. And then you see a crack of light beneath the study door. Miss Wyatt, what are you doing? Isn't it fairly obvious? I'm going through your Chicago files again. No, your attitude's pretty hard to understand, Miss Wyatt. I think it's time we talk this over. Uh, sit down. No, I'd prefer that we stand for this. Oh, God. Stay where you are. I wasn't sure about you until just now, Crane, when I went through your files. If I had been, I'd have killed you the first night you were here. Huh? Do you think it was fun fixing your ankle, cooking your meals? Now, wait a minute. You You've heard of imposters, haven't you, Crane? Well, all right, I'm an imposter, but... Look. Look, I can make things easier for you. I've you got can't give me back Joe Baldwin, Crane. Joe Baldwin? My name isn't Wyatt Crane. It's Baldwin. Edna Baldwin. I wasn't only Joe Baldwin's girl, Crane. I was his wife. Joe Baldwin? Now tell me the name means nothing to you. Tell me that, Crane. You don't remember how you framed him, do you? Wait a minute. This is all a mistake. It's no mistake, Crane. I found out everything five minutes ago. I've never heard of Baldwin. you got to listen to me. You're all wrong. I'm not the man you You're are. You're Hudson Willard Crane, and you framed Joe Baldwin into the electric chair. Will you wait and a you minute? you double-crossed Joe and me, too, out of enough money to buy into gambling places in Chicago. Now and listen Nevada, to me. And now you live like a king. Well, that's all over for you now, Crane. The law couldn't get you. But I will. You don't understand. I'm not Crane at all. My name's don't Adam. Don't come any closer. Come on, give me that gun. No. Look, I'm not Crane, don't no. you see? You must believe me. Give me that no, gun. No, you would try anything, you wouldn't you? But you can't get away with it with me. That's <laughs> why. Oh. 
You watch as she falls to the floor. A small girl now, small and white. You don't have to feel her pulse to know that she's dead. Numbly, you sink down in the chair, sure that this is the end. A murdered girl in the house. You wanted by the police already. An ankle that won't allow you to walk two blocks. It's all over now, isn't it, Philip? The grand plan for escape into Mexico. Everything's done. You'll be caught and it'll be the gas chamber. As the phone's insistent ringing brings you back to your surroundings, you reach over and touch the cradle, hoping to stop the irritation of the sound. And then slowly it comes to you. Hello? A half-familiar voice on the other end of Hello? the wire. Hello? Hello. Hey, is everything all right there? Can you hear me? This is Crane. I'm in San Francisco. Mr. Crane. Oh, you're in San Francisco. Of course. You asked me to phone. All right, I'm here. Uh, uh, yes, sir. You sure everything's all right there? Oh, everything's fine, sir. You didn't tell anybody I was coming in? No, I didn't, sir. Good. I'll have a bite of dinner and then I'll start. Oh, uh, uh, begging your pardon, sir, but uh, could you hurry? I thought you said everything was all right. It's uh, something I can't discuss on the telephone. Not right now, sir. But your new secretary, Miss Wyatt, I uh, caught her looking through your personal files. What? I'll pick up my car and be there in two hours. Very good, sir, and uh, drive carefully, sir. Yes, you must get Crane to hurry, Philip, because the car he's driving up from San Francisco is your way out. It all came to you when you heard his voice on the telephone. And there'll be no murder charge against you. It'll be against Crane, the one man who had reason to kill this girl. Methodically, you hobble about the room, setting the murder trap. The first thing, wipe the gun free of your print. Straighten the rug. Turn a single lamp on in the study. Her body's behind the desk. It'll take him a while to see it. But while he's inside, you'll be in his car driving southward, and you'll stop just once to make an anonymous phone call to the police. You smile to yourself as you step outside in the gathering dusk and... Take your station well hidden behind the porch, waiting for Crane. The two hours seem like years, but at last a black limousine pulls up in the driveway, and a tall, broad-shouldered man gets out. You watch him go up on the porch and push open the door. And your heart's in your mouth as you see him stoop and pick up the gun that you left lying in the hall. Quietly, you creep toward the car. And then a thought strikes you. Maybe he didn't leave the keys. You've got to have those keys. You're shaking as you come to the car and look through the open window and run your hand quickly along the dashboard. And then... Ah, they're here. Luck, the keys are here. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, a tip for you drivers. Since cooler weather is here to stay, the kind of oil that you use in your motor is more important than ever. The reason? On short trips around town, your motor seldom gets warm enough to drive off the moisture that condenses in the crankcase. As a result, harmful gums may form, which can damage costly motor parts. That's why Signal brought out Signal Premium Compounded Motor Oil, an improved type lubricant which contains special scientific compounds. Inside your motor, these compounds go to work to do jobs which a regular oil alone cannot do. One compound, for instance, stands ready to dissolve any harmful gums that might form. Another compound washes out carbon. And still other compounds help in other ways to keep performance up and wear down. That's why Signal Premium Compounded Motor Oil is your guarantee of a sweeter running motor. So next time you change oil, make it a change for the better at your nearest Signal service station. It'll take your signal dealer only a few moments to drain out tired old oil and refill with the improved type Signal Oil that does so much more than just lubricate. Signal Premium Compounded Motor Oil. And now back to the whistle. It's been a nightmare, hasn't it, Philip? Your flight, 
The moments of panic before your escape over the wall to the protection of Crane's darkened house. The worry and constant fear of discovery. Of not being able to flee because of your swollen ankle. But it's all behind you now. Crane did exactly what you planned. He picked up the murder gun where you left it in the hallway. The gun you used to kill Hilda Wyatt. He's certain to be excused. And you'll see to it that with your phone call to the police. And the confusion of a murder will give you still more time to cross the border into Mexico with your $200,000. You smile to yourself as you open the door and start to slip behind the wheel. Borrowing this car, Mr. Uh, Crane? Uh, where did you come from? I've been sitting in this back seat all the time. Look at the mistake. I'm not Crane. Is that so? I saw you sneaking out of the house. Just came by to see Mr. Crane on business. And he wasn't home, huh? That's right. Uh, you looking for Mr. Crane? Grand larceny, embezzlement, and a dozen other things. Just had a wire from the Chicago police to pick him up. Police? Yeah. Oh, I'm Reynolds, uh, San Francisco headquarters. But Lieutenant Jeffrey's the head man. You know, he might want to talk to you. Oh, look, I, I don't want to get mixed up in anything. Oh, if you're on the level, you won't get mixed up. I'm in an awful hurry. I... I can't wait for your Lieutenant Jeffries to show up. Don't have to. He's inside now. He's... Sure, sure. That was Jeffries that went in the house just a minute ago. And that wasn't Crane? I thought you said you knew Crane. Oh, well... Uh... You know, I think we'll both go inside. Lieutenant Jeffries might want to ask you some questions. That whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speed, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Joseph Kearns and Eve McVeigh. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen and directed tonight by Sterling Tracy. With story by Robert Eisenbach and Jackson Gillis and music by Wilbur Hatch. And was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Remember, at this same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. in crime. The American Broadcasting Company presents I Deal in Crime, starring William Gargan as Ross Dolan. This is Ross Dolan speaking from one of the ringside tables at the Rose Room Dance Palace. Yeah, you guessed it. 50 beautiful hostesses. Count them, 50. If you're wondering what I'm doing in a spot where they tap you a dime for a two-time whirl around a small floor, it's because somebody gave me a lifetime pass. Also, because a man named William Davis came to see me. William A. Davis, if you please. He was one of those stuffy little bus budgets about 50 years old and tried to cling to a dull youth by brushing his thin hair over a rapidly spreading bald spot. He walked into my office one bright afternoon and said, hey, Mr. Dolan, you're a detective. I want you to find my daughter for me. Sure, sure, Mr. Uh, uh, well, sit down. I haven't time. My name is Davis, William Davis, William A. Davis. Well, glad to meet you. My name is Dolan, Ross Dolan. The only second name my father gave me I got when I broke the mirror in the front parlor. I have no time for levity, Mr. Dolan. Oh. Naturally, since my daughter has disappeared, I've been quite concerned, even a trifle distraught, if I may say so. Oh, uh, say anything you want. I live up in Mission Valley. 
I've lived there for 20 years. And one day last week, my daughter simply disappeared. Uh, how old is your daughter, Mr. Davis? She's 17. A dangerous age. Yeah. Also, you will find her self-willed. You may have trouble bringing her back. Uh-huh. Any boyfriends, Mr. Davis? I know of none. I've prepared a sort of brochure on Jacqueline. The picture's a complete history, so you'd have something to work on. Here. Here. Oh, thanks. Hmm. She's a pretty kid, isn't she? Yes. Uh, let us discuss your fee, Mr. Dolan. My ceiling is five dollars per day. Five bucks a day? Mr. Davis, you better either raise your ceiling or lower your floor. You're talking to the wrong man. Uh, I'm a sporting man, Mr. Dolan. I make you a proposition. If you find Jacqueline, five hundred dollars. If you don't, nothing. Uh, of course, I'll pay your expenses. Mm hmm I think I'll take you up on that, Mr. Davis. Yes, I, I thought so. You have a reputation for being quite a gambler. Thanks. I, uh, I presume her mother is quite concerned, too. I don't know. Also, I don't care. William A. Davis hiked out of there like an upstate Napoleon on his way to Josephine. I settled down to the more serious job of finding a 17-year-old girl in a big city, and it turned out to be tough. The missing persons bureau gave me no lead, neither did the hospital. I called and asked more questions than a quiz master at a lawn party, and finally wound up with a pretty, nice, round goose egg. I decided to beat it down the street. But the minute I left the building, I got that uncomfortable feeling around the collar. I walked a block and looked around. I had a tail. I kept going towards the next corner. I rounded the corner and stopped. My pal was close behind me. He was a big, beefy bird, but I stopped him. <coughs> oh, pardon me. Hey, why didn't you look where you... Uh-oh. What's the matter, Pally? Afraid you'll miss the bus? I'm not on my way to missing any buses. Maybe not, but you sure missed the boat. Get out of my way, mister. I'm in a hurry. Sure, sure, you're in a hurry. So am I. <coughs> hey, what are you doing? What are you pulling? Let go my arm. Maybe I ought to snap it for you. <coughs> my arm. Cut it out, will you? Sure, Pally. As soon as you tell me why you were following me. <coughs> I wasn't following you, mister. <coughs> Change your mind, Pally? My arm. <coughs> my arm. Oh. And I told me to tell you. There was a guy on that... Corner back there. He gave me five bucks. You're lying, Billy. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm telling. He's a lawyer. His name was Plimpton. He's in the Ryan building. Uh huh. What do you want? I don't know. Just wanted me to follow you. Tell him where you went, that's all. Can I uh, go now? Yeah. You're going, Pally, with me. And if this is another of your feeble fabrications, uh, I'll really give you something to scream about. Character and I walked over to the Ryan building a couple of blocks away, rode up to the offices of Edgar Clemson, attorney at law. We walked right past the cute little secretary who was busy hiking her nylons up to sea level. Just a moment, sir. You can't go in there. Who said so, sister? Come on, you. Okay, okay. You, Clemson? How did you get in here? Who are you? I got in through the door. My name's Dolan. I brought you something. What do you want? I'm busy. I brought your tail back, Clemson. Next time, get a guy who's a little smaller than a two-car garage and a little smarter than a Ubangi. Really, Mr. Dolan, I don't know what you're talking about. Don't go spreading that around, Clemson, because I know better. You hired this mug here to follow me. He says so. Follow you? Really, Dolan, I'm engaged in the practice of law, not a scavenger hunt. One more crack like that, mouthpiece, and I'll twist your trumpet. Next time you put this dumb lug on my tail, I'll mail you back his arm. Now listen here, Dolan, I got Quiet. my... Quiet. You're under the impression you're pretty tough, aren't you, Dolan? Suppose I am. Just remember that I'm a lawyer, Dolan. You get tough with me and I'll tenderize you like a two-dollar ham. Now get out of here. <laughs> It would have been a pleasure to hang one on Clemson, but the percentage was against me. Then I remembered the story of that Greek hero, the one with the weak heel. 
I figured Clemson might have a weak heel, too. He did, and I was kind of sorry about calling her a heel. It was Charlotte Crandall, Clemson's secretary. I promptly picked her up and just as promptly sat her down again in one of those cozy spots. Sure was nice of you to take me out for cocktails, Mr. Dolan. Oh, don't mention it, Charlotte. When I saw those nylons, I was a gone gosling. Oh, I'll bet you say that to all the girls. Uh Uh-uh. All the girls I know don't have nylons. They don't? Gee, sure is swell in here, Mr. Dolan. I've never been here before. Uh, where do your boyfriends usually take you? Well, lately they've all been taking me home. That's so. I guess because they don't make much money. Or else they're smarter than... Oh, well, uh, say, um, how's your boy? Boy, was he mad at Butch, the guy who followed you. I can imagine. Uh, Butch uh, do a lot of work for Clemson? Mm-hmm. Just where Lucky Maxwell's concerned. Lucky Maxwell? Don't remember him. <laughs> Lucky isn't a he, Mr. Dolan. He's a she. No. She's one of Mr. Clemson's best clients. And you know something? No, why? She runs a diamond dance place. It's called the Rose Room. Hmm. Must take it in some evening. Oh, I don't think you'd like it. It costs a dime every time you dance with a girl. Besides, I dance with you free. Maybe you got something, Charlotte. Uh, I have another... Uh, um... Uh-uh. One of my boyfriends is coming over. Well, don't worry, Charlotte. One night this week, you and I'll go out. I'll show you the sight. Okay. Make it anything but the zoo. I've seen that seven times this month. Anything but the zoo. Hey, okay. Uh, hey, Miss Crandall, Mr. Clemson wants you right away. He sent me to look for you. Isn't it kind of funny you came to exactly the same place? Mr. Clemson said I couldn't talk to you, Dolan. Come on, Miss Crandall. Mr. Clemson is kind of mad. Okay, okay, I'm going. Goodbye, Mr. Dolan. See you later. Yeah, kid. Well, I... Guess I better beat it, too. The boss sent for me to tell you something, Dolan. Yeah, what? Lay off his secretary, or he'll nail your hide to your own front door. I paid the bill and got out of the spot. I wandered downtown a little deeper, where the stores have open fronts and the proprietors wear only shirts and try to coax you inside. I killed time until it was dark, and then I went for an evening of dancing at the Rose Room. I walked between a garish sign that advertised 50 beautiful hostesses. 50. Best music in town. So I walked up the rickety steps, laid down a couple of bucks, took my 20 tickets, and hiked in. I walked over to the check room. I saw a girl behind the counter who took my breath away. She smiled at me. Well, customer, check your hat. Yeah. Number 7-Eleven, mister, for you. That's lucky. Yeah. Uh, you stand back there all the time, or do you ever come out? Oh, for a good customer, sometimes I come out. Oh, I'm a good customer. Yeah, that's what they all say. Dan? Oh, why not? Well, come on, customer. Yeah. Give me your ticket. to have another ticket. That was a dance? Why, I only got a chance to do three steps. Well, up here, mister, you gotta be quick. You said it. Uh, how about sitting uh, at one of those tables? Sure. Give me a dollar. A buck? For sitting? Yeah, for 15 minutes. Three bucks for an hour. Holy smoke. What does a poor guy do around here? He goes to a movie and saves his money. Want to sit? Yeah. And at that price, those chairs better be upholstered in platinum. Oh, how's this? Well, have something? Uh Uh-uh. Management says no. You can, though. Oh, thanks. Maybe I can't afford it. Say, who are you, mister? I've seen you places. Uh, name's Dolan. Mean anything? Uh Uh-uh. Like the name, though. Wish I could stay. Yeah. Oh, what about that babe out there in the blue dress? Oh, you mean Jackie. She's popular. Hmm. Too bad. Oh, of course, if you'd like to meet her, I can fix it. Would you? Uh, fix it, I mean. Sure. I'll send her over. See you later. I watched my erstwhile girlfriend walk out on the floor, say something to the kid in the blue dress, who I knew was Jacqueline Davis. Then she ankled back to her check room while Jacqueline came towards me. 
she and the band made it at the same moment. Well, hello. Hello. You want to dance? What's it? Let's try one, huh? That's what we're paid for. Mmm, you're pretty good. Oh, thanks. Jackie? Oh, you know my name. Who told you? The, uh, doll in the check room. She did? Yeah. Why are we dancing toward the door? It's crowded over there. We're going places, kid. You got me wrong, mister. I don't leave the place. Oh, yes, I, I think you do. You're Jacqueline Davis, aren't you? So what? So your old man's looking for you. He's playing me a nice fat fee to bring you home. So we're walking over to the door. We're leaving, you and me. I won't go, and you can't make me. You're 17. Either you go with me now, or I'll be back with a writ and shut this place up. I'm 18. Cut it out, kid. I know better. Come on, and don't say anything to anybody. Just a minute, mister. What goes? The girl. I'm taking her out. Oh, no, you're not. We don't permit girls to leave with the customers. You're in the wrong place. Uh-uh, I'm in the right place. The kid's only 17. Our old man's looking for her. So? You want any more than that? No, oh, beat it. I missed her. Don't come back. Okay. What makes you think you can get away with this? I don't think. Hustle it, kid. Your old man's waiting. I won't go back, and you can't make me. If you were my kid and you talked that way, I'd paddle you until you put on your stocking standing up for a week. There's a cab. Get in. Okay. In, kid. Hey, Jackie, what goes? Mike, my father sent him. He's after me. Get in here, mister. The dame stays out. What do you think you're pulling? I'll get your license for this. Oh, make me laugh. I don't have a license for a gun. Get in. Okay, okay. Get upstairs, Jackie, and get Sammy. I don't have to. Here he comes now. Sit still, Dick. As soon as Sammy gets here, we're leaving. Oh, is uh, Sammy going along? I see you've caught him. Get going, Mike, out the post road. I got something for this monkey. Why, Sammy, are you talking about me? Shut up. We headed out of town fast. I took a look at Sammy, the dance hall bouncer, and I didn't like what I saw. He had those tight little lines around his mouth and a cold gleam in his eye. He didn't say a word until we got about ten miles out. Then in a nice, quiet spot, he opened up. Pull up, Mike. This is it. Okay, Sammy. I suppose this is where you make with the bang-bang and the body in the bushes? Huh? No, just taking you for this little jaunt to teach you a lesson. How nice of you, Pally. Do I get a diploma? Just be happy you don't get a hit in the head, Dolan. You're mixed up in something that doesn't concern you. Stay out of it. Who's going to make me? Several people. Next time we have to ride you out of town, you'll be a lot unhappier. Now get out. Oh, wait a minute. You mean you took me for this nice ride and now I have to walk home? You sure do, Dolan. And the next time I have to take you for a ride, you won't have to walk. Oh, nice. I'll bring you back in a bat. The cab door slammed and my two pals got away from there fast. There was only one thing for me to do and that was to start walking. It was late, there were no cars, and I figured I could make it to the nearest car line by morning. By that time, Jackie Davis would be on our way to China. Hey, hey, how about a lift to town? Uh, where are you going, mister? Uh, back to town. Can you help me out? Climb in, sonny. Thanks. Hey, what are you doing way out here this time of night, sonny? Uh, my doctor told me to take long walks. Only tonight I overdid it. <laughs> The old man edged away from me as though I were a psychopathic case. But he did run me into town. He chugged right down to the corner opposite the Rose Room where he let me out. I walked across the street and hid in a dark doorway next door to the main entrance. It was ten minutes to twelve. I made it just in time because Jacqueline Davis was coming down the steps with Sammy. Hey, are you sure he's not around? Not unless he flew back. He's got a long walk, kid. 
I don't worry about a thing. I hope nothing goes wrong, Sammy. My father hired him to bring me back. I know. Now forget it, will you, Jackie? Here comes Mike, right on the button. Yes, Jackie, I'll ride home with you. Thanks. I'm kind of scared. Hey, uh, anybody tell you, Mike? Uh, I'm clean. <laughs> Jackie, Sammy, and the driver drove out of there in a hurry. I got a cab and followed. They pulled up in an apartment house. I watched while the girl got out and ran in. Sammy and Mike drove off. I left my cab and walked to the apartment house door. I was surprised to see the name Maxwell on the mailbox. I pushed the button and half a minute later I was knocking on a door. Uh, not old kids. The name's Dolan. Come on. You're leaving. I won't go. I'll yell for help. Go ahead. I'll explain that I'm taking a 17-year-old kid back to her old man. Yes, and you don't know what you're doing. If Sammy was here, he'd show you. If Sammy was here, I'd give him a nut on the head. Now, drop the talk, kid, and let's get out of here. I wasted enough time on you. Mr. Dolan, please, can't I stay here? No, come on. Uh-oh. Here comes trouble. Oh, hiya, Jackie. Mr. Clemson sent me over to keep an eye on you, so I am. I'm glad you came, Butch. Look, it's him. I know, but I can't talk to him. Mr. Clemson says so. Thanks, pal. Now, get out of the way. We're in a hurry. No, Butch, he wants to take me back. Back to my father. Oh, you can't do that, Dolan. Mr. Clemson says for her to wait. Out of the way, Dopey. I don't like being called a dope, see? For the second time, out of the way, Dopey. I just remembered I don't like you very much, Dolan. That's too bad. Now, come on, kid. We got things to do. We went back downtown for two reasons. One, to get my car, and two, to tell old da Davis I had found his daughter. I called Davis on the phone. You've got her? You've actually found her? Sure, Mr. Davis. What now? Uh, bring her up here. At this hour of the night? How soon can you leave? In about ten minutes. Uh, good. You can make it in an hour. Take the post road. The post road? Yes, it's faster that way. You know how to get to Mission Valley by the post road, Jackie? Even if I did, I wouldn't tell you. Okay, kid. Here's my car. I'll find the way. Wait a second, Dolan. Not getting in there. Well, if it isn't Sammy the Bouncer. Been riding any more characters out to the sticks? Don't be gay, Dolan. Just get back up to your apartment. Jackie isn't going back to her old man, see? Yeah, Pally, I see. And I see a gun right here in my mitt. Now, we'll see how well you're loaded. No, you don't. Oh, yes, I do. I might be sorry if I didn't take precautions. There. Well, a neat heater you're carrying, chum. 38. Pretty man-sized for a lad like you, so I think I'll take it. Doesn't make any difference. Mike is waiting outside the garage door. I'm not playing duck on a rock for any smart mouth, Pally. Get in the car with the kid. What for? Get in and hurry it. Let me see you get past Mike at the door, Dolan. I'm not getting past. You're doing that for me. Uh-uh. On the contrary, uh-uh. Because if you don't, this will go off right in your face. Sammy had a lot of nerve, but the gun scared him. We drove out the door, Sammy said the correct thing, and I waved gaily at Mike and beat it out of town. I remembered how kind Sammy had been to me, so exactly ten miles out, I dumped him off to hoof it back to town. I don't think he liked it. We'll be there in ten minutes, kid. I'm sorry I had to let Sammy out so far back. You think you're so smart. You just wait. Hey, look at that chump coming up behind us without light. Hey, you turn on your light. A cream-colored sedan had sneaked up behind us, and as it passed, a series of stabbing flames shot out of the window. One of the bullets hit my front tire, and I wheeled off into the ditch. I sat there for five minutes, but the car never came back. He must have been positive that he got it. I changed the tire, and ten minutes after that, led the girl into the Davis living room. A splendid job, Dolan. Splendid. Thanks, Mr. Davis. But uh, did I hear shots down the road a while back? 
Somebody tried to shoot us off the road. And you, my dear, did you enjoy your trip to the city? Please, Mr. Dolan, don't leave me here. I'm scared. Oh, what a way to speak of your own father, Jacqueline. Here, Dolan, I'll write you out a check. Please, Mr. Dolan, he took all of Grandfather's money. The money I was supposed to get. He's talking like a child, Dolan. Come, I'll write you a check. Sure, you'll give him a check. You've got plenty since you drove Mother out of the house. Jack, you don't know what you're talking about. Is that so? Mother told me everything. You stole everything Grandfather left me. Your mother is a... Be quiet, Jacqueline. You're just a big crook. You've always wanted everything for yourself. Come, Dolan, I'll make you out your check. Just a minute, Davis. Jackie, uh, is your mother... Uh, does she work down at that joint kid? She owns it, Mr. Smarty. She's Lucky Maxwell. Jacqueline, I'll teach you to run off to the city and blab to your mother. I blab up! That'll teach you a few things. That'll be enough of that, Davis. If you want to beat your kid, do it when I'm not around. This is my affair. You keep out of it. I'll get your check. Please don't leave, Mr. Dolan. He'll kill me. Honest, he will. You be quiet, Jacqueline. Maybe I ought to hang around, Davis. You'll get your check and get out. That's what you'll do. Jackie, what kind of a car does your father drive? Why, Jacqueline? It's a cream-colored sedan. Mr. Dolan, you don't think... Uh-huh. You know, Davis, I've made a mistake. I've been working for the wrong person. You drove that car tonight. You asked me to drive the post road so you could knock us off. You were playing a little murder game on the safe side. Put up your hands, Dolan. That's what it is. You hired me to get the kid out in the open so you could knock her off. Too bad you ever learned to think, Dolan. Yeah. Now you'll have to get rid of both of us, won't you? I told you he brought her up here, Mr. Clemson. See? Yes, we thought we'd find you here, Dolan. Mother, what are you doing here? Drop it, Davis. Drop the gun. Haven't you done enough? Yeah, Mr. Davis. You're in enough trouble now. Uh, no, you don't. This is my house, and I've got a right to defend myself against all of you. Even you, my dear. You'd really shoot, wouldn't you? Of course I would. No. No, you won't. Give me that gun, old-timer. <laughs> I said, give me that gun. Uh, keep away! Keep away, I'll shoot again. No, you won't, old-timer. <laughs> Now, Mr. Dolan, I got something for you, too. I owe you. That'll be enough of that, Butch. But, boy, That'll sir. be enough, I said. Thanks, Quentin. Don't thank me, Dolan. You're in trouble. I'm going to charge you with assault. That's for hitting Butch. And for kidnapping Sammy as well as Jackie. That'll cool you off. Yeah. And I don't blame you. For once, I was on the wrong side of the fence. Well, nevertheless, Dolan, we heard you outside the door. By doing what you did, you probably saved Jackie's life. Yes, Dolan, so under the circumstances, we're willing to drop any possible charges if you'll help Miss Maxwell in her suit against David. I'll be glad to. Say, uh, sister, didn't I hear Jackie call you mother? Naturally. I'm not her grandmother, you The whole story came out then. Jackie was to be 18 in two days. In spite of the fact that her mother was to have her, old man Davis wanted to keep her. Then he could cover up the fact that he'd stolen most of the money left her by her grandfather. Clemson forgave me, and so did Butch. The kid Jackie kissed me for sticking up for her. Lucky Maxwell? Well, I, I talked to her a couple of days later at the Rose Room. You look surprised, Dolan. I could have a 17 year old daughter. You could, sure, but you're not over 30 yourself. Oh, thanks, Dolan. Only I'm 35. Sister, the years rest on you like a feather. <laughs> but uh, what about this Maxwell business? Well, Maxwell is my maiden name. He threw me out because he thought it'd make it easier for him to get his hands on the money my father left Jackie. <laughs> and all the time I thought he was on the level. Well, naturally, you would. But do you know that for a long time, even I was a virtual prisoner? When Jackie grew older, she sneaked down to see me after I'd left him. But a, a, a joint like this? Oh, why not? That way I could keep an eye on her. Oh, by the way, Dolan, he promised to pay you. He can't, but I can. Here, Mr. Check. Oh, thanks, Lucky. You know, you, you should get married again. You're young. Oh, and you're beautiful. Like like a rose. You're, you're breathtaking. Am I? Now, take Clemson. He's pretty good, Joe. No, he's my lawyer. 
There's no romance in legal matters. Well, someone else dance. Sure. Now let's dance. Come on. But um, <laughs> I'm I'm too young to get married. Are you? Uh, besides, I left my wallet at home. Yeah, I thought you would. Here's ten tickets. Let's dance. Yeah, but um, after all, what have you got to lose? Oh, not a thing. Not a thing. Uh, uh, pardon me, folks, and uh, good night. to listen again next week, same time, when you will hear William Gargan say, I deal in crime. I deal in crime, starring William Gargan as Ross Dolan, as a special presentation of the American Broadcasting Company, written by Ted Hediger, directed by Leonard Rieg, with original music composed and conducted by Skitch Henderson. Mm -hmm.